So now let's get started with the revision of the fourth chapter of this marathon, which is investment decisions. And this chapter is also popularly known as capital budgeting. Capital budgeting. See, it is mentioned here. This, this chapter is also popularly known as capital budgeting. Now, first, let us understand this chapter with a background. This is a very, very easy chapter. If you understand the logic, number one and number two, there could be some case study questions in this chapter, which students generally find it difficult. So I am also going to solve two extra case study questions in this marathon itself in order to give you a proper clarity. Now, in case of case study questions, what you need to do is you need to have patience in reading the question carefully. And once you read this question carefully, automatically you will know how to proceed further. Clear? Yes. So now first, this chapter is called as investment decision. Alternative name for this chapter is also known as capital budgeting. Now, what does this chapter talk about? Now, now in our subject, financial management, yes, we saw that. Overall, financial management helps us achieve three objectives. Financing decisions, that is decisions relating to fundraising activity, correct? Then, investment decisions, that is decisions relating to where the funds should be deployed, correct? And then, you have something called as dividend decisions, right? So, under financing division, uh, decisions, we saw chapters, three chapters we saw already. So, the three chapters that we saw already was cost of capital, then we saw leverages, then we also saw capital structure decisions, correct? Yes. So now this chapter, the name itself is investment decisions. This falls under the category of the second objective of our subject, which is investment decisions. Sir, what do you mean by investment decisions? So where exactly does this fit into and in financial management, what we are going to do in this particular chapter? Now, let's assume this is the balance sheet of a company right now what happens to actually start a business company needs money correct so company can get money from various sources of finance as we have seen in the previous chapters it can be through equity share capital it can be through retained earnings your preference share capital your debentures your long-term loans etc correct so now a company raises money from these different sources of finance Obviously, each source of finance has its own cost and the weighted average cost of capital is popularly known as the overall cost of capital or WSTC. So basically, the company raises money, correct, which comes with a cost. Now, why does this company raise funds so that they can, they can deploy these funds, they can put these funds into the business and generate some revenue? So what is the meaning of this? Basically, what they do is once they raise this money, the company will predominantly buy fixed assets, correct or not? Yes, using these fixed assets like plant and machinery, your entire factory, or it can be your equipment, it can be so many things. Using this, using this, of course, in your day-to-day -day operations, you have something called as current assets, current liabilities. You have current assets here, current liabilities here. Popularly, these two netted off is called as working capital. This working capital is a subject matter of study in the next chapter that we are going to revise, which is working capital management. But the predominant amount of the long-term sources of finance goes into the company's non-current assets, also known popularly called as fixed assets. Why? Only if you have a fixed asset, only if you have a factory, only if you have equipment and all purchase, only then you can run your day-to-day -day operations, yes or no. So the next part of this particular financial management is which are the assets I need to buy or in other words, taking decisions with respect to the investment perspective. Sir, what could be the decisions that I take in this chapter? Let's say, let's say I, I'm a manufacturer. Let's say I'm a pen manufacturer. Okay. Now this pen, whatever pen that I'm going to manufacture, let's say I'm Rorito, right? This company called Rorito. So let's say I'm a pen manufacturer. This Rorito pens can be manufactured using machine one or machine two or machine three. Let's say there are three models of machines available, correct? Now, whether I should buy machine one or I should buy machine two or I should buy machine three, this is a decision taken in this chapter. This is one of the decisions. Are you clear with this? So it is not necessary. It is not necessary that, one second. 
So it is not necessary that this is the only division, uh, decision that you are going to take. It can be machines in this case. It could also be projects. What do you mean by project? Let us say I am a company like LNT. Okay, I'm a company like LNT. So whether I should go for project A or project B or project C or maybe project A and B together or B and C. So whichever base. So I need to find out where this money needs to be deployed because I am raising these funds. These funds do not come free of cost. It comes with a cost. Yes, now I should judiciously, I should carefully invest it in such avenues that gives me more return. So I will have to compare between different alternatives. Are you clear with this? Yes. Now, sir, how do we go about with this chapter? There are some, there is something called as capital budgeting techniques in this chapter. We will be seeing using those techniques, we will actually gauge, we will find out which is the best investment proposal and all, all those things related to that we will find out. Now, one most important thing in this chapter is about cash flows. That is, let us say, let us say, if I want to purchase machine one, if I want to purchase machine one, now initially there will be year zero, there will be a cash outflow, correct? Let us say 100 crores is the crash outflow, correct? Then let us say this machine has a life of five years. So for the next five years, for the next five years, the, comp the machine can generate what? Inflows. So it can generate, let us say, 30 crores in year one. 25 crores in year 2, 15 crores in year 3, 10 crores in year 4 and let us say um, 12 crores in year 5 and so on. Are you clear with this? So always remember in this chapter, in investment decision chapters, there is an initial outflow followed by a series of cash inflow. Why? Because first you need to shell out money to buy the fixed asset, to buy the long-term equipment, correct? And once you do that, you can use it every year. You can use it every year to generate your cash flows. Are you clear with this? This is exactly the opposite of, this is exactly the opposite of cost of capital. There in cost of capital, what we saw, it is about fundraising activity. Initially, you will get the funds from the investor followed by a series of outflow. Every year, you need to pay them interest or dividend, correct? But in this case, what happens? The cash flows are reverse exactly. That is, that is initially there will be an outflow followed by a series of inflow. Are you clear with this? That is how this entire chapter is going to look like. And of course, we will be using time value of money techniques and all that. But remember, this chapter is about what? About where should I park my funds? Which are the right avenues where I can invest my funds and generate money? Are you clear with this? Yes. Now, there are some popular, there are some popular capital budgeting techniques. There are some popular capital budgeting techniques. So this is the overview of this entire chapter, capital budgeting techniques. So capital budgeting techniques can be broadly classified into traditional or non-discounting techniques and time adjusted or discounted techniques. Are you clear with this? Very simple. There are only two methods in the traditional method. There are only two methods in the traditional technique something called as payback period and something called as accounting rate of return, right? And then there are five methods under the time adjusted or discounted techniques, something called as NPV, which we've already seen in basic concepts, correct? What do you mean by net present value? The present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflow. Are you clear with this? Then there is something called as profitability index. Profitability index is nothing but present value of cash inflows divided by present value of cash outflows. Are you clear with this? This is what NPV, present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflow, correct? So if the NPV is positive, then it means that you can go for the project. If NPV is negative, it means that you should not go for that particular investment avenue. Are you clear with this? Fine, I'm just giving you a broad introduction. Anyways, we will be seeing a lot of sums, well, high level sums we'll be seeing, so you need not worry about that. Whereas profitability index means what? Present value of cash inflows divided by present value of cash outflow. So technically, if the numerator is greater than the denominator, that is if your present value of cash inflows is greater than your present value of cash outflows, generally your profitability index will be 1, correct? If it is less, if your present value of cash inflows is less than your present value of cash outflow, then it means that your profitability index will be less than 1. It will be in a decimal. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? So ideally, if your profitability index is 1 or more, then technically it means that you have a positive NPV. This is some interconnection that we can do. Then we have IRR. 
internal rate of return. So what do you mean by internal rate of return? The rate that makes our NPV equal to zero or in other words, in other words, the rate that makes my present value of cash inflow equal to my present value of cash outflow. That is the rate that makes my NPV equal to zero. We have already seen this in the basic concepts. Anyways, we'll be touching upon this. Then there is something called as discounted payback period and the final thing is called as MIRR, marginal internal rate of return. It's a slight mod, sorry, it's modified internal rate of return. It's a modification of IRR. Are you clear with this? Now, very simple. The first two methods, traditional methods, these two methods ignores, these two methods ignores the concept of time value of money. Clear? Whereas, whereas these five methods considers the concept of time value of money. So you tell me logically, which is better? The traditional approach or the time adjusted approach, obviously the time adjusted approach. Why? Because the time value of money concepts are considered here only in the traditional approach that is the payback period and accounting rate of return. Generally, you don't consider your time value of money concept. So basically, it is not that great approaches. Are you clear with this? Sir, so we are finished the chapter. No, I'm just giving you an introduction. So we will be seeing everything one by one with numerical problems. Are you clear with this? Yes. Now, there are a few rules, general rules that we need to follow in this particular chapter. So I told you, right? So generally in this investment decisions, there will be a cash outflow initially followed by series of cash inflows. Correct? Yes. Now, every year you have a cash inflow. Correct? The cash flow is there. Correct? Now, what cash flow is this? Or in other words, what are the items that needs to be considered while arriving at this cash flow? Every year's cash flow, what are all the items that needs to be considered? These are some general rules that is prescribed at the beginning of this chapter. All these things are mentioned in our ICA study material. Now, while cal calculating the cash flows in capital budgeting decisions, the following items need consideration. The first one is depreciation. Now, Depreciation is a non-cash item by itself. It does not affect the cash flow. However, we must consider the tax shield or tax benefit from depreciation in our analysis. Since this benefit reduces the cash outflow for taxes, it is considered as tax. Uh, it is considered as a cash inflow. So, what do you mean by this? Now, now, let us say every year, every year you have all the cash flows correct. In that depreciation is also one expense. So, in your PNL account, if you see. You have sales, correct, minus all your operating expenses and all you have, minus depreciation is also an item, correct? You arrive at this to compute at your profit before tax, yes or no? Fine, from this you reduce your tax to arrive at your profit after tax, yes? Now you tell me, now this depreciation is no doubt an expense considered for the purpose of arriving at your profit after tax. But you tell me, from a cash flow perspective, Every year, will you pay depreciation to anyone? No, it is not a cash outflow. But, but the presence of depreciation can reduce your tax liability. Why? Because depreciation is a tax allowable, tax deductible expense. So, or in other words, depreciation as such should not be considered. But, but the presence of de depreciation will impact your tax savings, correct or not, or in other words, the tax savings on depreciation should be considered, but depreciation as a whole should not be considered. Sir, can you give us an example? Let us take the first question in this particular discussion, in this particular chapter. Let's take the first question. So go to question number one. Go to question number one. ABC Limited is evaluating purchase of a new machinery with a depreciable base of 1 lakh rupees, expected economic life of 4 years and the change in the earnings before taxes and depreciation of 45,000 in year 1, 30,000 in year 2, 25,000 in year 3 and 35,000 in year 4. Assume straight line method of depreciation and a 20% tax tax rate, you are required to compute the relevant cash flows. So now what they are saying, if this company ABC Limited, if they buy a new machinery, for the next four years, it has a useful life. And for each of the four years, they have given the earnings before dip tax and depreciation. That is earnings before tax and depreciation. Tax and depreciation both have not been considered, so which means they are yet to be considered. How much? 45, 30, 25 and 35. This is what they have given. Now, what we need to calculate in this question, we just need to calculate the cash inflows for these four years. Are you clear with this? That's all. 
we are not using any capital budgeting techniques and all we are not applying they have just asked us to calculate the cash flows for each of these four years now now they have given that the depreciable base is how much one lakh rupees and straight line method of depreciation tax rate is our tax rate is 20 percentage straight line slm method of depreciation which means one lakh divided by four every year the depreciation is how much 25,000 rupees so what we need to do earnings before tax and depreciation less depreciation so in the first year it will be how much 45,000 minus 25,000 it gives you earnings before depreciation of how much earnings before tax of how much 20,000 correct minus tax at the rate of 20 percentage gives you how much 4,000 rupees of tax so earnings after tax is how much 16,000 now wait now wait this 16,000 is not the cash flows after tax why because this depreciation ideally was not a cash flow out at all it was not a cash outflow but I have subtracted it correct so now what we need to do is whatever depreciation we subtracted before now we need to add it back so add back depreciation why because it was never an outflow I have subtracted it before so now I am adding it back so the net cash flow after tax is going to be 41,000 this is the amount that is considered for all our investment decision purposes are you clear with this so whenever I say the relevant cash inflows it is basically cash flows after tax are you clear with this remember this word cash flows after tax that is we are considering only cash flows that too after tax the post tax cash flows now i am repeating this entire thing once again we started with where earnings before tax and depreciation we subtract depreciation arrived at earnings before tax always remember earnings before tax is the base on which the tax rate is applied correct so less taxes you get earnings after tax correct now wait since depreciation was a non-cash item still it was subtracted so now you add it back to nullify the effect you get this cash flows after tax are you clear with this now you might have a doubt sir i have subtracted depreciation here but i have added it back here instead i could have ignored depreciation completely no no just look at this i subtracted depreciation here and added it here in between there is a line item called tax correct now tax is calculated on earnings before tax or in other words since the depreciation was initially subtracted the base on which I am computing the income tax is now reduced. So instead of calculating tax on 45,000 I am calculating it on 45 minus 25 only 20,000 correct. So or in other words because of the presence of depreciation what has happened your tax outflow has reduced. So technically what we have done is we have ignored this depreciation as a whole but 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 the presence of depreciation has impacted on some tax savings so the tax shield on depreciation has been properly considered how because we have reduced it in the beginning and on that reduced amount only we have computed the tax and then we have added it back once again are you clear with this are you clear with this this is how you compute the relevant cash flows for every year similarly for second year earnings before tax and depreciation subtract depreciation you get earnings before tax multiply the tax rate on that you will get earnings after tax then add back to your depreciation you get your cash flows after tax similarly for third and the fourth years respectively so now every year's cash flow is how much net cash inflow that you get is how much so if you invest in this machinery at the end of year one technically you get 41,000 after paying all the taxes correct here at the end of year two 29,000 at the end of year three 25,000 and at the end of year four it's going to be 33,000 remember here in this chapter we are talking about cash flows we are not talking about profits we are only talking about cash inflows and outflows we are just matching these two cash inflows with cash outflows we are not bothered about the profits and all that so based on the data that is given based on the starting point what we need to do we need to arrive at what the cash flows after tax are you clear with this so earnings before tax and depreciation minus tax gives you earnings before tax correct less taxes gives you earnings after tax but now you need to add back the depreciation which we once subtracted so you'll get the cash flows after tax and the relevant criteria for this chapter is cash flows after tax are you clear with this so basically in short we need to ignore so depreciation should not be subtracted but but tax saving on depreciation should be considered that's why we subtract it on the top and compute the tax and finally at the bottom once again we add it back so that overall what happens only the tax impact or the tax savings or the depreciation is being considered whereas the whole depreciation as such is not being considered are you clear with this? this is the first learning here right now <clears throat> now go back to the first one 
go back to the first one these are some basic rules the problem is students generally uh, they miss out on this very very basic areas because if you spend more time on this and learn this basic areas automatically any kind of some you will have a crystal clear clarity clear so generally students miss out on this and that is the reason why i'm just quickly going through this next b determining the discount rate now now i told you this chapter in, involves what time value of money techniques yes so not considering time value of money techniques there are only two methods leave that but predominant portion of this chapter considers time value of money techniques yes now this 100 crores is a cash outflow arising at the beginning of the life of the project that is on the present date but if you see this 30 crores is happening at the end of year one 25 crores the end of year two 20 15 crores the end of year three 10 crores the end of year four and 12 crores the end of year five correct so these are cash flows cash inflows arising at different point of time yes now can i add these cash flows as such no no i cannot add these cash flows as it's why time value of money concept because the cash flow at the end of year one and cash flow at the end of year two or the cash flow at the end of a different period are not comparable assets so what will i have to use i need to use a relevant discount rate and convert all these things into present value and arrive at the present value of cash flows yes now now for me for me to do it for me to actually arrive at the present value how will you do it how will you do it very simple cash flow at the end of year one divided by one plus r to the power one plus cash flow at the end of year two divided by one plus r the whole power two plus cash flow at the end of year three divided by one plus r the whole power three plus cash flow at the end of year four divided by one plus r to the power four plus cash flow at the end of year five divided by one plus r to the power five correct if i do this only i will get the present value of cash inflows because these cash flows are not addable as such correct now here basically we need a discount rate yes or no we need a discount rate yes what is the discount rate that we can consider here now very very simple guys this is where we are going to connect the concept this discount rate that we will be considering in this chapter is nothing but your VAC weighted average cost of capital also known as ko are you clear with this sir why sir in this chapter we are taking the discount rate as weighted average cost of capital very simple very simple look at this i am raising funds correct the cost of raising the funds is only called as ko also known as weighted average cost of capital correct now now when i am taking an investment decision let us say the weighted average cost of capital is example 12 percentage correct now, when I'm taking an investment decisions, I should invest in the machines or I should invest in assets that at least generates how much 12 percentage return only then I will be able to pay my finance cost, correct or not? Yes. So technically, this is the base on which I will do all the computations or this is the minimum rate that I need to generate using my assets. Are you clear with this? So whenever they are asking for a discount rate in this chapter, discount rate stands for KO, also known as weighted average cost of capital. And this is the logic. An organization may establish a minimum rate of return that all the capital projects must meet. This minimum could be based on an industry average or the cost of other investment opportunities. Many organizations uh, you, uh, choose to use the overall cost of capital or VAC, weighted average cost of capital, that an organization has incurred in raising funds or expects to incur in raising the funds. Are you clear with this? This is what they are saying. So which means discount rate stands for what? Discount rate stands for your weighted average cost of capital. Now, 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 this is different from IRR concept. I will come to that in a while. Next, next, exclusion of financing cost. Now, very important, very important. Now, now, what we do? So, the present value of cash inflows, how present value of cash flows, whatever you want, you can just say. Now, what we do? The relevant cash flows divided by 1 plus R to the power N, yes or no? This is how we need to discount the cash flows. Yes. Now, what they are saying? This relevant cash flows are nothing but cash flows after tax, correct? Yes, the first thing we saw is depreciation should not be considered, but the tax impact on depreciation should be considered. We have seen it. Yes, absolutely. Right. Now, this is always post to tax. Taxes should be considered after tax cash flows should only be considered. Yes. Now, one very important thing that we are going to see while computing the relevant cash flows, that is the numerator, every year's cash inflows while you are computing, you should not you should not deduct you should not deduct any kind of 
finance cost what do you mean by finance cost basically interest and dividend so what is this sir what is the logic for this i will explain so what we are saying every year the cash flows after tax that we are computing it should not consider it should not consider the finance cost why sir is this this operating cost not no 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 that is not the reason i will give you the logic the finance costs are already considered while computing the denominator what is denominator r r is nothing but ko no yes what is what do you mean by ko what do you mean by ko so ke plus into we plus kp into w, uh, kp into wp plus kd into wd yes this is how you compute correct while well, each of these costs are already considered in the denominator if you consider it once again in the numerator if you deduct all these things once again in the numerator it will definitely have a double negative impact so you should not do that or in other words or in other words this numerator should be the funds available the funds available or the net cash flows available for distribution to all the sources of finance are you clear with this that logic you remember so basically this cash flows after tax should be after tax but before paying your interested dividend before finance cost why because all your finance related costs are being factored into in your denominator and in the numerator you should only consider the cash flows that are available for all the sources of finance are you clear with this this is the logic for taking up for taking up cash flows after tax without considering the finance cost very important thing guys these are some fine things that students generally miss in exam that's why i'm pointing it out for you exclusion of financing cost so when cash flows related to long term funds are being defined uh, uh, finance cost of long term funds that is interest or dividend should be excluded from the analysis see these are reflected in the weighted average cost of capital look all these words are coming from institute study material correct hence if the interest on long term debt and dividend on ca equity capital are deducted and defined in the cash flows the cost of long term funds will be counted twice so these things are already taken care of in the denominator please don't disturb the numerator once again that is don't consider all these while taking up the cash flows and post tax principle we already solved that is we are only talking about cash flows after tax correct so the relevant cash inflows while you are computing you should compute the cash flows after tax and not the cash flow before tax only after tax fine and similarly in the denominator while computing 1 plus r that r is nothing but r is nothing but your weighted average cost of capital correct and weighted average cost of capital is nothing but ko for calculating ko you consider all taxes and all what do you mean by kd how do you calculate kd for kd calculation itself i into 1 minus t and all we do so basically the denominator also considers it is also the post tax cost of capital the numerator is also your post tax cash flows only only then it is comparable are you clear with this have this crystal clear clarity so the cash flows after tax should should not consider depreciation but it should consider the tax shield on depreciation so you subtract it once and then added back in the end correct the second point that we studied this what is the discount rate discount rate is taken as the weighted average cost of capital the third point that we studied here is the financing cost should not be considered should not be deducted from your numerator reason the logic is nothing but it is considered while calculating your discount rate and the fourth one is always the cash flows that you consider should be post tax cash flows are you clear with this these are some basic ground rules on which this entire chapter is being based about so now we have seen how to calculate the cash flows and all that now let's quickly jump into the capital budgeting techniques so what do you mean by capital budgeting techniques these are the techniques using which you will judge whether you should go for a particular project or not are you clear with this so these are the techniques or methods using which the tools using which you will judge whether you can go for a particular investment avenue or not project a if you can go for it or not how it is is what we are going to see now traditional method has two things one is called as payback period the other one is called as accounting rate of return so payback period and accounting rate of return this is these are the two traditional approaches nothing great here nothing great here so accounting rate of return so the accounting rate of return of an investment measures the average annual net income of the project that is incremental income as a percentage of investment now what it is i will just tell you we will do an example and we will just finish it off very simple 
but remember one thing remember one thing these are what these two methods that is payback period and your accounting rate of return ignores time value of money concepts hence 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 in this case in this accounting rate of return that we are going to see we will not be talking about cash flows we will be talking about profits accounting rate of returns we are going to talk about profits this is the only method where we will be talking about profits sir you just know you said cash flow should only be considered your profit should not be considered correct yes this is a method this ignores your time value of money so for this method alone you should consider only your profits what it is and all i will just walk you through don't worry about it so let's go to the second question which is which is problem number two average rate of return accounting rate of return basically it can be called as anyways a project requiring an investment of 10 lakh rupees and it yields profit after tax and depreciation as follows look they are not mentioning cash flow they are mentioning profit after tax and depreciation year 150 000 year 275 year 3 125 year 3 uh, year 4 is 130 and year 5 is 80 000. so if you add up all these things the total cash flow is how much 4 lakh 60 000. wait so just now you said the cash flows arising at different periods cannot be added as such yes if you follow time value of money techniques that's why i said these methods are not great they don't follow time value of money techniques that's why they have added all these things are you clear with this yes now suppose further that at the end of the fifth year the plant and machinery of the project can be sold for eighty thousand rupees determine the average rate of return they are asking us to calculate average rate of return guys nothing this is plain vanilla this is nothing great there in this particular question this is looking at things from an accounting perspective so technically this is not even related to finance i would say this is an accounting perspective it is about calculating average rate of profit that's about it it's nothing to do with i would say nothing much to do with finance what it is how to calculate now the rate of return can be calculated as follows the basically the reason why i'm doing this is there are two ways in which you can compute the average rate of return the first one first one is what the numerator should have what average profits numerator should have average profits denominator should have what investments correct average profit how will you compute very simple sum total of all the five years profits divided by five correct or not yes so sum total of all five years profit is how much four lakh sixty 4,60,000 divided by 5. How much is this? 92,000. Correct. The denominator should have investment. Correct. Now, the question here generally is, should I take average investment or should I take initial investment? Now, in this method, in this ARR method, you can either take initial investment or you can take average investment. But this sum, we will do it under both. That is, denominator alone, there is a confusion. So, first, if the initial investment is taken, very simple. So, what is the numerator? Average profit. Average profit is something but total profit for all the 5 years divided by 5 years. Correct? 460 divided by 5 divided by initial investment. What is your initial investment? So, it's 10 lakh rupees. Are you clear with this? So, divided by 10 lakhs. So, it gives you 9.2 percentage. Are you clear with this? So, we can say if you invest this, if you invest money to park your funds in this project, you get an average rate of return of how much? 9.2 percentage. Now, this rate is compared with the rate expected on other products. Suppose the company has a policy. I will invest in a project only if it at least generates me 10 percentage of return. Now this, they will have a yardstick, correct? This project gives me only 9.2 percentage. So reject it. Don't go for this project. Are you clear with this? So these can be used as a yardstick to judge whether or not to go for this particular project. This 10 percentage, how they arrive, they can use it as any parameter or they can even keep the WAC, weighted average cost of capital. Let's say weighted average cost of capital for this company is 10 percentage, which means if they are deploying their funds, every rupee that they are investing in a project should at least get them 10 percentage or more correct because anyways i need to pay 10 percentage for every rupee that i have borrowed source of finance so when i'm investing it it should generate at least 10 percentage this project generates only 9.2 percentage so now i will not go for it are you clear suppose the weighted average cost of capital is only eight percent this project generates 9.2 percentage so yes since the return that i get from this project is more than my weighted average cost of capital then the company can decide whether to go for it or not are you clear it is it's at least an open option that you can keep clear fine for example the management may decide that they will not undertake any project <clears throat> which has an average annual yield after tax less than 20 percent any capital expenditure proposal which has an average annual yield of less than 20 uh, 20 percentage will be automatically rejected this 20 percentage and all is just a yardstick example that they have mentioned don't think always 20 percent is a yardstick no nothing of that sort now 
This ARR can be also calculated using a different formula. Average profit divided by average investment, correct? This is where many students have a doubt regarding the formula that the institute has given in the study material. Average investment is equal to 1 by 2 into initial investment minus salvage value. So half of initial investment minus salvage value plus salvage value. So why this formula? Look guys, it's very, very simple. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. Now, if I split and write this formula, automatically you will understand this is nothing. Average investment means what? Opening plus closing divided by 2 or half of opening plus closing investment. Correct or not? Yes? Right. Now you tell me, this formula they have given, let us just split it and write. Can I rewrite this formula as half of initial investment? I am writing it as II minus half of salvage value correct so half into initial investment minus half into salvage value plus salvage value correct guys yes so can i say salvage value minus half of salvage value can i say if i block these two together can i say salvage value one salvage value minus one by two of salvage value is nothing but one by two salvage value correct guys yes salvage value minus half of salvage value gives me what salvage value that is plus half of salvage value 1 minus 1 by 2 gives me plus 1 by 2 correct this is nothing but 1 by 2 of initial investment or in other words or in other words can i say can i say this is nothing but this is nothing but this formula is nothing but half of initial investment plus initial investment plus salvage value correct there is nothing but if you see in your capital employed and all you would have seen in your accounts average capital employed is opening plus closing by two this is also the same formula only but they have just rewritten it like this half of initial investment minus salvage value plus salvage value very simple so half of salvage minus half of salvage value plus salvage value is nothing but half of salvage value correct so half of total investment plus half of salvage value this is the formula that you get that is half of initial investment plus salvage value in this case you tell me what is the initial investment 10 lakhs correct what is the salvage value 80000 10 lakhs is the initial investment 80000 is the salvage value average of this is how much 10 lakh plus 80000 divided by 2 half of this is going to be 5 lakh 40000 that is exactly what you get here 5 lakh 40,000 is exactly what you get here even if you use this formula. So don't complicate it by yourself. This is nothing. In fact, this is nothing. This is average in, uh, investment and all. They have just ignored the time value of money concepts and they have done it. This is nothing but opening plus salvage value divided by 2. That is opening investment plus closing investment divided by 2. They have rewritten it like this. Sir, so in exam, can I write this formula? Whatever you have mentioned. No, no, no. Please write it exactly like this. The logic, you remember it as this. Are you clear with this? Because I don't want to take any chances. This logic and all is not mentioned in the study material. I am giving it to you. Clear? So, if at all you find it difficult to uh, I mean, remember this formula, it's very simple. Half of initial investment minus salvage value plus salvage value. If you just split and write it, you will get half of initial investment plus salvage value. That's about it, guys. Are you clear with this? So, the denominator can be 5 lakh 40,000. So, if this changes, obviously the answer will also change so if you use this method your average rate of return is going to be 17.04 percentage now sir should i take 12 9.2 percentage or 17.04 percentage it depends on the company whichever method they want to take they can take in exam if the question is silent you can take either any of the method or if this is a five mark question they are asking you better do both the methods and leave it there are you clear with this that's about it beyond this there is no much of relevance in this area because it ignores all the time value of money concepts and it does basically they are calculating the average rate of return that is average profit divided by investment numerator no problem average profit is total profits for all the five years divided by five years denominator is should you take the initial investment alone or should you take the average investment if you take the average investment it is nothing but half of initial investment plus salvage value or or if you want to write it in institute's language should write one by two the whole into initial investment minus salvage value bracket close plus salvage value net off it gives the same result are you clear with this with this we are done with this and this ARR average rate of return whatever you get you will compare with the minimum expected return if the average rate of return is more than the minimum expected return go for the project else you don't go for it as simple as that this is the invest decision criteria are you clear with this guys yes so now 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 you just go uh, go here and just read it 
accounting rate of return what is the decision rule a project with a high arr is generally accepted so let's say there are project a project b project c i have three projects i need to choose between one project now whichever project has the higher arr i will go for that project so if you are deciding if your investment decision is based on arr then you will go for that project which has a higher arr are you clear with this that is how it should be interpreted next payback period now let's directly jump into the question and see what it is what do you mean by a payback period the time required to recover the initial cash outflow is called as payback period are you clear with this are you clear with this so a project with a lower payback period is generally preferred sir can you give us an example yes let's go to this question we will automatically see what it is very very simple guys understand things logically please don't ever mug it up it's very very simple now let's go to the third question <clears throat> Now, calculate the payback period and discounted payback period for a project with 30,000 rupees of cash outlay and annual cash inflows of 6,000 for a period of 10 years. The discount rate is 15 percentage. No, no, no. Payback period is under the traditional approach, correct? Discounted, uh, discounted payback period comes under the discounted approach. That is, if you see, there are two methods, correct? These are two different methods. If you see in the chart at the beginning, if you see in the chart at the beginning, if you see payback period comes under traditional or non-discounting model under the initial phase, then there is also something called as discounted payback period that comes under what discounted cash flow model. Are you clear with this? So we are going to see both. We are going to see both these methods. Now, first, let us see what is payback period related to this is only discounted payback period. That is exactly same as payback period. But in discounted payback period, you consider the time value of money concept. That's about it. What it is, we will see right now. Now, look at this. Look at this. Now, what they are mentioning what they are mentioning now a project requires an initial out outflow of how much 30000 rupees correct now let me just put it here this project requires an initial outflow of how much this project requires an initial outflow of so the cash outflow is going to be how much 30000 rupees and what have they mentioned what have they mentioned if you invest this 30000 rupees every year let's say i am investing 30000 rupees in this in purchasing this machine every year using this machine yes i will generate sales i will also have my cost to so sales minus all the costs so the cash flows after tax that is depreciation adding back all these adjustments if you see the net cash inflow that i get after all my expenses is six thousand for a period of 10 years right so basically what they are saying if you invest this then for the next 10 years one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten for the next ten years you will be generating how much cash inflows so you will be getting six thousand rupees every year correct you will be getting six thousand rupees every year six thousand six thousand six thousand six thousand six thousand six thousand and six thousand right now payback period means what payback period refers to how much time it takes to recover my initial cash outflow. I have invested 30,000 rupees in the business, correct. How long will it take for me to get back my initial investment? See, what we will do is cumulative cash flows. So in the first year, you've got how much? 6,000 rupees. In the second year, how much you've got? 6,000. So at the end of year two, till date, how much you've got? 6,000 plus 6,000. Can I say 12,000? Yes. At the end of year three, how much you've got in total? 6,000 plus 6,000 plus 6,000, that is 18,000, correct? At the end of year 4, you have got 18,000 plus another 6,000, 24,000, right? At the end of year 5, you have got how much? 24,000 plus uh, 6,000, 30,000, yes. So technically speaking, can I say, can I say, it takes 5 years for me to get back my initial cash outflow. Are you clear with this? And this 5 years is what is called as my payback period is called as my payback period payback period means what the time that a project takes to recover my entire cash outflow are you clear with this now you tell me if the payback period is less it is beneficial for me why quickly i can recover my entire cash outflow yes or no so lesser the payback period 
better it is for the company. Are you clear with this? So looking at from a payback period perspective, lesser the payback period, better it is for the company. Why? Because you can get your entire amount. You can recover your entire outflow at a quicker point in time itself. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? Or since in this question, the cash flows are equal, the cash flows can also be unequal, right? Since in this question, the cash flows are equal, for equal cash flows, there is a very simple formula to calculate this. So you can say that cash outflow divided by cash annual cash inflow. That is nothing but 30,000 rupees. So your payback period is nothing but 30,000 rupees divided by 6,000 rupees. So how long does it take? I need to recover 30,000. Every year I'm recovering 6,000 rupees, which means it takes five years for me to recover my entire capital. Are you clear with this? So this is a formula that you can use provided the cash flows are equal. Suppose the cash flows are unequal, then you use to, then you need to use this method that is cumulative cash flow model and you should see when exactly, when exactly the cash flow you are able to actually match it. When exactly you are able to recover your entire principal, you need to see it. Are you clear with this? So that is the first part of the question. Payback period is what? 30,000 divided by 6,000, five years. So which means it takes five years for you to recover back your entire investment. Are you clear with this? What do you mean by discounted payback period? Very simple. In this case, what we did? We did cash flows. We just saw the cash inflows and directly we saw how long my cash inflows will take how long my cash flows will take to recover back my entire principal? Yes, this ignored time value of money. Correct. Here we did not consider any time value of money. 6,000 at the end of year one is not same as 6,000 at the end of year two. But we just considered 6,000 everywhere and just we just went across. Correct. Now, now in this discounted cash flow model, what we need to say is we need to discount all the cash flows. That is all these cash inflows should be discounted. You should arrive at the present value of cash flows and you should see how long it takes for the present value of cash flows to recover back your original uh, original investment, initial outflow. Are you clear with this? I'm repeating discounted payback means the period it takes for your discounted present value of cash flows to recover back your initial outflow. We will see with this particular example. In this case, discount rate is given as 15 percentage. Discount rate is nothing but your weighted average cost of capital. So 10 years, every year you have what? Every year you have a cash flow of 6,000 rupees till the end of the 10th year. Yes, what is the present value interest factor? 15 years. Yes, you know how to compute the PV factors and all. We've seen this in the basic concepts. That is time value of money concepts. In case you have not seen it, it's being uploaded in a separate demo lecture. So please watch it. In case you do not know the basic concepts of time value of money, please watch it because it's a lengthy discussion by itself. Since it is not a separate chapter in our study material, I have kept it as a separate video from this marathon because if you know time value of money concepts, you need not watch it. You can directly enter into this marathon. Else, you need to refer the time value of money concepts and come into this. You can just brush it up. Clear. So now, yes, there is a way in which you can calculate 1 divided by 1.15. I've given you the calculated trick and all is equal to you put, you get this once again, point uh, as 870 or 0.6. Uh, 0.8695 so they have rounded off to 0 0.870 once again click is equal to you'll get the second figure once again click is equal to you will get the third figure is equal to fourth figure and so on so the present value interest factors you will get it correct in exam at times they might give this table itself or or if they have not given you the table they have just given the rate you can do it easily with your calculator one divided by 1.15 is equal to first figure once again click the is equal to second figure once again is equal to third figure and so on right so what is the present value of cash flow the relevant cash flow into the present value interest factor so the present value of cash flows for the relevant year so you have arrived at it are you clear with this this is nothing but this is nothing but what this is nothing but the cash flow that year's cash flow multiplied by present value interest factor so this 5220 is what today's value the present value of 6000 rupees arising at the end of year one 6000 rupees at the end arising at the end of year two in today's value is how much 4536 correct this is called as time value of money yes so now what we will do, we will do cumulative present value. So at the end of year one, how much you have earned? So till now, how much cash flow you have? 5220. Now at the end of year two, how much you have? Till now, 5220 plus that year's cash flow of 4536. Uh, 4, so till now you have earned how much? 9756. Now at the third year, how much you extra earn? 3948. So 
9756 plus 3948 till now you've got 13704 rupees correct of total cash inflows then 3 13704 plus your 3432 gives you 17136 so at the end of year for till now you have cumulative cash inflows of how much 17136 then at the end of year 5 2982 is the amount so 17136 plus 2982 gives you 20,188. Then plus 2572 gives you 22,710. Plus 2256 gives you 24,966. Plus 1962 gives you 26,928. Plus 1704 gives you 28,632. Plus 1482 gives you 30,144. So technically, how much you've invested? 30,000. But present value of cash flows when you are able to recover at the end of 10th year only, I am able to recover this entire amount of 30,000. Or technically speaking, the discounted payback period is how much? Approximately 10 years. Look, the cumulative total of discounted cash flows after 10 years is how much? 30,144. Therefore, our discounted payback period is approximately 10 years as opposed to 5 years under simple payback period. Under simple payback period, what we said, if you invest the money of 30,000 rupees, you will get it back in 5 years. But that was done ignoring time value of money. If you consider time value of money, the discounted payback period doubles in this case. In this case, it becomes how much? It becomes 30, uh, it becomes 10 years. Are you clear with this? So for me to get back my original amount of 30,000 by taking up my, by considering my discounted cash flows, it takes me 10 years approximately. Are you clear with this? Yes. So it should be noted that <clears throat> as the required rate of return increases, the distortion between the simple payback and the discounted payback grows. That is, if your, if your, if your uh, rate, that is if your discount rate keeps on increasing, so accordingly what will happen? Accordingly, if your discount rate is increasing, so cash flow divided by 1 plus R to the power N, correct? So if your discount rate increases, the overall value decreases, correct? Since your overall value decreases, now it takes more time for you to recover your cash inflow or in other words, or in other words, the discounted cash flow will, the discounted payback period will be further more. Are you clear with this? So when there is an increase in the uh, discount rate your discount uh, your uh, discounted payback period will be more are you clear with this this is what they are saying here but just understand that payback period means what the time it takes to recover my entire cash outflow what do you mean by discounted cash uh, discounted payback period the time that my discounted cash flows takes to recover my entire cash outflow. Are you clear with this? That is, the first one does not consider time value of money. The second one considers time value of money. And both the methods, you will go for that. So like this, you will compute for multiple projects or multiple machines. You will compute what the payback period and discounted payback period. So if you're going by a payback period or discounted payback period, you will go for that particular machine or that particular investment alternative that has a relatively lesser payback period or lesser discount payback period why because lesser payback or lesser discounted payback period means what you are able to recover your initial investment quickly itself are you clear with this so payback periods whether discounted or not discounted always remember lesser the better are you clear with this as simple as that guys as simple as that right so now now so directly we have completed two other models in this particular area so we have completed what? We have completed two other models that is payback and discounted payback period. So payback is done. Discounted payback period is also done. Clear with this? Yes. Now, now, now let's go to the next few methods in uh, the discounted, in your discounted cash flow methods. Let's go to the next few methods. We will see this. NPV, Profitability Index and IRR. What these are, we will be seeing right now. NPV, Profitability Index, IRR. So what are they? This is what we are going to be seeing right now. Yes, and Modified in IRR is actually a rarely tested area and, and it's an intricate discussion that requires a lot of reasoning and all that. So in my marathon, I'm not discussing this alone. MIRR alone, I am not discussing. I am not doing some, some relating to that. I think in the study material itself, there is only one or two sub. But the main area which are important from an examination perspective, I am going to focus on that. In fact, I am going to do a couple of case studies relating to your NPV methods. Some a couple of case studies which generally students find it difficult and all. That is what we are going to focus more on from an examination perspective. Overall, this chapter also we are covering everything except MIRR. Clear with this? Yes. Now, let's go to this. 
NPV profitability index IRR. So what are all these things? This is what we're going to do right now. NPV method. Obviously, this method considers what time value of money. What do you mean by NPV? The net present value technique is a discounted cash flow method that considers the time value of money in evaluating the capital investments. The net present value method uses a specified discount rate. What is a specified discount rate? KO, correct? So when you are doing NPV, you already have a discount rate with you, correct? To bring all the subsequent cash inflows after the initial investment to the present value, correct? The time of the initial investment here is zero. So what do you mean by net present value? The present value of cash inflows minus the present value of cash outflows. Outflow is nothing but your initial investment. Are you clear with this? So what do you mean by net present value? So present value means what? Bringing everything into today's value by discounting. Why is it called as net? You are netting out your inflows with your outflow. That is why it's called as a net present value. So net present value means what? The present value of cash flows after tax minus, minus my initial investment. Initial investment is already in today's value. It is already in present value. So because in, initial investment is made in T0, that is year zero, correct or not? And this NPV concept, we have already seen it. We have already seen it from a numerical perspective in this basic concepts. Right now, from an investment perspective, we will be seeing. So how will you calculate the NPV? So NPV is equal to present value of present value of cash inflows minus initial in, uh, initial investment, correct? Minus initial cash outflow. The initial investment is I, correct? Minus I, fine. Whereas the present value of cash inflows, how will you get it? Cash flow at the end of year one divided by one plus K to the power one plus cash flow at the end of year two divided by one plus K to the power two plus cash flow at the end of year three divided by one plus K to the power three and so on till cash flow at the end of year n divided by one plus K to the power n, correct? The life of the project will be given. So every year's cash flow, you need to discount it. Now, in this case for NPV, what they will do is the discount rate will be given in the question, which is generally your overall cost of capital. Are you clear with this? Why am I stressing on this? Because, because in IRR, in IRR, we will be calculating a rate. We will be calculating a rate and that rate is not a discount rate. That rate is called IRR rate. What it is, I will tell you when we are getting into IRR. But for the time being, you just understand in NPV method, the discount rate that we use is your weighted average cost of capital. Are you clear with this? Using this weighted average cost of capital, you bring all the cash flows in today's value, in present value, and net present value means present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflow. Your present value of cash outflow is nothing but your net initial investment. Are you clear with this? Now, now, if your NPV is positive, that is, if your cash inflows, the present value of cash inflow is greater than present value of cash outflow, which means NPV is positive, correct? If the NPV is positive, then it means that overall, this project, this investment avenue generates some positive return so you can go for the project. Are you clear with this? If your present value of cash inflow is less than the present value of cash outflow, so what happens? Your NPV is in negative, which means you should never go into this project. Why? If you get into this project, there is a loss. Loss after considering the time value of money. Are you clear with this? Yes. Are you clear with this? Yes. Look at this. If the NPV is greater than or equal to zero, you can accept the proposal. If it is less than or equal to zero, you should reject the proposal. So technically speaking, this equal to should not come here also in both the places. If the NPV is greater than zero, generally you can accept it. If it is less than zero, you should reject the proposal. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? This is about your this is about your NPV. Are you clear with this? Now, 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 an extension of NPV is only called as profitability index. Now, what they are saying is, this is just for representation purpose, that NPV is what? NPV is present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflow, correct? Now, profitability index, this is nothing but, this is a ratio. This is present value of cash inflow divided by present value of cash outflow. Or in other words, in other words, you can say, you can say, if your profitability index is greater than one, it means what? The numerator is more than the denominator. Yes. Or in other words, inflow is more than outflow. It means that the NPV is positive. 
are you clear with this if 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 your profitability index is less than one meaning what inflow is less than outflow or in present value so your npv is in negative or in other words can i say if the cost profitability index is greater than when one you can accept the proposal if the profitability index is less than one you should not go for the proposal technically speaking it's an extended arm of npv method only are you clear with this yes are you clear with this so if it is greater than or equal to one accept it if it is less than or equal to one reject it ideally here also if it is greater than one accept less than one reject that's how it generally uh, should be are you clear with this in case of mutually exclusive projects the project with a higher profitability index should be selected what does it mean let's say i have an option i am telling you a b c out of these three machines you can only invest in one machine then what will you do let's say machine a has a profitability index of 1.2 machine b has a profitability index of 1.4 machine c has a profitability index of 0.9 which machine will you choose i will go for machine b now that is called as mutually exclusive mutually exclusive means what you can only choose one suppose 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 it is not mutually exclusive they are saying you can choose how many ever projects you want you can go for a b c or a b whatever you want you can take then i will say i will go for a as well as for b why because in both these projects the present value of cash inflow is greater than the present value of cash outflow so both these projects are profitable i will go for it suppose they are asking me to choose only one that is go for that is that means mutually exclusive so in case of mutually exclusive decision what i will do i will go for that project that has a highest npv or highest what highest uh, profitability index are you clear with this are you clear with this this is about your profitability index next so profitability index is nothing but sum of discounted cash inflows divided by initial outlay or the total discounted cash outflow as the case may be are you clear with this that's about it that's about it next internal rate of return we have seen this in depth in our basic concepts the video is already there in our uh, youtube channel please watch it in case you uh, you do not get a hold of this irr this is something that we saw in our basic concepts because the concept of irr was also there in our cost of capital chapter and all so that is the reason why i already did this in basic concepts which is also uploaded in our youtube channel right so now what is your irr internal rate of return what is your internal rate of return guys very very important remember one thing irr is a percentage clear irr is a percentage it is a it is calculated in percentage that is that is what we will do is suppose in this question in this question let us say <clears throat> okay so let us say this is what they had given okay so 10 100 crores is given let's say let me just take this example as a model um one second okay now let us say let us say this is the data given in the question what is the data given in this question they are saying they are saying this is all is given in the question guys please carefully listen students again gets get confused here so that's why i i want to uh, give you a lot of clarity on this area this is the data given in the question let's say the company can invest in machine number a okay if the company invest wants to invest in machine a initial outflow is how much 100 crore rupees they need to let's say machine a or project a correct it's an investment alternative fixed asset non current assets whichever way you want you can say now if i want to invest into this project initially i will have to spend how much 100 crores in buying the machines and all that and in at the end of year one it generates a cash flow after tax of 30 crores year two 25 crores year three 15 crores year four 10 crores and year five 12 crores clear with this fine just one second okay so i'm just changing this cash flows you don't worry why i've changed the figures i'm just giving you an example right so let's say if i want to invest in this machinery beginning in today today i need to invest 100 crores if i invest pay 100 crores and buy this machine using this machine i will be able to generate the following cash inflows that is 
40 crores in the, at the end of year one, 38 at the end of year two, uh, uh, 35 at the end of year three, 20 at the end of year four, and 15 at the end of year five. Let's say these are the cash inflows that I will be able to generate. Now, now you tell me what is the return that I am able to get out of this particular project? That is, what is the return? net return how much am i earning from this particular machine if i invest 100 crores today and get this following cash flows technically what is the return that i am getting out of this project this return calculation is only called as irr are you clear with this or in other words in other words outflow is given inflow is also given calculating r is called as calculating the discount rate is called as what it is called as your IRR. Now, let me just give you a small example. Let me give you a small example. Let's say, let's say you have invested 100 rupees today, right? Yes, you have put it in an FD. At the end of year one, you get how much? Let us say 110 rupees. They pay along with the interest. Now, tell me what is the, tell me what is actually, what is your uh, so what is going to be your return in this case now what is going to be your return in this case now can i say can i say it's very simple what is the big deal sir 100 into 1 plus r the whole power 1 is equal to 110 they have paid some interest we know that correct they have paid some interest or in other words 100 into 1 plus r the whole power 1 is equal to 110 correct or can I say 1 plus r the whole power 1 is equal to 110 divided by 100 correct or in other words 1 plus r the whole power 1 is only 1 is equal to can I say 1.10 or can we say can we say guys can we say r is equal to 1.10 minus 1 so r is equal to 0 0.10 or 10 percentage correct or not yes now a simple in so forget this irr for the time being simply i'm just saying you you invested 100 rupees on an fd at the end of year one you got 110 rupees what is the return this is simple one cash outflow one cash inflow directly you can use the simple interest the uh, compound interest formula you can use and directly find the r value correct or not so we just said 100 to 1 plus r the whole power one is equal to my is equal to what is equal to your um uh, is equal to 110 correct or in other words can i say 1 plus r the whole power 1 is equal to 110 by 100 or in other words if you do this you get the net return as 10 percentage correct or not yes or in other words what we are doing here in other words what we did here so basically basically for us to find this out what we did for us to find this out what we are doing we just did 100 into 1 plus r the whole power 1 is equal to 110 we equated the cash inflow with the cash outflow correct or can we say can we say 100 is equal to 110 divided by 1 plus r the whole power 1 this is what we did or in other words can i also say the rate that equates my present value of cash inflow with my present value of cash outflow is called as IRR. Are you clear with this? So basically inflow outflow is all given. The balancing figure is R. That alone we need to find. Or in other words, can we say the net rate of return that I get is nothing but the rate that exactly equates my present value of cash inflow with my present value of cash outflow. Or you can say present value of cash outflow with my present value of cash outflow. Uh, present value of cash outflow with my present value of cash inflow is called as IRR. Correct or not? Yes. Now, in this case, it was a very simple calculation. Why? Only one cash inflow, one cash outflow. That's about it. Whereas here, there is one cash outflow followed by a series of cash inflow. Yes or no? Now, in this case, there is no formula method and all. There is no method. There is no method to calculate. There is actually no formula to calculate IRR till date. Are you clear with this? So then, how will we calculate, sir? By using trial and error method. So what we will have to do is. So what do you mean by IRR? IRR is the rate that equates my present value of cash inflow with my present value of cash outflow. Correct. So present value of cash inflow should be equal to my present value of cash outflow when the rate is IRR rate. Are you clear with this? Now, in this example, you tell me what is my present value of cash outflow? 100 crore rupees. Correct. Guys, actually, I've done all these things, the basic concepts. Still, I'm just touching it upon once again. 
this should be equal to the present value of present value of cash outflow so since this is an investment decisions there is an initial outflow followed by a series of cash inflow are you clear with this yes so initially how much i spent 100 crores was the inflow sorry 100 crores was the outflow i had to shell out 100 crore rupees in purchasing this equipment followed by a series of cash inflow i get 40 38 35 20 15 respectively yes can i add it as such no i need to convert i need to discount everything into present value so how will i do it can i say this is equal to 40 divided by 1 plus r to the power 1 plus what is the second year's cash flow 38 38 divided by 1 plus r to the power 2 plus what is the third year cash flow 35 35 divided by 1 plus r to the power 3 plus can i say this is 20 20 divided by 1 plus r to the power 4 plus finally you have 15 crores 15 divided by 1 plus r to the power pi yes or no or in other words can i say can i say the rate that equates my present value of cash outflow with my present value of cash inflow is called as irr yes or no now 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 one more additional thing i am saying now can i say can i say if i take this present value of cash outflow to this other side so can i say zero is equal to present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow correct or not so if if your rate at your irr your present value of cash outflow will be equal to your present value of cash inflow yes that is the rate that equates my inflow with my outflow outflow is only called as irr correct or in other words can i say at irr my present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow will be equal to zero correct now present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow is popularly called as npv yes guys or in other words can i say irr is the discount rate that makes my npv equal to zero so can we say zero is equal to 40 divided by 1 plus r to the power 1 plus 38 divided by 1 plus r to the power 2 plus 35 divided by 1 plus r to the power 3 plus 20 divided by 1 plus r to the power 4 plus 15 divided by 1 plus r to the power 5 this is the present value of cash inflows minus 100 crores minus 100 are you clear with this so the present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow gives you your npv or in other words npv is the rate that makes my irr sorry i'm sorry i'm coming come, i'm coming again so your IRR is the rate that makes your NPV equal to zero. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? So now, sir, how will we calculate? How can we find this uh, IRR? So you said there is no formula. You need to do some trial and error method only. How will you do it? What the first assumption? Just an example. Let R is equal to 10 percentage. You substitute it in the equation and see if you are getting exactly equal to zero. Let us say you are getting some positive figure it is not zero then what you need to do so now you need to take a second trial you need to take a second trial so you will take the second trial as let's say 12 percentage or 15 percentage as the case may be you can take any any figure so you will get one negative irr correct you will get a negative npv right so you clearly know that you clearly know that so for a positive npv if you take your discount rate at as 10 percentage you are getting a positive npv if you get a 12 percentage discount rate it is negative npv so basically your irr lies somewhere in between what 10 percentage and 12 percentage you do that interpolation what is that interpolation that formula is only given here lower rate that is lower rate plus npv at lower rate divided by npv at lower rate minus npv at higher rate into higher rate minus lower rate or in other words in other words what we do is we take this as the base 10 percentage just an example 10 percentage this is the lower rate plus npv at the lower rate so for 10 percentage whatever is the npv this positive figure you will write down correct now divided by divided by what is the npv that you require what is the NPV that you require? So you have a positive NPV here. You want to make this as zero. Are you clear with this? So what we do here is, what we do here is NPV at the lower rate minus NPV at the higher rate. That is, that is the difference between these two we take. 
correct the difference between these two figures these two npvs we take correct into high rate minus low rate this is what we get this is what we get for the difference between these two rates 12 minus 10 2 then how much should we get how much should we get to make this difference of lower rate this is what is called as interpolation so for this figure for this figure how much should be the extra discount rate that we need to get so that is the formula logically we have seen all these things in our irr detailed explanation with numerical problems we have seen so lower rate plus npv at lower rate divided by npv at lower rate minus npv at higher rate into higher rate minus lower rate nothing of this needs to be mugged up are you clear with this now let's say for example not this 10 percent 12 percent or not sir how will i know to take 10 percent or how will i know to take 12 percent it need not be between this if you first take one percentage they say you take 15 percentage see whether you get a positive npv or negative npv sir i'm getting a positive npv which means what which means what if you're getting a positive npv which means if you now you now need to reduce sorry if you're getting a positive npv what you now need to do you need to bring down the overall npv to zero so you increase your denominator if you increase your discount rate so it will be your overall npv will reduce so the next trial you take above whatever you have taken in the first trial are you clear with this but make sure that one trial gives you a positive npv one trial gives you a negative npv and using the interpolation technique you can find your exact irr sir in real life is it so difficult to calculate irr no in a click of a button you can just calculate irr using various um, you know various softwares the basic software that you can use is even spreadsheet your excel spreadsheet so equal to xirr and if you just put the figures it will automatically come uh, there are so many softwares we just key in basically if you just enter all the cash flows the end of relevant years automatically calculate irr if you just one click of a button it will calculate but in, for examination purpose since they want to test you on the concept they are asking you for trial and error method but understand in real life irr calculation is very simple because there are a lot of softwares that can compute this in a fraction of a second are you clear with this and this entire irr how to calculate this and all we have seen it in our basic concepts in our basic concept chapter in case in case you have not seen it in case this particular area you are finding it difficult i would suggest that you please watch the irr uh, video in the basic concepts so that it will it's a separate video that's been uploaded so please ensure that you watch it in case you have an issue with this particular IRR understanding because I have made a separate video on this. It's a very elaborate discussion. So I would suggest that in case you are finding it difficult to follow this IRR area, you go to that video, watch it and come back. Are you clear with this? Yes. So with this, this is what is called as IRR and we have computed the internal rate of return. Basically, what do you mean by IRR? IRR is nothing but you are calculating the return on investment. So return on investment is easy only, no sir? Yes. Pro, it is very easy to calculate return upon investment, correct. But provided there is only one cash flow, you have multiple cash flows, then you need to do it only like this. So technically, IRR in this chapter represents what? What is the net amount of return that I get for the investment that I have made? Are you clear with this? Now, now this is called as IRR. Yes. Now be very, very clear. IRR is the rate that makes my NPV zero, correct? Whereas, 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 NPV calculation is generally done by taking your discount, R as discount rate. Discount rate is what? Their weighted average cost of capital, yes or no. So always remember, NPV is calculated by taking R as what? Discount rate, that is your weighted average cost of capital. Whereas this particular question, this particular area, IRR, the question itself is about calculating the discount rate. The discount rate, IRR, is nothing but is nothing but the rate that makes my NPV equal to zero. That is called as my IRR. Are you clear with this? So there are two discount rates in this chapter. One is called as weighted average cost of capital, which is the relevant discount rate used for computing your NPV. Whereas, whereas IRR calculation itself is a calculation. Itself is a calculation of the rate that makes my NPV equal to zero are you clear with this guys are you equal are you clear with this so basically irr is the rate that makes my present value of cash inflows equal to my present value of cash outflows now you tell me irr is nothing but the net return that is generated out of my investment correct now sir why is irr useful guys very very simple now now look at this look at this i know that if i raise funds there is something called as cost of capital ko correct and if i invest this funds here in various investments i know the net return that it generates irr 
very simple if your irr is greater than your weighted average cost of capital you can go for the project if your irr is less than your weighted average cost of capital then you should not go for the project very simple guys yes are you clear with this that is what they have mentioned here if your irr is greater than or equal to the cutoff rate popularly known as vac accept the proposal if it is lesser than the cutoff rate then reject the proposal are you clear with this are you clear with this this is all the story about your irr how to compute irr we have already seen in basic concepts i just gave you a bird's eye view here if you are not clear with it please watch the basic concepts video separately that is separately there in our channel but this one are you able to understand how this irr is related to our investment decisions are you clear with this so with irr what will i do sir compare it to the weighted average cost of capital irr is your return weighted average cost of capital is your cost it is a cost used for raising my finance irr is nothing but the return that i generate by investing the finance so if my return is more than cost i will go for it or in other words irr greater than vac go for the proposal irr less than vac don't go for proposal are you clear with this as simple as that guys it's very very simple clear so what is npv npv is nothing but present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows how will you arrive at the present value by using the discount rate as your weighted average cost of capital here irr has no role to play are you clear with this the discount rate is your weighted average cost of capital then what is your profitability index your present value of inflow divided by present value of outflow so basically if it is greater than 1 you will accept if it is less than 1 you will not accept the proposal and irr is the rate that equates your present value of cash inflow with your present value of cash outflow or in other words irr is a rate that makes my npv equal to 0 so what is the decision criteria here if your irr is greater than vac go for the proposal irr less than vac don't go for the proposal are you clear with this these are the three things that i want to tell you now now there is a very interesting question given in the study material so i want to explain this question so let's quickly go into get into this particular question this question is about missing figures missing figures using the concept of irr npv cost of capital profitability index or not so now this is nothing more than testing how well you know this particular concept are you clear with this so let's get started into this area right away <clears throat> the following data is available for a capital project annual cash inflows every year it generates cash inflows of how much 1 lakh rupees useful life 4 years salvage value at the end of the project zero irr is given as 12% guys be very clear i told you irr is different your cost of capital discount rate is different clear irr is 12 percentage pi means what profitability index is 1.064 you are required to calculate the following cost of the project cost of capital net present value and payback period they are not asking you for discounted payback just a payback period are you clear with this these are the missing figures now what i would suggest is pause this video right now take a rough notebook try to crack this by yourself don't look at the solution try to crack this by yourself it's an institute study material question now if i am an examiner i would be interested in testing you this question for a simple reason i'll tell you the open reason why i would be if i put myself in uh, the shoes of an examiner i would be interested to pick this question because single question test you on concepts of irr npv cost of capital uh, profitability index sir here many things are given already you will at least know how to use it you should know how to use it don't think all questions are computation driven certain questions are also logic driven in fact most questions are logic driven you should know what to use how to use this data and arrive at the missing figures very very important are you clear with this so now now let's get started so in case in case um you 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 still not aware of this particular question please pause it right now and try to crack this question by yourself and then check the answers now now what have they given pv factors also they have given look 12% 11% 10% 9% they have given the pv factors also right so now let's see how to do this particular question now what have they given what have they given guys where do we start with it they have given that annual cash flows are how much 12 percentage they have also given irr is 12 percentage life is 4 years can i say can i say can i say now 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 irr is the rate that equates my present value of cash outflow with my present value of cash inflow yes or no yes now what is my present value of cash inflow every year i am having 1 lakh 1 lakh equal amount so can i say 1 lakh into present value interest factor annuity of 4 years 
at the rate 12 percentage yes or no so can i say the initial cash outflow is equal to my present value of cash inflow yes present value of cash inflow is nothing but annual cash flow since it is equal i can use the annuity table into present value interest factor of annuity of four percentage for 12 years yes guys now they have given 12 years they have given the discount present value table so if i add these four i will get the present value interest factor of annuity yes or no so can i say annual cash inflows is one lakh yes so considering the discount factor of 12 percentage the present value interest factor of annuity of four years for 12 percentage is going to be how much 0.893 plus 0.797 plus 0.712 plus 0.636 it gives you a total of how much 3.038 guys these are all time value of money concepts correct so 3.038 correct so basically it's nothing but 1 lakh into 3.308 so the sum total of the cash inflows is going to be how much 3 lakh 3800 correct and and at in at irr at irr your cash inflow is equal to your cash outflow so basically your cash outflow or in other words the project cost is how much three lakh three thousand eight hundred are you clear with this this is how you need to do this particular question so first they had asked for what cash uh, they have asked for the cost of the project they are given the annual cash flows they have given the irr rate what do you need to do the present value of cash inflows using the irr rate will be equal to my present value of cash outflow present value of cash outflow is nothing but the cost of the project are you clear with this cost of the project that is the only cash outflow i have yes or no so you just need to take one lakh into present value interest factor of annuity of four percentage for 12 years and you will get this answer guys that simple it is provided you know how to apply it next calculate what calculate the cost of capital you should calculate what cost of capital now now how can we calculate cost of capital we should use profitability index now profitability index is equal to what present value of cash inflows divided by present value of cash outflows now remember guys remember guys for profitability index and npv the present value of all the cash flow should be done at what it should be done at the, the discount rate here should be what your cost of capital and we need to calculate that only right now so don't consider 12 percentage for this because 12 percentage is your irr that makes your npv equal to zero are you clear with this here we are only going to we are we are going to compute the discount rate only right now the discount rate is the weighted average cost of capital that is used for your npv and profitability index calculation now now what is your profitability index 1.064 is equal to present value of cash inflow divided by what is the present value of cash outflow that is the project what is the project cost we just got the project cost as 3,3800 yes guys divided by 3,3800 yes or no or in other words can I say or in other words can I say present value of cash inflow is equal to just cross multiply 3,3800 multiplied by 1.064 so how much do you get 3,3800 into 1.064 so how much do you get guys so one second so 3,3800 into 1.064 you get how much you get 32 lakh one second i'm sorry 3 lakh 3800 into 1.064 that gives you yes 3 lakh 23243.2 approximately correct so this gives you 3 lakh uh, uh, 3 lakh 23243.2 approximately yes guys or can i say can i say the present value of cash inflows is equal to 3,23,243. Yes, guys. Present value of cash inflows, how will you get? It is nothing but 1 lakh rupees. Every year there is 1 lakh rupees into present value interest factor annuity of X percentage. I don't know how much the percentage. That's what I need to calculate. For how many years? For 4 years is equal to 3 lakh uh, 23,243. Yes. Or can I say present value interest factor of annuity for X percentage four years is going to be how much? 3 lakhs divided by 1 lakh. So uh, can I say this is 3.23243. Yes, guys. So now, now what you need to do in this table, you should go and see if you add up at what rate it becomes 3.23423. Yes. 
at what rate 3.23 so at 3.232 at what rate it becomes when your r is 9 percentage so you calculate r 9 percentage you sum total of this since it's an annuity table you are sum totaling this 0.917 plus 0.842 plus 0.772 plus 0.708 how much is that 3.239 are you clear with this so 3.239 approximately you are getting it here so can we say that here the relevant discount rate except the rate of 4 percent x percentage is how much 9 percentage so now can i say the cost of capital is how much 9 percentage are you clear with this are you clear with this so what we did we started with profitability index what is profitability index present value of cash inflows divided by present value of cash outflows you have the profitability index you have the present value of cash outflow so the balancing figure is how much present is what that is your present value of cash uh, inflow correct so my present value of cash inflow is this so present value of cash inflow is nothing but my annual cash flow into present value interest factor annuity of x percentage into four years this x percentage is only my cost of capital percentage why because profitability index and npv and all is calculated only using my weighted average cost of capital this is different from my irr correct so this is going to be how much this is going to be nine percentage guys are you clear with this is everyone clear with this so technically if you see in this question what is cost of capital nine percentage yes now now just a small understanding so your cost of capital, weighted average cost of capital is how much? 9%, correct? That is, you have borrowed, you have raised the funds by paying 9% and you are investing it in projects that is generating how much? 12%. So that's why, that's why you can go for the proposal or not. Yes, that is the reason why this profitability index is also showing 1 point something. It is greater than 1. Why you were greater than 1? Because the present value of cash inflow is greater than my present value of cash outflow. That is the reason why you are actually showing what? You are showing actually a profitability index of more than 1. Why is it more than 1? Because my IRR is greater than my cost of capital. Guys, are you able to connect the dots here? Are you able to connect the dots? It's as simple as that. Simple finance, if you just know it logically, you will be able to apply it then. Net present value, very simple. Present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow. We just calculated the present value of cash inflow using the, the uh, weighted average cost of capital. So 3,23,243, correct? So 3,23,243, look at this. 3,23,243.2 minus 3,3,800. Present value of cash outflow is the cost of project. So it's going to be how much? Positive. NPV showing positive 19,443. Why NPV showing positive? Obviously because, because my, my IRR is greater than my weighted average cost of capital. Correct. Since my IRR is greater than my weighted average cost of capital, what happens? My NPV is actually greater than zero. Yes, guys. Or, or, or in other words, in other words, my profitability index is greater than one. Why in the numerator you have inflows, present value inflows, in the denominator you have present value outflows. If your present value of inflows is greater than the outflows, only then it will be greater than one. Guys, are you able to connect all these three things together? Your IRR, NPV, profitability index, these are all some interrelated things. Students think these are some different, different things that we need to know. No. This is like a chain which you need to understand together. Are you clear with this? Because my IRR is greater than my weighted average cost of capital, it makes my NPV greater than zero, which makes my profitability index greater than one. Are you clear with this? So suppose my IRR is equal to my weighted average cost of capital. Suppose my IRR is equal to my weighted average cost of capital. So basically what happens in this case? Basically what happens in this case? So it is an indifference thing. So whatever is the return that you make out of your investment exactly that you need to pay to your uh, sources of finance. So basically it doesn't generate you any revenue at all or, or in other words this makes this makes your NPV this makes your NPV exactly equal to zero. This makes your NPV exactly equal to zero. Yes guys are you clear with this? That is that is that is your IRR and back if you are equating it that is if these two are coincidentally equal this is what will happen but that is not the subject matter of study here understand always if IRR is greater than VAC it generally means it generally means that your NPV is greater than zero which makes your profitability index greater than one understand the link between all these formulas are you clear with this yes and finally they had asked for payback period so payback period is very simple payback period or discounted payback only payback period so which means what so I need to, how much time it will take for me to require my entire investment? Very simple. What is the total investment? It's going to be 
what is the total investment it's going to be three lakh three thousand eight hundred divided by one lakh equal cash flows only so you will not put the cumulative table and all so it takes 3.038 years to recover your entire cash flow sir can years be in decimals yes so basically there's nothing but 0 0.038 years into 365 if we do it's actually 13.87 days approximately this is nothing but three years and 13 days that is the meaning of this are you clear with this that's why they have put it as decimals yes you can keep it in decimals don't round it off are you clear with this guys so approximately it takes th three years and 13 days to recover my entire entire investment this is the meaning of payback period guys are you able to get the clarity it is as simple as that are you clear with this so we have seen all the methods right now now let's go to two problems which are exclusively case study types now, these are some interesting questions which I feel are typically the exam type of problems that you can be tested. So, let's go to question number 5 right now. Let's go to question number 5. Capital budgeting with working capital. Now, now this is a question which many students find difficult because they are not able to understand the question itself. Now, guys, understand one thing. There is nothing new that we are going to study in this particular question understand that this is nothing more than nothing more than applying the facts given in the question with whatever data we have studied till now are you clear with this there is no rocket science that we are going to generate here whatever we have studied we are just going to apply that apply that with the relevant facts given in the question of course one thing extra that we are going to see is something related to working capital which ideally you will also get clarity once we do that working capital chapter revision but anyways, anyways, it can be done right now. So that shouldn't be a problem at all. So if you see this question first, don't fear. Because in my past in interaction with students, they generally feel that if this big, big sum comes in, it is very difficult. It is very difficult to crack. Guys, I'm telling you, these are all some easy questions provided. The first thing is you should not have the fear when you read this question. Oh my God, this is a big question. So how am I going to crack it? No. Throw the fear off. First, you read it. You logically think you need not be a finance expert to crack this question. Logically, you think I will explain word by word. Logically, you will see how easy these questions are. Clear? Fine. So let us do this question. Have the patience. Read it along with me. Follow my instructions. Trust me. Automatically, you will be able to crack these kind of questions. These kind of questions are typically can be tested for 10 marks, guys. And this chapter time and again gets tested for 10 marks. Every attempt, it gets tested for 10 marks. Almost every attempt. Remember, this is 10 out of 60 marks currently in the old syllabus. In the new syllabus, it's going to be 50 marks total. Out of the 10 marks, generally, this chapter never gets missed out. The reason, it's a very important chapter. This chapter is also there in your CA final, in AFM, Advanced Financial Management. This chapter is as such there in your final. But of course, with certain incremental learnings we will be having. But for that, the base is going to be the same. So remember, this is a very important chapter for your entire CA career. Are you clear with this? At least in the time you finish your CA, you need this chapter for sure. Are you clear with this? Yes. Now, let me just read this question out for you. Please do not do not have any kind of aversion against this chapter or this type of questions. Have an open mind. I'm saying this again and again because I have seen students who just cribble about this particular question, the, these kind of questions, like big, big questions. They are giving some, some case scenarios they are giving and they are doing some complex calculation. What is this? We don't even understand. Patiently, you just listen. I'll tell you every single thing is logical. Now, a large profit-making company is considering a machine to process the waste produced by one of its existing manufacturer process to be converted into a marketable product. Wait, what they are saying? A company is that a large profit-making company. Yes, what they want to do is considering to install a machine to process the waste produced by one of its existing manufacturing process to be converted into a marketable product. Now, let me just give you an example. Now, guys, uh, if you have seen in this cosmetic uh, products like Fair and Lovely or your Fiamma de Wilt and all these L'Oreal, um, you know, the face wash and all that, what they generally show is there will be a model and they will show some real fruits and all they will show papaya extract and all they will show the real fruits and they will say that this cream or whatever thing that they are selling is made of the real fruits and all they will say like that yes but technically speaking you know what happens so if they are showing orange orange pulp they will definitely use but more than the orange pulp 
they will use what? They will use the orange peels and all. That is the outer shell of that orange. Now, don't think that it is bad. It is good only. Don't worry. But what I am saying is, in these advertisements, they show more of that orange pulp and they say we have made it using orange or we have made it using papaya and all. But actually what they do is, what they do, I will tell you, yes, they also use some extracts. I am not denying it. You know, these companies like Tropicana, these companies that manufactures juice, what they do is, they actually enter the juice. I mean, they enter the um, vegetables or they enter the fruits in the typically fruits, correct? There are also a few vegetables on the basis of which juices are made, but let's not talk about that. Generally, they actually input the juice, uh, they input the fruits into the process, correct? And, and the processing happens and then fresh juice comes as an output and then this particular peels and all the leftover waste comes out as an output, correct or not? This also comes out on the other side, yes or no? So typically, these kind of companies, just imagine they manufacture mango juice, papaya juice, whatever it is, input is fruits, yet their output, their main output is juice, correct? But coincidentally, something else also comes out that is nothing but all these waste. Waste as from their viewpoint, it is a waste. Clear, don't think it's uh, waste means it is not a usable product. So some papaya peels or uh, some pulp, leftover pulp and all will be there. Now, now, all these uh, pulp and all these things is there, no? Correct. What these guys do, they do some further processing. Slightly, they just process it and they sell this food, Tropicana, all their leftover waste. From their viewpoint, it's a waste. Again and again, I'm telling you, waste, don't take it as such. From their viewpoint, it's a waste and that waste, they sell it to all these companies like Pons, Piyama, Deviles and all these companies. Are you clear with this? Cosmetic industry, are you clear with this? So advertisement, they show real papaya. What goes inside, I just told you. Right now, you decide. Now, coming back, I just I just took example of a few companies, guys. Nothing against these companies. Again, please don't make a big uh, issue about it. I'm just telling you an example with reasoning. Now, now, what happens? Currently, what Tropicana is doing is, whatever is the waste that they are getting, all the fruit peel and all, they are throwing it away, right? Now, for throwing it away, what happens? They are incurring some cost and all. Now, this, we are, uh, this company, Tropicana, is thinking that, look, look, there is a ready market for us. If we slightly process this waste, we can sell it to this cosmetics guys. Are you clear with this? That is the thought process of this company. Now, you read it. A large profit-making company is considering installation of a machine, new machine. What? To process the waste produced by one of its existing manufacturing process. Existing manufacturing processes, the juice manufacturing process. It generates what waste? That waste is only your fruit peels and the leftovers. Clear? This can be converted into a marketable product. At present, the waste is removed by a contractor for disposal on payment by the company of 1 lakh, 150 lakh rupees per annum for the next four years. So what they are doing? Currently, the company is throwing away all the peels. By, by hiring a contractor, you don't think it will be this much amount of peel. See, in your house, if you cut fruits and vegetables itself, you have this much amount of uh, wastage left over, right? Now, just imagine a company which is into this business of manufacturing juices. They have a lot of waste. If From their viewpoint, they can't use it for that. It has to be disposed of. So they are saying every year they incur 150 lakhs to just to dispose of. No revenue from this. They are just disposing it off. Are you clear with this? Currently, the company is treating this as a waste and they are disposing it off by spending 150 lakh per annum. They have entered into a contract with an outside contractor for the next four years. Now, suppose, suppose this waste, if it can be processed and converted into a marketable product, now it need not be disposed of, correct? I can cancel this contract and this contractor can be terminated upon the uh, upon installation of the aforesaid machine on payment of a compensation of 90 lakh rupees before processing operation starts. So what they are saying? Now, currently we have already entered into a four-year contract with a operator, with a particular contractor. What is a contract? He has to come and remove all the, dispose of all the waste and he should take back, take up, or take up all the waste and throw it away. Correct for him, I will pay 150 lakhs per annum. It's a contract already done. Suppose, suppose I want to, I want to, I don't want to dispose it, but I want to convert it into a marketable product. Then I should cancel my contract with this particular contractor. He's saying, if you want to cancel it, you need to pay a penalty of 90 lakh rupees. If cancelled, pay a penalty of 90 lakh rupees so that for the next four years, I will not trouble you. So all this 150 lakhs per annum and all, you need not pay. 
Are you clear with this? So if I wish to go for this, converting this waste into a marketable product, what I need to do, I need to incur additionally 90 lakh rupees. I need to pay to this contractor and say, wait, I had entered into your contract by mistake. Now I have changed my mind. I want to convert it into a marketable product. So I don't need your disposal services. So what I will do is I will pay this 90 lakhs as a penalty upfront. Are you clear with this? And this compensation is not allowed as a deduction for tax purposes. Clear. Next, the machine required for carrying out the processing will cost 600 lakhs. Now, if I want to process this waste into a marketable product, I need to buy a new machine exclusively for this. Correct. That will cost one time investment 600 lakh rupees. At the end of the fourth year, the machine can be sold for 60 lakh rupees salvage value. And the cost of dismantling and removing will be 45 lakh rupees. That is at that time, if I want to dispose of this machine, I will have to incur 45 lakh rupees. Are you clear with this? These are the details relating to the machine that I'm going to buy newly if I want to, if I want to take up this further processing of wastage. Clear? So what are the costs? Initial 600 lakhs, correct? At the end of the fourth year, salvage value is 60 lakhs, but wait, but wait, the cost of dismantling will be 45 lakhs. So basically net off, you will get how much? 15 lakhs of cash inflow you can generate at the end of year four at the time of selling it off, scrapping it off, clear. Now, the sales and direct costs of the product emerging from the waste processing for four years are estimated as under. So what they are saying, so now this project can have a useful life of four years, correct? It's a project, fine. Now, if I use all these machines and with this machine, if I'm looking at this business proposal, year-wise, how much is the sale is given? Year-wise, how much material consumption is required? How much wages is required? How much other expenses is required? How much factory overage is required? And how much is the depreciation computed as per income tax rule? Year-wise, these data are given below. Are you clear with this? So why have they given all these things? Yes, with this only we can compute the cash flows and all, correct? So sales, I need to take minus the material consumption wages and all, all these costs, other expenses and all. Look at this, factory overheads is given and then depreciation is also given. Year-wise data is given. Clear with this, guys? Yes. Now, one more para they have given. Initial stock of materials required before commencement of the processing operation is 60 lakhs at the start of year one. The stock levels of materials to be maintained at the end of year one, two and three would be 165 lakhs. And the stock at the end of year four will be nil. Now, first, this particular line item, let us see. This is the important, the important line item because many students get it wrong only here. Now, this is where I said this chapter is relating to your working capital management. Correct, we will be seeing details about the working capital management chapter in the next revision. Don't worry about it. It is an upcoming thing. We will be doing it in the next lesson. But right now, understand what is this. First of all, you should understand these are not costs. These are cash flows. Um, remember this, they are not cost, they are cash flow. So what you are seeing now, now every year, every year, what is the material consumed is given 90, 120, 255, 255 It's given. That is year wise raw material cost is already given by them. Correct guys. That is not a problem here. Look what they are saying. Initial stock of materials required before commencement is 60 at the start of year one and the stock levels to be maintained at the end of year one, two and three will be what? Will be 165 lakhs. Now what they are saying, guys, patiently listen, patiently listen, year one, two, three, four. Opening stock, closing stock. Raw material consumed, that is only my cost required to calculate my cash flows every year cash flow. Look at this here, they are talking about uh, the stocks. What they are saying, Initial stock of material that is at the beginning T0 itself, T0 itself. This is T1, year one's opening stock. Generally, this is nothing but T0, correct or not? Today itself, I need to have a stock of how much? 60 lakh rupees. Guys, please understand this. I need to bring in stock worth the 60 lakh rupees, correct? But during the year, I will be purchasing and I will be utilizing 90 lakhs. Don't worry. But I should definitely have my stock policy stays. I need to have an opening stock of 60 at the beginning. And look at this. The stock levels to be maintained at the end of year 1, 2, 3 will be 165. Now, my closing stock should be 165. 
correct guys correct yes now now my closing stock should be 165 yes or no yes or no now i have already brought in stocks to worth 60 rupees correct now extra how much i should bring to maintain 165 rupees of closing stock i should bring in 105 lakhs at the end of year one why because they have given that the company's stock policy is such that they need to maintain a stock of one uh sorry this is what 165 right so 105 so they they should maintain an overall stock of 165 at the end of year one or can we put it like this can we put it like this so what they have mentioned so what they have mentioned here guys a very interesting adjustment in my opinion this is a very very good adjustment and this is a likely exam question so please focus on this this is the certain type of question that can be tested for your exam so look at this year zero year one year two year three year four correct what are they saying about the stock policy what are they what are they saying about the stock policy now at present you should bring in 60 lakh rupees worth of stock correct now at the end of year one year two and year three the closing stock should be 165 165 165 respectively this is what they had mentioned at the end of year one two three the stocks will be 165 and stocks at the end of year four will be nil at the end of year four it will be zero now now what they are saying so year zero that is at the beginning itself you bring in 60 lakhs correct so at the end of year one at the end of year one how much you should bring to make the stock 165 you should bring how much 105 lakhs extra rupees correct or not yes 60 plus 105 now you have a stock closing stock of 165 yes now now you already have a stock of 165 at the year two you should bring anything no i did not bring anything why i already have 165 the closing stock will be 165 at the year end three should i bring in anything no it is already 165 i have already introduced 165 rupees worth of stock yes at the end of year four what happens remember working capital is a cycle amount that got invested initially will come back it will get released at the end of the life of the project or in other words in other words here it is an investment here it is an investment i need to bring this working capital at the end of year four this amount of 165 lakhs will be released from my system how is that it will be released at the end of all my at the end of the project what i do whatever stuff i have i will just sell it off and i will realize cash correct guys yes so i invested money to have these stocks and at the end of the period i just sold these stock and realized money so initially when i brought in these stock it was a cash outflow and when i'm just selling it off and realizing money it is a cash inflow yes or no always remember always remember till now what we have done the only investments the cash outflow that we have seen is our capital investment remember that there can also be working capital investments in the working business cycle are you clear with this in the life of the project apart from my capital expenditure investments there can also be working capital investments the only difference between the two is working capital investments will actually be an outflow initially and it will be an inflow at the end of the project so so if i am an examiner i wouldn't have given this words and the stock at the end of okay so i would have given this stock at the end of year four would be nil yes i need not have given this out at all why because at the end of the project the project life is over now what are you going to do with the stocks you will sell it off and realize money are you clear with this so even if this is not given you should know that you should know that at the end of the life of the project what happens is the entire value of your working capital gets released from the system are you clear with this gets released from your cycle gets released from your project are you clear with this so with respect to with respect to working capital inventory i will say a t0 outflow 60 lakhs T1 end of year 1 105 lakh 2 3 nil nil no cash outflows at the end of year 4 I get a positive 165 lakh rupees are you clear with this this is not a cost because material related cost is already taken into account here so then this 90 120 255 250 and all what is this sir apart from the stocks they themselves have given they have not given material purchased they have given material consumed so basically they have purchased and consumed 90 in year 1 120 in year 2, 255 in year 3, and 255 in year 4. Purchase consume, purchase consume. That has been done parallelly. Apart from that, they are maintaining the stocks. Are you clear with this? That is the understanding that you need to make. Are you clear with this then? 
the storage of material will utilize the space which would otherwise be rented out for 30 lakh rupees per annum. The second one. What they are saying, suppose, suppose I am using, I am going to, I wish to process this waste and convert it into a marketable product. What I am doing is, look, if I am not converting this waste and all into a marketable product, then this place would have been empty, correct? And I could have rented it out and generated 30 lakh rupees per annum of what rent receipts. But because now I am going to, now I am going to use this place for keeping my equipments and convert the waste into a marketable product, I will lose this 30 lakh rupees of rental value, correct or not? So in other words, for the purpose of my decision making, is this 30 lakhs relevant? Yes. This 30 lakhs will be treated as an outflow. So how is it an outflow? Basically, sacrifice of inflow is nothing but an outflow only. I would have got this 30 lakhs because I am going for this project. I am losing 30 lakhs. So it's going to be a negative 30 lakhs. Are you clear with this? Then labor cost will include the wages of 40 workers whose transfer to this project will process will reduce the idle time payments of 45 lakhs in year one, 30 lakhs in year two. So what they are saying, there are already some fact, uh, there are already some, uh, uh, there are already some uh, workers, the factory were idle. If not for this project, they would have remained idle and we would have paid some, some money. Fine. But, but since we have this process, we are saving some idle time cost of 45 lakhs in year one, 30 lakhs in year two. Basically, these are cash inflows. That is, I am able to save 45 lakhs in year one and 30 lakhs in year four. Or in other words, reduction of cash flow is same as what? Your increase in cash inflow, correct? Reduction of outflow is equal to your increase in increase in your inflow. Yes or no? This is a reduction of outflow or I can even say that this is my cash inflow. It's a positive for me. Next. Factory overheads include apportionment of general factory overheads except to the ex, uh, extent of insurance charges of 90 lakhs rupees per year payable on this venture. Now, what is the meaning of this? This is another point where students make mistake. Factory overheads includes apportionment of general factory overheads. What do you mean by apportionment? This is actually a costing area wherein, see, factory overheads, what we do, in this factory, there will be so many projects, project 1, project 2, project 3, 4 and so on. Right? There is a common area and for this common area, there is a cost incurred. What they do is this common cost, they will apportion it between the projects and say these projects, I'm giving a share of so much amount of the common cost. Now you tell me whether I run this particular project or not, I cannot save this common cost, correct or not. That is what they are saying here. Factory overheads, these figures 165, 180, 330 and 435 and all. This is share of a common cost that is being given to this project. Now you tell me whether I run this project or not. Can I save this factory overheads? No, but they are saying out of these figures that they have given, what is relevant to this project is only to the extent of 90 lakhs. Factory overheads includes apportionment of general factory overheads. It is only general except to the extent of insurance charges of 90 lakhs payable on this venture. Or in other words, this factory overage, all these figures you can just ignore. Why? These figures are directly coming from my apportionment. That is, whether or not I have this project, anyways, it will continue, be, continue to be there. The only factory overage relevant is 90 lakhs every year. Why? Because that is only dependent on the decision of this project. Suppose if I don't have this project, this 90 lakhs alone I can save. If I don't have this project, I will continue to be incurring all this extra cost. Are you clear? So they are saying this 165 includes 90. So technically 90 rupees is the relevant cost for this concept, uh, for this project. The extra 75 is nothing but a share of common, common factory cost that is getting apportioned to this particular project. Are you clear with this? So all the common costs you can, you need not consider, you ignore it. You take up only the, you take up only the relevant cost that impacts your project. Consider the cost of capital at the rate of 14 percentage. So they have mentioned the discount rate, right? The present value factors are given for four years. So they have given the present value table. Advise the management on the desirability of installing the machine for processing the waste. All the calculations should form part of your answer. So now pause this video, read the entire question and then digest the facts. Now let's get quickly, let's get into the solution of this particular question. So now first, let us calculate the statement of operating profit from processing the waste. Now, if I decided to process the waste, what will be the operating profit, year-wise operating profit? Now, year-wise, the sales figures are given. 966, 966, 1254, 1254, correct? So, copy-paste the figure. 
these figures are given correct so this is your sales revenue that you will be making then minus material consumption cost how much is this this figure is also given so this figure is given this is also given as how much 90 120 255 255 correct guys 90 120 255 255 yes wages year wise wage cost is given 225 225 255 300 yes now wait wait there is an adjustment in this wages look at this the labor cost includes the wages of 40 workers whose transfer to this process will reduce the idle time payments of 45 lakhs and and in year one and 30 lakhs in year two so year one's labor cost will be 225 minus 45 savings the net amount will be how much 180 only are you clear with this 180 in year two how much will it be year two's labor cost will be 225 rupees minus 30 how much is that 195 rupees this is going to be 195 year two and year three there are no uh, 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 idle cost savings and all so whatever is the data given you can use it are you clear with this so this is nothing but given data minus savings in idle time cost are you clear with this savings in idle time cost are you clear with this yes other expenses data is given as such 120 135 162 210 so you can just plug these figures this data is also given in the question then factory overheads very very important put an important symbol here what is the relevant factory overheads out of whatever is a figure they have given the only figure that is avoidable because of this decision is how much the insurance expense only are you clear with this you should only consider we are not calculating profits for reporting purposes we are calculating the profits that are relevant for the decision making remember that so 90 90 90 and 19 respectively here we are not preparing the financial statements and reporting the exact profits for that you will consider everything we are talking about decision making if i take the decision of running this machine running this machine and processing the waste the only extra cost that i will be incurring because of my decision is the insurance cost because all the other costs are general expenses being apportioned to this project that's all it cannot be saved just because of this particular decision that is the meaning one more thing is that one more thing is that what is this loss of rent on storage clear opportunity cost what is this because i am going for this decision now in this place i will be placing all my equipments and i will be doing the process had i not had i not taken this decision then this place would have been empty which i could have rented out for 30 lakhs per annum so now i'm going to lose that 30 lakhs per annum so this is also my cash outflow correct so 30 lakhs is also considered look at this guys so this is the sales revenue right here we are computing all the costs here correct and we are totaling it here are you clear with this so the costs are being totaled here so don't worry about this so this is also a cost every year i lose how much 30 lakhs so losing money losing money or reduction in cash inflow is treated as a cash outflow correct then depreciation as per income tax rules 150 114 84 and 63 this data is given in the question clear with this guys yes now what is the total cost you have the figures you add it up you add up all the costs you get the respective figures so what is the profit what is the profit that i generate because of this particular decision if i use this factory facility for processing the waste and converting it into a marketable product the extra profit that i will be getting is sales minus total cost so it is 306 8282 uh, 378 and 306 are you clear with this less tax at the rate of 30 percent we have got the profit after tax of these figures are you clear with this these are some calculation driven thing so just apply this 30 percentage on the respective profit before tax you will arrive at the tax so now your profit before tax minus tax gives you profit after tax wait we have not computed cash flow after tax we have just computed the profit after tax look there is a way in which you can do the sum using something called as incremental cash flow model i will explain that to you clear with this guys yes till now are you able to clear with this that is if i if i go for processing the waste and converting it into a marketable product because of this alone because of my business decision i am generating an extra profit after tax of 214.2 197.4 or uh, 264.6 and 214.2 are you clear with this yes now see what they have done now see what they have done statement of incremental cash flows what do you mean by incremental cash flows extra extra cash flow extra means what you need to compare between two alternatives yes processing processing the waste 
as compared to disposing the waste. So because I'm going to process the waste, how much is the extra cash flows generating at every year as compared to my disposing of decision? So because I'm going to process now overall, what is going to be my incremental cash flows? Cash flows can be cash inflow as well as cash outflow. First, what is the year 0, year 1, 2, 3 and 4? Now, because I am going to process now using a machine, first at the T0 itself, today itself, what is going to be my first cash outflow cost of machine? How much is the value? 600 lakhs. Are you clear with this? Will I be incurring this cost of machine anytime else? No. Nil, nil, nil for the all the remaining years. Then, material stock. This is not a cost. This is a working capital investment. Working capital investment will, means what? It is an outflow initially and it will be an inflow at the end of the life of the project. Sir, what is the calculation? This is what I said. At T0, it's going to be 60 lakhs. T1 is going to be 105 lakhs and, and 3, 2 and 3 is going to be nil and at the end of your port it's going to be 165 lakhs. Are you clear with this guys? So this is a stock policy minus 60 minus 105 and plus 165. Why is this? Initially itself I'm bringing a stock of 60 lakhs. At the end of year 1 I should maintain stock worth 165 lakhs. I have already have a stock of 60. So the difference between that is 165. Now I have made my stock balance as 165. So that stock should only be maintained for the next 2 years and at the end of 4 years the 4th year the entire stock will get released. So this is going to be 165 positive guys get this clarity this is an important thing basically this and your uh, factory overheads these two are very very important adjustments that generally students miss out then 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 now one more thing one more thing is very important now if i want to process this particular waste and convert it into a marketable product now what i need to do is what i also need to pay the compensation for cancelling the contract correct guys how much you need to pay? 90 lakhs at the beginning itself. Correct. They have said if you want to go for this process, what you need to do is currently you have some you have some contractual obligation. So you need to you need to cancel that contract and that contract they have given what? They have given the contract can be terminated upon payment of 90 lakhs. This is what they have given. Correct. What does the contract say? Every year you need to pay 150 lakhs if you are using our services. Correct. Now, if you are going to process and not dispose, you want to terminate the services, they are saying, okay, so since you are terminating our services, pay us a penalty of 90 lakh rupees. It's a compensation. That's all. Every year, you need not pay me 150 lakhs and all. We are not going to provide any service. But but since you have agreed and now you are cancelling the contract, pay us 90 lakh rupees. That's what they are saying. Are you clear with this, guys? Are you clear with this? Yes. So now look at this. Look at this. The compensation for contract is going to be how much? 90 lakhs. But wait, because you are paying this 90 lakhs, from now on, you are going to save 150 lakhs. Yes or no? So contract payment saved initially zero. Every at the end of every year, it's going to be plus 150 lakhs. Are you clear with this, sir? Why are we doing all this? We are comparing. We are comparing how much extra cash flow we are able to generate if we process and not dispose of. So how much extra? How will you compute when you compare the relevant cash flows as compared to the two alternatives of processing and disposal? So if I process, I will be incurring 90 lakhs, which is going to be a negative, but I will be saving 150 lakhs every year. That is going to be a positive. Guys, are you clear with this? Since you are comparing the two cash flows parallelly, it's called as incremental cash flow approach. Then, then. Now, what happens here? What happens here? Every year, every year, you are now, you are now doing what? You are now saving for 150 lakhs, correct? On this 150 lakhs, on this 150 lakhs, till date, this 150 lakhs was a tax deductible expense. Yes or no? This 90 lakhs is not allowed for tax purpose, they told. But this 150 lakhs was a tax deductible expense whenever I was paying. Since I am, I am not paying that 150 lakhs right now, I am saving 150 lakhs, but, but I am losing out on the benefit of 150 tax benefit on this 150 lakhs or in other words on this 150 lakhs i am also losing out the tax benefit till date i was paying 150 lakhs it was an expense for me when this was an expense i was also paying lesser tax now since i am not paying this 150 lakhs as an expense i incremented it and i considered it as a cash inflow Correct. Now, what happens parallelly? Parallelly. Now, the tax benefit on that is also something that I'm losing. So, I need to reduce that. So, that is going to be 45 lakhs every year. That is, what is the percentage of tax? It's 30 percentage on 150 lakhs is going to be 45 lakhs. So, every year I save the contract payment, but I lose the tax benefit. Net of, if you see, technically, the net amount of contract payment saved post tax is only 105. If you want, you can directly put 105 and give the calculation. That is also fine. Yes. So now you tell me, 
what is the incremental profit if i go for this particular project if i go for this particular project every year what is the incremental profit that i earn 306 282 378 and 306 correct you fill these figures here you fill these figures here this figures is nothing but the figure c that we calculated above are you clear with this fine so these are all some relevant cash flows then this c is nothing but the exclusive cash flow that we are able to generate from this processing now this in this 306 or in this particular calculation we have considered depreciation correct guys yes so add back the depreciation so add back the depreciation why because depreciation is not a cash outflow so you add back the depreciation respective years depreciation you add it back correct but you should subtract the tax on profits correct the tax on profits for the respective year 91.8 84.6 113.4 91.8 these four profits you just subtract that is this is this is cash flow this is actually profit before tax and depreciation sorry this is profit before tax correct this is the line item here that we have got profit before tax add back depreciation and reduce your taxes you get what net cash flows after tax you get your net cash flows after tax now now one more thing that we need to consider here is what now at the end of the life of the project what happens is we are able to sell this machine correct how much you are able to sell this machine for they had given the data what is it that they had given 60 lakhs is the value at which they have sold yes but wait but wait for you to sell this you should incur some dismantling cost of 45 lakhs so 60 minus 45 gives you 15 the net cost is going to be how much only so the net uh, cash inflow is only going to be 15 lakhs are you clear with this so here here we will say the profit on sale technically it should not be called as a profit i would say net proceeds on sale of machinery but institute has used this language so let's also follow it it's going to be 15 how we got this 15 60 minus 45 are you clear with this so these are the relevant cash flows so the total incremental cash flows after tax year one uh, sorry this is year zero one two three and four so year wise you have the relevant cash flows present value interest factor you can use at whatever is the discount rate mentioned in the question 14 percentage you can just copy paste these discount rate but for the first year zero alone be very careful year zero is already in present value it's in one so the discount rate should start from year one so it's going to be at the rate of 14 percentage you apply this the relevant cash flows multiplied with the present value interest factor gives you what the present value of cash flows so you get the every year's present value of cash flows so your net inflow your present value of inflow minus your present value of outflow gives you the net present value and if you do this in this question you are getting a net present value of positive 528.16 since the npv of the cash flows is 528.6 which is positive the management should go for installing the new machine are you clear with this so what all we did here we considered every single line item yes first we calculated the operating profit generated from processing of waste then we compute the incremental cash flows what do you mean by incremental cash flow because i'm going for processing of this particular processing of this particular um, waste so what happens i need to spend extra on my machine yes it's an outflow correct then there is some working capital changes and all yes i need to introduce some working capital amount which gets released at the end of the period compensation for contract payment then what happens i save every year annually i save some annual uh, contract payment but on that i lose out on the tax benefit that needs to be considered the incremental profit i have by comparing the two but plus plus extra incremental profit how much i generate year wise we have the figure add back the depreciation less your taxes you get you get your what and of course finally you get your uh, you should add your residual value also the net sale proceeds by sale of machinery all these the relevant cash flows you get your incremental cash flows after tax and multiplied with the rest and present relevant present value interest factors you get the present value cash flows and you sum total all the present value cash flows you get your npv and since your npv is positive you can go for this particular project are you clear with this look at the notes that they have given material stock increases are taken in cash flow this is what i explained idle time wages have also been considered this is also explained apportioned factory overheads are not relevant 
and only the insurance charges of this project are relevant. This has also been explained. Sale of machinery, net income after deducting removal expenses are taken and tax on capital gains has been ignored. This has also been considered. And then savings in contract payment and income tax thereon is considered in the cash flows. So all these are notes that they have given. This is a study material sum and I'm expecting this kind of question in exams. Please guys, please follow this question. And I would suggest, I would suggest just mark this question as important category question because, because see, this could be a full fledged 10 mark question. And in case they are testing you on this particular area, it's a beautiful question. Now you tell me guys in this question, is that anything new that I taught apart from the working capital? I accept because working capital is separate that we are going to see next. Apart from that, is that anything new that I have taught you? Everything else was something that we've already seen. The problem was only interpreting the question and applying it accordingly. That was the only problem. I understand. So if you patiently read the question, you will be able to understand this and do this question by yourself. The decision is what? Whether to process and sell the waste or is it better to dispose of? I, we found out the incremental cash flows. And since the incremental NPV was positive, we said go ahead with uh, processing the waste and selling it in case in case the incremental NPV came out to be negative we will say no no then you better continue with disposing of itself this is not a viable project are you able to understand this investment decision where I should invest my funds whether it's worthwhile investing these funds in a machinery and converting my waste into a marketable product and selling or disposing of my waste itself as such so this is an investment decision that we are doing on the asset side should I make this investment? Is it worthwhile making the investment on my equipment or machinery or not? Are you clear with this? And that's about the sum. Please mark this as important. Are you clear with this? So now let's quickly go to the next question. The next question is equally important, guys. Next question is equally important. So please mark this sum also as important because in marathon, I'm covering the typical examination related problems as well. So study case study questions. Uh, this is about capital replay budgeting in replacement nation. So what it is, we will see. HMR Limited is considering replacing a manually operated old machine with a fully automatic new machine, right? So currently what they have, some old machine they have, which is manually operated. They want to purchase what? Fully automatic new machines. The old machine has been fully depreciated for tax purpose, but has a book value of 240,000 on 31st of March, 2021, right? This is given. The machine has begun causing problems with breakdowns and it cannot fetch more than 30,000 rupees if it is sold in the market at present. So today, if I want to dispose of the old machine, I will not get beyond 30,000 rupees. That's what they are saying. It will have no realizable value after 10 years. Suppose I am not one. I don't want to dispose of some emotional reason. I want to continue using this old machine for 10 years. At the end of 10 years, it will not even have this 30,000 rupees of value. It will have zero value only, right? The company has been offered rupees 1 lakh for uh, the old machine as a trade-in on a new machine, which has a price before allowance of trade-in of 4 lakh 50,000, what they are saying. Now, let's say you're going to, let's say you're going to a big uh, company, right? Let's say you're going to purchase a new machinery. Now, what these guys are saying is, look, look, we are allowing you for an exchange offer. Now, you exchange now you would have seen in your mobile phones, correct? If you want to buy a new mobile phone, in this example, if you want to buy a new machinery, it will cost how much? 4.5 lakhs. But, but if you are willing to exchange your old machinery, we will take that old machinery for 1 lakh rupees. It is enough if you pay me 3.5 lakh rupees. This is the meaning of this. Are you clear with this? Fine, fine. So technically, if you sell this machinery, let's say you have an old phone. Correct. In this example, I'm just taking, if you sell that old phone in OLX or open market, second hand market, you will get only 30,000 rupees. Correct. But if you exchange it with Flipkart for a new phone, they are ready to actually exchange it by paying you 1 lakh rupees. Are you clear? This is the meaning. This is the context that is given in the question, right? Technically in Flipkart and all, it works other way around. If you sell it in the second hand market, you get more money while Flipkart doesn't pay much for all these exchanges. But anyways, anyways, right? Coming back to the discussion. The expected life of the new machine is 10 years and the salvage value is 35,000. The new machine, if you purchase it today, 4.5 lakhs minus 1 lakh net investment is 3.5 lakhs that you need to pay. But wait, you can use it for 10 years and then at the end of 10th year, what will happen? 35,000 rupees salvage value, salvage value also you have. Further, the company follows straight line method of depreciation, but, but, but 
for income tax purpose, return down value of method of depreciation at the rate of 7.5 percentage is allowed. Taking that, this is the only machine in the block of assets. So, for books, for the purpose of accounts, they have taken into account SLM, whereas income tax, what is allowed is WDV. So, what we now need to do, we need to reverse this SLM, compute WDV method of depreciation. Based on that, you need to compute the tax and once again add back the depreciation. This is what we need to do. Given below are the expected sales and costs from both old and new machine. Now, old and new machine using the old machine or the new machine for the next 10 years every year i can generate 8 lakh 10 thousand rupees of sales whether i use old or new that is not a problem the problem comes on the cost side look at this if i use the old machine material cost is 1 lakh 80 whereas if i use the new machine the material cost is only 1 lakh 26 to 50. why because the new machine is more efficient correct so it requires a lesser consumption there is lesser uh, wastage in my new machine next labor cost 135 in old machine new machine only 110 why because this is a this is actually um, this is your manual machine whereas new machine is only automated so lesser uh, wastage cost uh, lesser uh, labor cost then variable overage is also lesser uh, the variable overage is 56 to 50 for old machine whereas just 47500 for the new machine these are the required data given and of course fixed overage respective figures depreciation respective figures profit before tax is given tax has been given and then your profit after tax for each of the two alternatives have been given now, from the above information, analyze whether the old machine should be replaced or not if the required rate of return is 10 percentage. What do you mean by required rate of return? Your KO, the weighted average cost of capital. Ignore the capital gains tax. So, basically what they are saying, look, currently we have a machine, old machine we have and this machine, it doesn't have, um, we have already, it, it is already there in our books, correct? Today, should I pay anything to buy it? No, no, I already have it. Are you clear with this? Yes. So if I continue with this for the next 10 years, yes. So this is the sales and cost data given in the question. No, no, no. If I purchase a new machine, what happens? The initial cash outflow and, and year-wise sales and cost is given. Apart from that, you also have something called as a salvage value for the new machine. Then depreciation is also given. The question is, should the old machine be continued or you should replace the old machine with a new machine? That is why we call it as replacement decision. Are you clear with this? Very simple, guys. Pause this video for a while. Just go through the facts of the question and then let's get started with the discussion. Now, 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 look at this. Workings. The first one is calculation for the base for depreciation or the cost of the new machine. New machine, what is the purchase price? 4,50,000. But wait, if I am buying the new machine, obviously I will discard my old machine, correct? So I can exchange it with him. He is ready to take it for 1 lakh rupees. So my net cost, if I buy the new machine, is only going to be 3,50,000. So at the beginning of T0, if I am going for the new machine, I need to shell out extra cash of how much? 3,50,000, right? Now, look at this, look at this. Profit before tax as per books. Profit before tax as per books. Now, look at this. Old machine, new machine, difference. Three columns we are having. Now, profit before tax as per books. Where is the da uh, data given? So, they have given profit before tax, 324,750, 387,250. Yes, guys. Yes, guys. So, 324,750, 387,250. So, the difference between the profit before tax is how much? 62,500. Or in other words, if I go for this new machine, the extra profit before tax that I will be getting every year is how much? 62,500 rupees. Correct? Add back depreciation as per books. This depreciation, we don't need it. Why? Because it is under SLM method. Depreciation as per books. So, 24,000 and 41,500 add back these depreciation. So, 24,000, 41,500, you add it back. You add it back. You get how much? 17,500 is the difference. Then profit before depreciation and tax. So, if you add it back. So, old machine gives you a profit before depreciation and tax. How much is this? 3,48,750. New machine gives how much? 2,48,750. Uh, uh, so the overall extra profit before uh, tax and depreciation, if you use the new machine, will be how much? 80,000 rupees. Remember, if I use the new machine, 
the extra profit it generates before considering my income tax and depreciation is going to be 80,000. This is the meaning. Are you clear with this? Or in other words, every year, every year, I will be able to generate 80,000 rupees of extra profit without considering my income tax and depreciation. Guys, are you clear with this? This is not cash flow. This is just a profit. So we need to compute the incremental cash flows right now. Since we are comparing the two, since we are comparing two alternatives, we can directly compute the incremental cash flows. Are you clear with this? Calculation of incremental NPV. Now, what is the life of this particular asset? 10 years, correct? So, 1 to 10, year-wise, you put this data. The present value interest factor for 10 years, this comes in the first column. Are you clear with this? Now, every year, the starting point is what? Every year, what is the incremental profit before tax and depreciation what is the extra what is the extra profit before tax and depreciation that i will be earning if i go for the new machine as compared to the old machine 80000 rupees every year i will be earning extra yes or no now this earnings uh, this profit is what before tax before depreciation in this method some slm method of depreciation was given we added it back so this is actually profit extra profit before tax and depreciation are you clear with this so now now we need to reduce the depreciation but this depreciation should be as per what method as per wdv method yes or no now 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 guys one minute now you tell me now you tell me they have given it very clearly in the question they have given it very clearly in the question. Look at this. So somewhere they had given that this, uh, yes, yes, yes. Look at this. The old machine, the old machine has been fully depreciated for the tax purpose, which means from the perspective of income tax, if you are going, if you are continuing with the old mission, will you have any depreciation? No. If there is no depreciation, will you have any tax savings on depreciation? No. That is, that is, this asset, old asset got fully depreciated from the viewpoint of income tax. So, there is no, there is no tax shield or there is no depreciation if you go for the, continue with the old mission. If you go with the new mission, what they are saying, they are willing to provide you 7.5 percentage under WDV method. WDV means what? return down value method so which means every year the extra depreciation will be only coming out of the new machine are you clear with this or in other words if i go for this new machinery whatever is the depreciation on the new machinery that itself is the incremental depreciation so this incremental depreciation means what see this is the incremental profit that i will be generating if i go for the new machine as compared to the old machine correct yes this should also be incremental depreciation if I go for the new mission as compared to the old mission, correct. Now, old mission, what will be the depreciation if I am continuing for the next 10 years? Zero, correct. So, what will be the depreciation for the new mission? 7 percentage per, 7.5 percentage per annum for what? For um, uh, on WDV method, correct or not? So, technically, the extra depreciation that will be happening that I will be incurring every year because of this decision will actually be nothing but your WD 7.5% on WDB minus zero. Why minus zero? Because under the old mission, it's fully depreciated, no depreciation at all. So basically, the extra depreciation that I need to compute is nothing but the depreciation on the new machine. But remember, this depreciation on the new machine should be under WDV method. So now, how will you compute this? Guys, in this question, in study material, they have not given you, they have not given you the manner. I mean, they have not come given you the working note for calculating this depreciation. So quickly, I will just take an Excel file and I will just compute it. I will just show you how to do this. So now, right? So now you tell me, what is the what is the value of this particular mission? So we are just going to compute what we are just going to compute the uh, depreciation. We are just going to compute the depreciation under WDV method. So we are just going to compute the uh, depreciation under WDV method. So now, now look at this. Look at this. So now let's take this as the opening balance. This is depreciation at the rate of seven point five percentage on opening balance. Correct. So, this is going to be your closing balance. Yes. Fine. Are you clear with this? Yes. So, now 
your one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Next ten years, you've got yes. So the next ten years, opening balance. What is the base on which depreciation is calculated? We calculated three lakh fifty thousand rupees. Correct, guys. Yes. So depreciation for the first year is going to be what equal to seven point five percent into the opening balance. Correct, guys. It's going to be how much? Twenty six thousand and two fifty. Yes or no? It's going to be twenty six thousand two fifty. Right? Fine. So now it's going to be twenty six thousand and two fifty. Now just a minute. So I'm putting all these things in figures. Right. So now what is going to be your closing balance? That is your closing WDV. So I will put this as opening WDV and I will put this as closing WDV, right? Okay, so now look at this. What is going to be your closing WDV? Opening WDV minus depreciation for the year. This is going to be your closing WDV. Guys, yes or no? Then, then the second years, in the second year, what will be your opening WDV? It is going to be the closing WDV of the previous year. Yes, guys, correct. And what is going to be the depreciation for year two? It is nothing but it is nothing but seven point five percentage of the second year's opening WDV. Yes, guys. Yes. So, what is going to be the closing WDV for year two? It's going to be opening WDV minus the depreciation uh, on the opening WDV. That is opening WDV minus depreciation. So here you have what F four minus G four. That is this seven lakh thirty two uh, seven twenty three seven fifty minus twenty four eight twenty one point two five. This is going to be a closing WDV. So this calculation you need to do for how much ten years. Now in Excel, if you do automatically, you can just get these figures. So, but in exam, you don't have this luxury. What you need to do every year, you need to compute the WDV. So the WDV is going to be this. The WDV year-wise WDV is going to be twenty six two fifty twenty four eight hundred and twenty four two eighty one point two five twenty two thousand four hundred and sixty point one six and so on. This is exactly what they have done here in this question. Look at this twenty six thousand two fifty. Correct. Then. Twenty-four thousand two eighty-one point two five. Twenty-four two eighty-one point two five. Directly go to seventh year. See sixteen thousand four forty-two point nine five. See sixteen thousand four forty-two point nine five. Can I see this figures last year? Thirteen thousand zero one three point eight two. Thirteen thousand zero one three point eight two. Ideally, ideally speaking, if you ask me, this should come by way of a working note. This should ideally come by way of a working note. In my opinion, this should come by way of a working note. In exam, you don't have all the facility of using spreadsheets. This is a calculation that you need to do. Simple accounts calculation. Your WDV calculation is something that you need to do. Are you clear with this? So now, now, what is it that we have calculated till now? Extra. Profit before tax and depreciation. Now we have calculated the extra depreciation that I will be incurring every year because of what? Because of because of because of depreciation. Correct? Yes. I mean because of uh, going for the new machine. Now what is the profit before tax? Profit before tax. That is the incremental profit before tax. That is that is profit before tax and depreciation minus depreciation. This is the incremental profit before tax. Or in other words, in other words, year wise we are computing how much extra profit before tax we are able to generate if you are going for the if you are going for the new machine as compared to the old machine. Are you clear with this? On this only we are computing the tax. This is nothing but the tax payable on that extra profit generated. Every year, so this is nothing but column number four into thirty percentage tax. Are you clear with this? So, what is going to be my incremental cash flows after tax? What is going to be my incremental cash flows after tax? Be very very clear about this. Profit before tax, profit before tax minus tax minus tax. Add back depreciation. Are you clear with this? This is the extra profit before tax I generate every year. Minus extra tax I pay on this extra profit. Add back the extra depreciation that was reduced to arrive at this PVT because it's actually not a cash expense. Are you clear with this? So profit before tax column number four, column number four minus tax, which is column number five, plus the incremental depreciation column number three. You get the incremental cash flows after tax. Are you clear with this? So this is ideally the extra cash flow after tax that I am generating because I am going for the new machinery. Are you clear with this? So multiply the respective cash flows with your present value interest factor table. You will get the present value of cash flows. The present value of all the cash inflows. You will get how much? Three lakh eighty one thousand one hundred two point four four. Correct. 
wait 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 at the end of at the end of the life of the asset what happens you also have salvage value remember the salvage value is there only for only for new machine so in old machine there is no salvage value so technically this is 35000 minus 0 correct if i'm going for the new machine i get 35000 old machine does not have any salvage value so what is the extra salvage value that i get 35000 into 0.368 what is this 0.368 that is a discount factor for the 10th year so this is also what a cash inflow for me so the present value total present value of incremental cash inflows is 3,94,612.44 minus the cost of machine today how much extra i have to incur 3,50,000 this 3 lakh 50,000 is nothing but 4.5 lakhs minus 1 lakhs, correct? Minus 1 lakh, 3.5 lakh. So, incremental net present value is going to be 44,612.44. Or in other words, if I opt and go for this new machine, if I replace my old machine with my new machine, the incremental net present value I get is 44,612 rupees 0.44. So, since the incremental NPV is positive, the old machine should be replaced. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? That's an alternative way of doing. You compute the NPV for new machine, then separately compute the NPV for old machine. And obviously, the NPV of new machine will be more than the NPV of old machine. NPV of new minus NPV of old, the difference will exactly be 44,612.44. And you can say, since the NPV of new machine is more than the old machine, you can go for it. That way you can do, but this incremental cash flows is what Institute expects you to do because this solution, I'm discussing it as such given in your Institute study material. So this is very, very important. Are you clear with this? Guys, this is again a very important question. Please go through it once. Solve this question by yourself. Solve this question by yourself. And with this, we have covered this entire chapter of capital budgeting. So basically, this sum, the four, uh, fifth and sixth sum are very important sums. Please mark them as important. Even, even the fourth sum that I did was very important because it had all the time value of money techniques. I'm sorry, all the um, capital budgeting techniques were there in this particular question. This is also a very good sum. So please mark these sums are important. It's, it's very, very important. Fine. So basically, this chapter is all about how am I going to invest? Where am I going to invest, invest the funds that I have raised from different sources of finance? Where I should invest? So how will you how will you find out? How will you take this investment decisions? How will you take using multiple techniques? Using multiple techniques, these techniques could be what? These techniques could be time value. Uh, these techniques could be traditional techniques or it could be time adjusted techniques, traditional techniques, payback period. What do you mean by payback period? Payback period means the time taken for me to recover back my initial investment without considering time value of money. Accounting rate of return, average profits divided by investment. The denominator investment can either be an initial investment or an average investment. NPV, profitability index, IRR, we have, saw it, we have seen it. NPV is nothing but present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow. So if the NPV is positive, go for the project, else don't go for it. Profitability index is present value of cash inflow upon present value of cash outflow. If the profitability index is one or more, then you can go for it. IRR is the rate that makes my NPV equal to zero. What is the decision criteria? If your IRR is greater than, if your IRR is greater than your weighted average cost of capital, then you can go for this particular project. And discounted payback period, what is it? It's the same as payback period, but here the cash inflows are discounted using your weighted average cost of capital. So the time it takes for me to recover my discounted cash flows is called as the discounted payback period. And MIRR is a rarely tested area which is a detailed discussion by itself there are some limitations of irr that gets uh, that gets actually uh, compensated by this concept of mir since it's rarely tested i just focused more on this predominant portion of this chapter and the important facts of this particular chapter lies in this area especially the heart of this chapter is going to be your npv profitability index irr basically your npv irr this is the area where it's going to be important are you clear with this so basically i've also given this uh, one page summary one page summary i have just given it here it's i've just taken it from your study material so non-discounted method payback correct so when the uh, for independent projects or mutually exclusive project independent projects means what a b c let's say there are three projects you can choose a b and c or one or more than one project can be chosen at a time in that case what you will do when payback period is less than or equal to the maximum payback period you accept it now generally i can accept if the payback period is only two years correct i want to require my money in two years so lesser the payback period lesser the payback period it is better are you clear with this mutually exclusive means what a b c are three projects out of these projects you are allowed to select only one 
So the project with the least payback period, you should select accounting rate of return. You should choose the project with the maximum accounting rate of return. NPV, what do we do? If it is greater than zero, we accept it. If it is less than zero, we reject it in case of independent projects. In case of in case of mutually exclusive projects, that is competition is there. What you do? You choose that project with the highest positive NPV. Then profitability index greater than one, accept less than one, reject. Or if it is a competing project, mutually exclusive project, choose the one that has the highest profitability index. IRR, what do you do? IRR is greater than K. K means what? Weighted average cost of capital accepted. If it is less than K, rejected. Then the project, with, in case of mutually exclusive projects, compare the IRR of multiple projects and choose the one with the maximum IRR. Are you clear with this? With this, we have revised this entire chapter thoroughly. So now let's move to the next chapter. So now let's get started with the revision of the fifth chapter which is working capital management of working capital now what is this chapter all about so as usual let us first bring the context and let us see why we are studying this chapter and then we will proceed into the technicalities of this particular chapter now as we all know as we all know our subject financial management has broadly three objectives. So what are the three objectives that our subject financial management has? Yes, the first one is financing decisions, that is taking decisions with respect to raising of funds, raising of capital. Then you have investment decisions, that is taking decisions regarding where these funds need to be invested, right? And then finally you have dividend decisions, right? Now, we saw some chapters in financing decisions, like your cost of capital, leverages, and uh, your capital structure decisions then investment decisions we saw the capital budgeting chapter yes now in dividend decisions there's a separate chapter called dividend decisions now this chapter working capital management working capital management now where does this chapter fit into or in other words this chapter fits into which of the three objectives now strictly speaking this working capital management is actually something separate by itself is something separate by itself or if you want to plug it under any of these three objectives the most the most relatable objective under which you can classify the working capital management is your investment decisions i will just tell you what it is and all i will tell you what it is you need not have to worry but this can also be classified under financing decisions but that is the reason why i'm saying i don't want to bring it under any classification this working capital management you treat it as a separate animal as such it is a separate study as such called as working capital management are you clear with this i will just go about the introduction i will tell you what is working capital why we are studying all these things and of course there are a few concepts that we have studied in costing that needs to be related while studying this particular chapter are you clear with this so for the time being you just understand this is a separate study under financial management by itself so don't try to plug it under any of the three objectives because in this chapter you have both the financing decisions as well as the investment decisions how it is i will tell you as we proceed into this particular chapter so now what do you mean by working capital what do you mean by working capital working capital means current assets minus current liabilities this is something that you have already studied this is something that you would have already studied even right from your school days your 11th and 12th wherever right from your commerce in your uh, in your accounts you would have studied all these formulas working capital refers to current assets minus current liabilities all these things are fine but now we are going to look at this logically we are going to understand what exactly do you mean by working capital and all clear with this now 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 what has happened the company has chosen the sources of finance correct let's again drop the balance sheet of the company there are multiple sources of finance like equity share capital your retained earnings preference share capital your debentures right there are multiple sources of finance so the company has designed the optimum capital structure they have decided which from which source of finance how much should be the amount raised financing decisions is over now once this is over they have also purchased all their fixed assets that is they have taken the capital budgeting decisions investment decisions the company has purchased a nice big factory inside that all sophisticated machines are all there everything is set right now 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 the company has 
raised money and they have also purchased whatever they want all the fixed assets the equipments and all have been purchased now can i start the business today itself right from this second can i start the business i have everything with me no i have all my i have all my uh, factories i have my in, uh, inside the factory i have all my sophisticated machinery equipments i have everything right so can i immediately start my business let us say i am a pen manufacturer fine i have everything right now can i start my business no why because because for you to start your business yes you have all the facility all the facility is there with you yes no doubt but but to start your business you need to first purchase some raw materials correct then then you need to actually function start the factory correct and you need to put your workers to actually convert this raw material into a finished goods for this conversion you also need some electricity power and all are you clear with this there are so many things that are required for my day to day running of business yes so technically speaking technically speaking my fixed assets are not the only investment that goes into the business there is also something that i actually need to run my day to day operations and that is called as working capital that is called as working capital so what is it what is it can you explain it now let us just take an example let us just take an example why do we need working capital let us just take an example now now i have all these things set long term sources of finance i have raised yes and then all my i have purchased machineries equipments and everything is set now i need to start my business let us say i get my first order let's say i am getting my first order from a big client okay i am a pen manufacturer i am getting an order from a big client now now what happens is now this company is saying for me to get this order this company is saying this company my client they want to know whether i have the capacity to fulfill my honor that is uh, they i have the capacity to fulfill my commitment that is i have the capacity to fulfill the order so what they are saying is look you should readily have 3 months of your raw material stock whatever is a raw material stock that you generally have it should be held with you for a period of 3 months only if you hold your raw material for 3 months i will be ready to accept your order or in other words i will be ready to give you this particular order so now what they are saying is first what the company does or the company does so first they introduce cash into the business so i am the pen manufacturer i bring in cash correct now using this cash what i do i purchase raw material right i purchase raw material now what happens the raw material i need to keep it in my stores in my godown for 3 months let us say that is the precondition of this order generally i maintain 3 months of stock in my godown clear now now after this this raw material needs to be converted into wip correct so let us say for a period of 3 months the raw material stays in my godo after that after that i will issue this raw material into my factory shop that is the production will start let us assume the production will take 1 month okay let us assume for the raw material to get converted into an fg that is in wip stage the uh, raw uh, Oh, the entire process will take about one month yes or no now now after this immediately will i be getting the cash no this wip will be converted into what this wip will be converted into an fg correct this wip will be converted into an fg now let us say in this fg in this fg let us say generally generally the company holds this for let us assume one and a half months so the moment i manufacture the moment i convert my raw material into fg will i immediately able to sell it no let us say that it needs to stay in my warehouse for a period of one and a half months then what happens then what happens after this fg after this fg is actually present now what i will do i will sell the fg now if i sell the fg will i to get the cash today itself no what will happen this my customer will was ask for some credit period so there will be debtors there will be debtors now this guy says no i want 2 months time to actually pay you the money so after this 2 months only i will be getting my cash back 
correct or not or in other words first if i introduce cash into my business yes i need to purchase raw material and the raw material stock will remain with me for a period of three months correct then 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 what happens this raw material needs to be converted into an fg and for the conversion it takes one month for me to produce the moment i complete my production i cannot sell it immediately it will be in my the finished goods will be in my warehouse for a period of one and a half months right after that when i am selling i will not be able to get the cash immediately because the debtors are asking me a credit period of two months and after that only after that only i am able to get the cash or in other words if you see here if you see here so if i introduce cash into the business when will i get back this cash it takes three months plus one month plus one and a half month plus two months correct so 3 plus 1, 4 plus 1.5, that's going to be 5.5 plus 2, 7.5. So in this example, just an example. So technically, it takes 7.5 months for me to get back my cash. The time period that I take to actually bring my cash back into my business is called as working capital cycle. It is also known as operating cycle. Are you clear with this? So what is this basically? So now apart from apart from my investment in my all my fixed assets and machinery for me to run my business, I need to introduce cash. Correct. I need to bring in an investment. This investment is for what? This investment is to purchase raw material. And then there are some factors of production, labor, overheads and all I need to incur for the purpose of converting this into the converting raw material into FG. And that FG cannot be sold immediately. It will stay as FG stock for some period. And then it will be converted into a debtors for some period. And after that only, I will get back my cash. This cash includes profit. So what I actually introduce into my working capital cycle will be my investment but finally what i get back will be slightly more than the investment why because debtors is at sales price sales price will include a margin are you clear with this so basically what will happen look this is what happens this is what happens just an example let us say the overall working capital just an example the overall working capital is how much let us say 100 crores the overall 100 uh, uh, working capital is 100 crores now let's say for the cycle to get over after after let us say this working capital cycle of 7.5 months in our example let us say i will get i will get 105 crores this includes profit clear now what will i do can i take back this 105 crores now no the next working capital cycle will continue why I am running a business. I am running a business. So obviously the cycle needs to keep on moving. The moment 7.5 months gets over, the next work, working capital cycle will start. Now, now what I will do in the second cycle, I will invest back 100 crore rupees. Correct? Correct. And then it takes another 7.5 months to come out of this. Correct? So basically out of this working capital, in this working capital cycle, I introduced 100 crores. At the time when I get it back, I will definitely get slightly more than that. So ideally speaking, I can take this 5 crores out of my business and this 100 crores again needs to be reinvested back. And this 5 crores, I can use it, use it to actually finance. I can use it to pay my interest on whatever is the loan that I am borrowing. Let me come to that in a short while from now. So basically, this working capital is a permanent amount that gets blocked into the business and now it gets released after the cycle gets over again it gets reinvested for the next cycle then after that cycle gets over again it gets released then again it should get reinvestment reinvested and the cycle goes on forever now when will the cycle stop sir when the company stops the business when the company stops the business in the last cycle yes after that you need not reinvest it back you can just take back the entire working capital amount this is why let's connect the dots this is why i said in the previous chapter that is in investment decisions i told you your working capital is an outflow initially and at the end of the life of the project, it becomes an inflow. I told you, right? So basically, this 100 crores I'm putting into the business, it's not a cost. 
it's an investment so i need to invest this amount it gets recycled once again once again once again and life just keeps on going are you clear with this so basically i need to introduce this extra 100 crores into my business this 100 crores is my working capital this 100 crores is my working capital are you clear with this are you clear with this now now, I need to bring this 100 crores into my business. Yes, I need to bring this 100 crores. This is over and above my capital investment that the amount that I invested in my plant and machinery, all the equipments and all that. Now, now, and this is a cycle that keeps on going. So the moment I, I actually introduce, I borrow this 100 crores and introduce it into the business, it always remains in the business. Now, I need 100 crores for what? For my working capital, day-to-day -day functioning. Now, how can I get this 100 crores? How can I get this 100 crores? Broadly, there are two ways. Broadly, there are two ways. So working capital investment, how much is the working capital investment amount that I need? 100 crores, correct? How will I finance this working capital? There are broadly two ways. One is you can go to a bank and you can ask them for a loan. Now, remember this one thing very clearly. How much will you ask them for? 100 crores. Now you tell me, now you tell me this 100 crores, this 100 crores, can you repay it after 7.5 months? No, this is a long term loan. Why? So after 7.5 months, in this example, 7.5 months, after this working capital cycle, again, this 100 crores needs to be reinvested into the next cycle and it just keeps on going like that. But, but what happens is every time the cycle gets over, I get an amount that is slightly more than my that is slightly more than my investment using this extra money i can pay them the interest and i can keep on servicing the loan are you clear with this so technically when you are borrowing money when you are funding for working capital that is also a long-term borrowing only are you clear with this guys are you clear with this so when i go for when i go for sources of finance to fund my working capital, remember that working capital is generally a long-term source of financing, right? Now, what is the alternate source? What is the alternate source of what is another source for financing your working capital? This could be, this could be your current liabilities, that is trade creditors or bank OD, etc. Short-term borrowings, short-term borrowings, etc. Sir, what is this? Now, now, you look at this, you look at this, what I said, once I bring in cash into the business, right, I am purchasing the raw material, the raw material stays in my, the raw material stays in my stock, in my stock for a period of three months, correct? So technically, the immediately, once I make the investment in my raw material, I cannot convert it into money, it stays idle for a period of three months. After that, another one month is required for converting it into, uh, into um, FG. Yes, and then 1.5 months it remains in the FG stock, then two more months it takes to actually convert it into my debtors, correct? Now, now, what I can do is, what I can do is, instead of financing this entire amount, I can go to my, but I can go to my supplier. The supplier is what? The supplier of raw material. I can ask him, sir, I am also doing a business, so I am having this cash liquidity and all. I will continue to do business with you only. I will be your customer. You don't worry. I will purchase only from you. But you don't ask me to pay the cash today itself. You give me some credit period. You ask me, you give me some credit period. And you allow me time for payment of this particular raw material. I will not pay you today itself. You just give me two months credit period, sir. So I will pay you after two months. So technically speaking, technically speaking, my funds get blocked into the business for a 7.5 months, no doubt. But, but now in this case, out of the 7.5 months, two months, this stock, this raw material supplier, he is ready to fund you indirectly. Or in other words, he says, he is not funding me by way of paying me cash but he's funding me by supplying the raw material. So he says, I will give you the raw material today. You need not pay me today. You pay it to me after two months. So indirectly, it is also a source of finance only, correct? So technically, my gross, gross working capital cycle is 7.5 months, but out of the 7.5 months, two months, this guy, my supplier is ready to bear the burden. So technically, my net working capital cycle is now reduced to 5.5 months. Or, or in other words, in other words, this is also, 
this creditors trade creditors are also an indirect source of financing are you clear with this so that is the reason that is the reason why working capital is generally called as current assets minus current liabilities current assets we saw here three months for raw material one month for wip 1.5 months for fg all these are inventories two months for debtors correct gross working capital 7.5 months less creditors gives me a credit period of two months so net off if you do overall the net 5.5 months is going to be my working capital cycle so technically the period that i take to convert cash into cash is called as working capital cycle and this is this is partly funded by external sources of finance like bank loan and all that the other one is imbibed in the cycle itself that is by way of trade creditors and short term borrowings are you clear with this so the reason why we call working capital as current assets minus current liabilities is this is the gross amount of investment that is required for my day to day functioning out of this to the extent of current liabilities it is being funded by my suppliers etc are you clear with this so the net funding that i need to bring into my business for the purpose of running my day to day operations is called as working capital are you clear with this so now now working capital two things are there you should find out how much amount you of working capital you need for your business correct then once you find out the amount you should next find out how will you fund this correct so there are two decisions that you need you need to take in this particular chapter the first one is working capital investment how much is the amount of working capital i need for my business that is number one number two yes i know that i need 100 crores now how am i going to fund it that is the second decision that is how am i going to finance this working capital that's why i said this chapter is both financing decisions as well as as well as your uh investment decisions but then the only issue here is the only issue here is we are talking about current assets and current liabilities so it is slightly different it is slightly different from what we saw in our capital budgeting and all are you clear with this yes so now now let us just go to this particular area so management of working capital now in our study material generally this chapter gets tested for 10 marks now this chapter is divided into six units as per our ICA study materials divided into six units introduction to working capital management this is the basic concepts of working capital then then they go on to explain each and every each and every uh, component of working capital so working capital is what current assets minus current liabilities so current assets typically can have what it can have stock correct then it can have debtors then it can have cash correct right then current liabilities can generally have what payables correct or not or creditors yes so each of these components there are some decisions that you need to take that are covered here look at this treasury and cash management management of inventory management of receivables management of payables and finally you have something called as financing of working capital this is technically a theory area clear so overall the scope of this chapter is the first part is about the general study of this chapter then the next five units the next four units are regarding studying certain different components of working capital and the last part is about how am i going to finance so this is basically a theory part so this is going to be the agenda for this particular chapter are you clear with this so working capital is nothing but current assets minus current liabilities so current assets include what inventory inventory means it includes your raw material wip finished goods receivables cash or cash equivalents prepaid expenses and all of that right and then your credit uh, your current liabilities will includes the payable and any kind of outstanding payment that you've got okay so now working capital management on the basis of value gross working capital net working capital gross working capital means what your current assets gross amount is current assets net working capital is current assets minus current liabilities are you clear with this are you clear with this see gross working capital refers to the firm's investment in current assets whereas the net working capital refers to difference between the current assets and current liabilities now on the basis of time on the basis of time working capital can be classified into permanent working capital fluctuating working capital permanent working capital is this amount that i told you this 100 crores at any given point of time i need this 100 crores for my business correct now let us say for one season alone let's say i am a sweet manufacturer during diwali time i have an excess demand for that period alone for my day to day operations since the demand is more 
I need to have more funding. But once the Diwali season gets over, then I can just push it away. I can just remove this investment from my business and take it back. So the short term requirement, suddenly for seasonal extra requirement, if I need, that is called as fluctuating working capital. So permanent working capital means what? The amount of working capital that I need generally at any given point of time for running my daily operations. Whereas fluctuating working capital means the extra working capital that I might need seasonally occasionally in my business are you clear with this yes and a positive working capital indicates the company's ability to pay its short-term liabilities so what do you mean by working capital current assets minus current liabilities so if the current assets is more than your current liabilities it means it means that even in a worst case scenario tomorrow if everything goes wrong you're shutting down your business now if i sell all my current assets that value itself will be sufficient to pay my current liabilities, correct? So it talks about the solvency of the company, short-term solvency of company. Even if something goes wrong, if I sell my current assets, the amount that I'm able to generate from the current asset should be able to recover my current liability. So generally, it is ideal to have a positive working capital. Are you clear with this? Yes. So now, why do we need adequate working capital? Now, what do you mean by the word adequate? Adequate means, adequate means, not high and not less. Remember this. What do you mean by adequate working capital? The working capital that you have in your business, it should not be too high. It should also not be too less. Sir, why sir? A large amount of working capital would mean that the company is having idle funds. Correct? Now, 100 crores I'm saying I need for working capital, for running my business. If you're borrowing 100 crores, now, and you are putting it in your business, this 100 crore rupees is blocked in your business. It is not a cost. It is blocked in your business. This can be released only after you permanently shut down your business, correct? So for this 100 crores, there is a cost that comes along with it. Now, now more, let us say I want to be more uh, cautious and I borrow more and I have more working capital. You tell me the cost that comes for financing this working capital will now increase for me. That is a huge burden. So I should not have high working capital because the funds are blocked into my business. It remains idle. Sir, then if we have less working capital, what will happen? That is also bad. Inadequate working capital. If you have a lesser working capital, what will happen? You will not be able to meet your day-to-day -day commitments. Let us say you are investing lesser amount of money in your purchasing, purchasing your stocks and all that. You get a huge order today. He's saying, I immediately want this particular order. So give it to me because of lesser working capital, you are not able to fulfill that order. So now what happens? You are losing out on your business. So there will be some opportunity losses and all. So this is what it is. The firm runs the risk of insolvency. You will not be able to generate business. Now what happens? Your current assets will not even be sufficient to require your current liability. The paucity of working capital. Paucity means scarcity of working capital may lead to a situation where the firm may not be able to meet its liabilities. It may also mean that the firm may not be holding enough inventory in order to meet the customer's demand and hence would lose the sales and eventually some reputation as well so basically the working capital investment in this company in any company should neither be too high it should it should not be too low why should it not be too high because your investment the working capital investment comes with a cost so it's basically an amount blocked in the business more the amount blocked in the business more will be your finance cost associated with your working capital borrowings Correct. Then what happens if you have lesser working capital, if you have less working capital, you might lose out on your opportunities to run your day-to-day -day operations and it will affect your solvency position. So what is the most important thing here? You need to maintain adequate, means what? The right amount of working capital. Are you clear with this? Now, now determination of working capital. Yes. So this is what it is. Now, what it is, look at this. In the scope of working capital management, now we will be reading something about liquidity and profitability, then investment and financing. Investment and financing, I told you, investment talks about how much amount of working capital I need. Financing talks about where from I am going to get this amount, where from I am going to get this amount, clear? Now what is the issue relating to liquidity and profitability? Liquidity means what? Liquidity means what? Liquidity means having more cash. Having more cash is called as liquidity. Profitability means what? Having more profit. Remember, these two are different things. More cash does not mean more profit. And more profit does not mean more cash. What it is, you will see. 
For uninterrupted and smooth functioning of day-to-day -day business of an entity, it is important to maintain the liquidity of funds evenly. Liquidity means what? You should have the cash in the business. Clear? As we have already learned in the previous chapters, each rupee of capital bears some cost. So while maintaining the liquidity, the cost aspects need to be borne in mind. Also, a higher working capital may be intended to increase the revenue and hence the profitability. If you have a high working capital, what will happen? Now you have more funds, so you can generate more sales. More sales will generate what happens? More profit will be there, correct? But at the same time, unnecessary tying up of funds and idle assets not only reduces the liquidity, but also reduces the opportunity to earn a better return from a productive asset. So what happens right now? This is one side of it, but the other side of it, what happens here is now, now you are tying up more funds in your business because of this, there is some cost associated to this. Clear. Hence, a trade-off is required between liquidity and profitability. Sir, which is good? Liquidity or profitability? No, you cannot say that this is only best. There needs to be a trade-off. Means what? Balancing between the two right more liquidity less profitability that is also bad more profitability less liquidity that is also bad so you need to strike a perfect balance between the two ensure that there is sufficient cash and with this sufficient cash you are also able to generate sufficient profit that's about it are you clear with this this is all about this is all about three e's that is economy in financing efficiency in utilization and effectiveness in achieving the objectives all these are theoretical parts are you clear with this fine now this is what i said investment and financing investment means how much amount is required financing of working capital means where from the amount is required right and estimation of working capital needs i told you this is also called as working capital operating cycle also known as working capital cycle it's also known as cash cycle so generally it is done by way of holding period of assets i told you right so i need i need three months for my raw material stock then my raw material stock remains in uh, my uh, go down for three months and then and then it takes one one month or one and a half months for me to convert it into an fg and all of that we will be seeing a comprehensive numerical sum so don't worry about it now let's get started with this first problem by way of this problem we will learn more about this working capital right so first let's get started with this problem on 1st January, the Managing Director of Naurin Limited wishes to know the amount of working capital that will be required during the year. From the following information, prepare the working capital requirements forecast. So, the Managing Director of a particular company, he wants to know how much is the amount of working capital that in working capital investment that is required for my day-to-day -day running of my business, right? What they are saying. Production during the previous year was 60,000 units. It is planned that this level of activity would be maintained for the present year also. So the upcoming year, I'm going to produce how many units? 60,000 units. The expected ratios of cost to selling prices are given as follows. Raw material is generally 60% of my sales value. Direct wages is generally 10% of my sales value. Overheads is generally 20% of my sales value. So raw material 60 wages 10 and overheads 20 percentage right next raw materials are expected to remain in store for an average of two months before being issued the production so basically they are saying if i purchase a raw material today immediately i will not start converting into an fg it has to wait in the go down for two months it is the company's policy correct then each unit is expected to be in the process for one month the raw material being fed into the pipeline immediately and the labor and overhead cost accruing evenly during the month. What they are saying? So, raw material stock, two months. They are saying WIP, what will happen? It remains in the process. It takes one month for them to convert the RM into WAP. Clear with this? So, then and there, evenly, your raw material will be fed into this particular machinery and evenly the production will happen the labor and overheads will be incurred evenly during the course of this particular month then once the production is completed finished goods will be there now immediately finished goods can it be sold no it has to stay in the warehouse awaiting dispatch to customers for approximately three months so finished goods my money gets locked up by way of finished goods for a period of three months then credit allowed by creditors is two months from the date of delivery of raw material Credit allowed to debtors is three months from the date of dispatch. 
now after fg what happens debtors now immediately will i be able to generate the moment i sell my fg will i be able to generate money will i be able to generate cash no the debtors say that they want three months of credit period right right but wait parallelly the creditors are also saying that they will give me they will give me the creditors are saying saying that they will give me two months of credit period so this is an advantage for me are you clear with this yes next selling price is five rupees per unit there is a regular production and sales cycle wages and overheads are paid on the first of each month for the previous month and the company normally needs cash in hand to the extent of twenty thousand what we need to do we need to calculate the working capital requirement right so pause this video right now read this question once and then let us continue with the discussion further so now now first first let us calculate the component wise amount that gets blocked into the business component wise amount that gets blocked into the business now recall recall in costing in costing we have learned something called as cost sheet right fine if you do not know if you have not learned costing if you are directly entering into fm right there is something called as cost sheet so what is basically a cost sheet what is basically a cost sheet in cost sheet in cost sheet basically we have direct material plus direct labor plus direct expenses it gives you something called as prime cost to this you will add your production overheads you get something called as you get something called as gross works cost right add opening wip minus closing wip you get something called as net works cost or popularly known as factory costs right from this add your opening fg minus closing fg you get something called as you get something called as cost of goods sold to this you will add administrative overheads and add selling and distribution overheads you get something called as cost of sales to this if you add a profit you will get the sales value now basically this is a format of cost sheet so what happens is for me to convert for me to produce and sell one unit what are all the costs that i will be incurring direct material direct labor direct expenses correct so all the direct expenses put together is called as prime cost to this i will also be incurring some indirect expenses that are incurred inside the factory example for production overheads indirect expenses incurred inside the factory this is going to be factory rent just an example right now if i add all these things i get something called as gross work cost now now not every units are completed in all aspects so the incomplete units are called wip so adjust for wip add opening wip minus closing wip you get the net works cost or the factory cost correct so this is basically this is also known as cost of production that is for me to produce every single unit i incur material labor direct expenses and production overheads or in other words i incur all the costs incurred inside the factory yes to this i adjust for my opening and closing fg i get cost of goods sold correct yes now i add my administrative overheads and selling overheads so what do you mean by administrative overheads any expenses incurred for my administration activity for example for example i can call it as office rent office rent correct office rent or i would say md salary md salary all these are administrative overheads selling overheads i would uh, the example for selling overheads will be sales commission sales commission or we can even say warehouse rent correct warehouse rent so any kind of indirect expense incurred in the sales area is called as selling and overheads so to my cost of goods sold if i add my administrative overheads and selling overheads i get the cost of sales what do you mean by cost of sales the cost incurred in respect of every unit sold 
but uh, whereas what is the cost of production this is nothing but the cost incurred in respect of every unit produced what is the difference between the two here only the cost incurred inside the factories are considered that is nothing but direct material direct labor direct expenses and production overheads whereas whereas in case of units sold apart from over and above my cost of production i will also incur my administrative overheads and selling overheads are you clear with this to which I, if i add profit this is going to be my sales now i'm just giving you a bird's eye view of this particular cost sheet now in cost sheet in your uh, in your uh, costing uh, paper cost sheet will have a few more line items like there will be something called as research and development expenses quality control cost and all Technically, all of that is a part of production overheads. There it's more format driven. But right now here, we are just looking at it from a conceptual viewpoint, which is relevant for the purpose of uh, this particular chapter, working capital management. Now, now, what they are saying, what they are saying. Now, I should calculate the amount of working capital that I need to be invested into my business for my day-to-day -day operation. Now, what they have said, the company is planning to produce how much 60,000 units in this particular year, 60,000 units of what FG, correct? Now what they have said, generally raw material comprises of 60 percentage of the cost, 60 percentage of the cost for what? The 60 percentage of the cost of my sales, correct? So now, now you tell me raw materials, if I buy today, I will be keeping it for a period of two months before I issue it to the production. So basically, what is the amount of investment that is required for raw material? Can you tell me? Can you tell me? Now, can I say this is nothing but look, the cost of materials for the whole year. This is cost, not the investment. Cost of materials is 60 percentage of the sales value. Correct. So what is the total sales? We have given 60,000 units they are going to sell. Every unit is going to be sold at rupees 5, correct? And they have mentioned that 60 percentage of my sales value is generally my raw material cost. I'm not talking about raw material investment. This is the raw material cost, correct? So generally in a year, the raw material cost is going to be how much? 1,80,000. Now, now, should I introduce 1,80,000 right now itself? No, no, no. I just need to first, in my first working capital cycle, I just need to introduce two months equivalent of my raw material consumption. So in one working capital cycle, I just need two months of my annual consumption. Annual consumption is going to be 180,000 rupees worth of raw material. But, but for my per working capital cycle, I only need to fund for two months. Or can we say, can we say the raw material amount, the raw material value that gets blocked into my working capital cycle will be 180,000 rupees into, into, into two divided by 12. So how much is this? So into 2 by 12, this is going to be 30,000 rupees. So first, the amount of raw material, the funding of raw material, the amount of raw material that gets blocked into the business is going to be 30,000 rupees. Are you clear with this? This unlock 80 is the annual raw material cost that I will be incurring. But I'm talking about how much amount of working capital investment I need to bring in. For this, I need to actually stake some finance also. I just need to take up the funding for this. So two months equivalent of my annual raw material cost is only the amount of raw material that gets blocked into a particular working capital cycle are you clear with this it's enough by just fund for the first working capital cycle why because now now if i fund my one working capital cycle obviously it will generate cash that cash generated from the first cycle can be used for the second cycle then the cash generated from the second cycle can be used for the third cycle or in other words basically the amount of working capital investment that i need is basically the working capital investment pertaining to one cycle are you clear with this and in that cycle there could be current assets and current liabilities in that current liabilities one of the components is going to be raw material so raw material how much amount i need in one particular cycle i need two months of my annual requirement annual requirement of raw material is 180000 1 lakh 18 to 2 by 12 30000 rupees would be the raw material amount that is required in the business are you clear with this then then what happens what happens then this raw material now needs to be converted into finished goods this process of conversion is called as wip correct now now you tell me 
you tell me guys what happens is now for a period of two months raw material remains as raw material it is not touched by anyone correct then then what they are saying next it takes one month it takes one month for the company to carry out the process or in other words for the next one month for the next one month the processing happens correct now during this one month during this one month when i am processing the entire raw material will be blocked correct that is the entire raw material is utilized for this one month of processing apart from that for this processing i will be having labor as well as overheads correct or not that is for a period of first two months raw material cost gets blocked as such then for the next one month raw material will now enter into the WIP area so now the cost gets accumulated over and above the raw material cost i will also be incurring labor cost and i will also be incurring overhead cost are you clear with this so in my WIP area in my WIP area what happens the amount of amount of the value of WIP so basically the value of WIP is what the WIP is valued at material plus labor direct expenses if it is given plus overheads so every unit that gets processed now the amount that gets into the value of the WIP will not just be raw material it will be met, uh, labor and overhead should also be included now look at this what they have given each unit is expected to be in process for one month the raw materials being fed into the pipeline immediately and labor and overhead cost accrue evenly during the month what they are saying what they are saying look at this look at this very very important now look at this this is a machine right this is a machine now what they are saying first raw material i had this raw material for uh, two months right we saw the raw material was remaining as raw material untouched for two months now what happened once this two months got over now i poured this entire raw material into what into this machinery this is where my this is where my processing happens so what happened this entire raw material it entered into my machine correct now now on this immediately this raw material will not get converted into an fg and go out no it will take one month time to convert this raw material into an fg are you clear with this that processing is called as wip now now what they are saying is raw material cost is incurred at the beginning itself the moment the wap process starts entire raw material is poured correct but but the process of conversion the process of conversion takes one month time or in other words conversion costs is nothing but your labor and overheads but the labor and overheads overnight i will not incur it incurs evenly during the course of the entire month that is i will not be incurring the labor cost and overhead cost in a single day every day people will be working the power will be consumed evenly for the entire month only the labor and overhead cost will be incurred whereas the raw material cost it is incurred at the beginning of the month itself are you clear with this so can i say this raw material cost gets logged for a period of one more month inside this working WAP, are you clear with this? So can we say in this WAP, in this WAP, raw material stock gets logged in for one more month, correct? Or this is nothing but 1,80,000 is the annual raw material consumption, correct? Into 1 divided by 12. So 1,80,000, 1,80,000 by 12, how much is it? 15,000 rupees. So inside my WIP, WIP consists of raw material, labor and overheads correct so now the raw material sitting inside my wap is 15000 rupees that is 15000 rupees worth of raw material gets blocked at the time of processing for a period of one month this is the meaning are you clear with this now wap is not just about raw material it is some processing happens so labor and overheads will also be incurred now what they are saying look at this please look at this very very carefully they are saying they are saying wages is generally 10 percentage of my sales value overheads is 20 percentage of my sales value fine now in a year in a year what is the total wage cost that i will be incurring can i say it is nothing but 60000 into 5 correct 60000 into 5 this is my overall sales value correct on that 10 percent 
so that is 30,000 rupees will be the labor cost that I will be incurring for an entire one year, for an entire year. Now, now, when I am, what are we talking about? Working capital. So we are talking about the amount of working capital investment that we need to bring in. Now, we are not talking about the cost of uh, labor that I'm incurring. We are just saying at the time, at the time of actually starting for running my business, how much amount of this particular labor cost I need to bring in? That is the point I'm saying, because in a year that could be many working capital cycle. I am just talking about one cycle, the requirement of labor costs inside my WAP in one particular cycle is the topic that we are talking about right now, is the particular issue that we are talking about right now. Now, what they are saying is, sir, I need one month of wages in advance itself. No, correct, because wages also gets blocked for a period of one month. No, no, this is not like raw material. If you see on day one, you incur some wages, fine. The first day, you don't incur any wages. Actually, the work has not yet started. Day one, you start incur, slowly start incurring some wages. Day two, you incur some wages. Day three, day four, day five. And the 30th day, you incur the full wages and the entire WAP, entire WAP gets, or entire raw material gets converted into FG. Or in other words, labor and overheads, unlike raw material, they get accrued evenly during the period of my WAP, correct or not? Or in other words, at the beginning of this one month, I don't incur any labor and overhead costs, correct? At the end, at the end of this one month, I incur the entire labor and overhead cost, correct, for this entire raw material. Or in other words, can I say, can I say, on an average, on an average, can I say, 50 percentage is only the amount of cost that gets blocked into my business. And can I say, 50 percentage of one month, which is going to be 0.5 month. So I need 0.5 months equivalent of labor and overheads to be funded upfront in my business so that so that I can smoothly run my operations. Are you clear with this? Because labor and overheads are not are not incurred at the beginning itself. If they are incurred every day, every day. So what we do since they are incurred evenly, we take a simple average and we say it is not one month's requirement because at the beginning of the period, nothing was incurred. At the end of the period, you need to pay the entire labor and overheads. So basically, there is only half months, 50 percentage of the labor and overheads is the funding that I need to bring in. Are you clear with this? And that is what they have mentioned here. It states, so look at this 30,000 into 0.5 divided by 12. If 30,000 is a labor cost for 12 months, how much will it be for 0.5 months? So how much is this 30,000 into 0.5 divided by 12? That gives you 1250. Similarly, similarly, it is for overheads. So overheads is 20 percentage of my overall sales value, correct? So 20 percentage into 60,000 into 5 into 0.5 divided by 12, you get 2,500 rupees. So overall in my WAP stock, wow, how much in one cycle, in one working capital cycle, in WAP consists of 15,000 rupees worth of raw material, 1250 rupees worth of labor, 2500 rupees worth of overheads. Overall, overall, your WAP stock, the amount that gets blocked inside your WAP stock is going to be 18,750 rupees. Are you clear with this? Look at this. It is stated that it accrues evenly during the month. Thus, on the first day of each month, why month? Month is because the processing takes one month, WAP. It would be zero and on the last day of the month, it would include one month's labor cost. 100% of the cost will be incurred. On an average, therefore, it would be equivalent to half the month's labor cost. So the funding that I need to bring is pertaining to half a month. Are you clear with this? So annually, there is 30,000 I need, no, sir. Don't worry about this. Once this, this is for one year, I just need to bring for 0.5 months. That is only a part of this particular cycle. Once this cycle gets over, it will generate cash to fund the next cycle. Are you clear with this? So basically, I need to calculate the working capital requirement for one cycle alone. Once you are able to do it, automatically the cycle will keep on running. That's why we are calculating the working capital requirement for one particular cycle. Are you clear with this? Yes. So now with this, we have finished. The amount that needs to be blocked in your working WIP is 18,750. Clear with this, guys. So in raw material, what is the amount that gets blocked? 30,000 rupees needs to be blocked in your raw material. How much amount gets blocked in your WAP? 18,750 gets blocked in your WAP. Now, how about finished goods? They are saying finished goods, three months, three months, uh, three months cost of production. That is after producing, after, uh, see, first I had my raw material for how much? First I had my raw material for two months, correct? 
here only raw material cost was blocked correct then for the next one month raw material cost plus labor cost plus overhead cost but labor and overheads were incurred proportionately that is they were incurred evenly so i took only 50 percentage of labor and overheads correct now after this one month can i immediately realize cash no it will enter into my fg area it will enter into my fg area and in my fg it stays for how many days it stays for a period of three months correct it stays for a period of three months am i right now now for the period of next three months what is the amount that gets blocked into my business material plus labor plus overheads this time everything is incurred upfront that is i have incurred all material labor overheads the entire amount of labor and overheads also not 50 percent these are completed goods now i don't incur anything now i just i just keep it idly for the next three months that is because of my business decision so why would someone keep it idly sir maybe maybe you should if you always go to actually some wholesale shop now they will have some ready stock why because demand can come at any point of time you don't know fine so if someone comes and ask you and if you say sorry sir i don't start have stock then it will not look nice so you will have three months equivalent of every year's sale three months worth of stock you will keep with yourself at any given point of time that is the meaning of this correct so now what is the amount that gets blocked in your fg material plus labor plus overheads everything is incurred now then for the next three months i would have paid for my material labor over all the costs have been incurred for the next three months the FG's value, the FG's value is going to be the extra amount that I need to bring into my business or, or in other words, in other words, now if you see, it's very simple. So now you tell me labor cost, raw material cost is how much? 60 percentage of my sales. Labor is 10 percentage of my sales. Overage is 20 percentage of my sales. 60 plus 10 plus 20. Overall, can I say the overall cost that I incur? The overall cost for every unit of completed completed product can i say is 90 percentage of my cost of sales yes now what is my what is my sales value Sixty thousand into 5 rupees correct on that 90 percentage is the cost i have incurred correct so can i say sixty thousand into 5 into 90 percentage 2 lakh 70 thousand rupees 2 lakh 70 thousand rupees is the overall cost incurred for the entire period correct but but i just need to maintain three months worth of stock only that gets blocked into my business by way of fg correct so three lakh seventy thousand into three divided by 12 so how much is this going to be sixty seven thousand five hundred so now now for the next three months for the next three months another sixty seven thousand five hundred rupees needs to be introduced upfront into the business so the working capital how it works is for a period of two months the raw material cost gets blocked for the next one month raw material plus evenly 50 percentage of labor 50 percentage of overheads then for the next three months entire raw material labor and overheads gets blocked in your business are you clear with this yes now what happens now what happens now now after this three months immediately you will you will sell it and can you get the cash immediately no what happens now what happens now now you tell me so first what happened so first what happened so here now raw material one second so first raw material how long it took for raw material two months then then wip took one month then fg took three months now after this three months will you be able to realize the cash no no now you have your data's correct what are they saying how long will the debtors take to pay this money they are saying the debtors the time limit allowed for debtors is three months so for the next three more months for the next three more months i will be having debtors and for the next three months also i will not get back my money or in other words in other words the next three months amount should also be funded by me only correct or not now now what is the amount that gets blocked for the next three months the value of the goods sold yes or no the value of the goods sold now you tell me you tell me for every unit sold for every unit sold now now for every unit sold what is the sales price what is the selling price so for every unit sold the selling price is five rupees correct now this five rupees includes profit margin yes or no now now profit is it an amount that i need to block 
no i need to i'm blocking what is the amount that gets blocked in my business only the cost correct or in other words can i say 60000 units into 5 rupees into 90 percentage is the overall cost that i incur cost of sales pertaining to the entire year which is 270000 rupees correct yes now 270000 is the cost of sales made for the entire year now i need i need to fund only to the extent of 3 months in my debtors with respect to my debtors to 270000 into 3 by 12 so another 67500 rupees gets blocked by way of debtors are you clear with this another 67500 rupees gets blocked by way of debtors where the total cost of sales is raw material plus wages plus overheads plus opening fg minus closing fg here opening and fg closing fg is not given we can assume it to be equal so now your overall value overall total cost is going to be 270000 this is where i said the format of cost sheet also you can use are you clear with this so now now basically what happens what is the amount that get blocked in your raw material now amount that gets blocked in your raw material is how much rupees 30000 right yes the amount that gets blocked in your raw material is how much rupees 30000 then then the amount gets that gets blocked in your wip how much is that that is going to be 18750 this also i need to bring into my business initially 18750 then what is the amount that gets blocked by way of fg 67500 rupees 67500 then what is the amount that gets blocked as debtors the amount that gets blocked as debtors is going to be how much so it's going to be 67500 once again it's going to be 67500 once again are you clear with this are you clear with this no no now what happens what happens apart from that okay let us also say the company requires some cash balance all of this fine now what happens now now there is an advantage for the company what is it now their creditors their suppliers are ready to give two months of credit period now their suppliers are indirectly funding my creditors for what for raw material they are saying don't worry you need not pay the cash immediately you pay it after two months but till now what i have done i have done it on the assumption that cash needs to be paid immediately based on that only raw material stock two months and all i have taken correct so now from this i will reduce i will reduce the amount that gets funded indirectly funded by my creditors yes or no this is indirectly funded how can you say it's funded they are not funding in cash they are funding it in kind they are giving you the raw material today they are saying you pay it after two months are you clear with this so now what happens here what is the amount that they are indirectly funding what is the amount that they are indirectly funding very simple annual purchases will be what 60000 into 5 that is your total sales on that 60 percentage 60 percentage on my annual sales is the overall purchase raw material cost correct or not yes on that two months equivalent credit they are giving me so into 2 by 12 that is indirectly 30000 rupees of or my gross working capital is being funded by my creditors are you clear with this so this 30000 rupees i am subtracting it why because to this extent my creditors are saying they will finance me finance it for me this is not a cost i am saying about the amount of funding and investment required next next now they have also said something they have also said something what have they said look at this wages and overheads are paid on the first of each month for the previous month which means now wages and overheads also these guys are saying now you need not pay today this month you extract all the work you pay it in the first of next month or in other words wages and overheads we are getting one month credit outstanding wages outstanding overheads and all we are getting one month credit correct indirectly these expenses are also getting funded yes or no now wages is how much wage cost is how much 10 percentage of my sales value correct So ten percentage of my sales value into one by twelve is the funding. So ten percentage of my sales value into one by twelve. This is the amount that is actually being funded. I am not saying this; they are bearing the cost. No, to the extent of this two thousand five hundred rupees, it is being these uh, workers are saying we will take it later. That is, you need not pay me every day as and when I work. 
So I will work for one month, you pay me later. Because of this timing difference, I require a lesser funding of 2,500, correct? And then overheads is 20 percentage of my total sales into 1 by 12. It's going to be 5,000 rupees is the amount that gets indirectly funded by way of delaying payment in your overheads. Here it is assumed that the inventory level is uniform throughout the year. Therefore, opening inventory equals closing inventory. We've seen it. Now, now statement of working capital requirement. What is the amount that I need to bring it initially itself into the business? And this will enter into the cycle and keep on rotating. Raw material, I need to bring in 30,000 rupees. We have already done this. 30,000. Yes. For WAP, I need to bring in 18,750. FG, 67,500. Data 67,500. Wait, they have also said at any given point of time, the company should maintain a cash balance of 20,000 rupees correct, to meet any kind of contingencies. So the gross working capital that the company should meet, that is, they should definitely introduce 2,3750 rupees. Apart from that investment in all the capital asset, they should have this money to run the show. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? Now what happens? Now what happens? Wait, wait. This can be funded by borrowing, or, or, or this can also be funded through your current liabilities. So to the extent of current liabilities, how much is getting funded? Creditors are indirectly funding for a period of 30,000 30, rupees. They are not bearing the cost since they are saying I am accepting the payment after two months because of the time gap you have 30,000 rupees of finance. So from this I have this gross, uh, this capital assets that is sorry, your current assets, your gross working capital has been computed by not taking into account any of these uh, cushions that I have, correct? I'm assuming that the entire payment is being made as and when it is required. But from this, I am now reducing whatever credit period that I can avail. So in the creators, 30,000 rupees, outstanding wages, 2,500, outstanding overheads, 5,000. So out of this 2,3750, in, inside this, the current liabilities itself is funding me to the extent of 37,500. So now I need to introduce 1,66,250 rupees into my business. Are you clear with this? So now what happens? What happens right now? So 1,66,250. Now what will happen? So I will go to the bank. I will ask them working capital loan I want to the extent of 1,66,250. Let us say the bank is giving or you can also raise it through any of the long term sources of finance. You are getting it. Now you will introduce this into your, you will introduce this into your particular, you will introduce this into your uh, business, correct? Now, what is the working capital cycle for this company? Two months, one month, three months, three months, and then creditors give you uh, two months credit period, and then um, your uh, overheads, right? Your labor and overheads, you have about one month each. You Labor and overheads, you have about one month each, right? So basically, what do we have here? Two plus one, three, three plus three, uh, six plus three, nine minus three. This is going to be six months approximately. Fine, approximately six months is your working capital cycle. Now you will get back this amount after a period of six months. Now, when you get back this amount, you will get slightly more than this, slightly more than 1,66,250. Why? Because you will be getting along with the profit, correct? Now this extra amount, if you want, you can take it out of the cycle. But once again, for the next cycle, you should reinvest 166,250. Are you clear with this? And now what happens? It generates slightly extra than that. It keeps on going like this. Or in other words, in one year, in this case, in this example, if working capital cycle is six months, in one year, you have two cycles, correct? In a year, you have 12 months and one cycle is, uh, is for a period of six months. So in this case, in a year, you can have two working capital cycles. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? And then what happens? What happens? Since, since I'm able to generate more than the amount that I have actually invested. So what happens? This extra money that I have using this, I can service my loan also and balance whatever money I have. I can use it as my profit. Are you clear with this? So this is the main reason why companies or the economy itself is thriving without working capital borrowings, without working capital funding, no company can work. The banks are happy because they earn interest. Now, these companies are happy. The company, the businessmen, they are also happy. The entrepreneurs are happy because they get the money, right money in the time so that they are able to run the show. And then whatever profit that they generate out of that, they pay the interest balance amount they enjoyed for themselves. And this cycle keeps on going forever till the time the company permanently shuts down. So this amount which they are borrowing as working capital, this cannot be repaid after one cycle because it gets reinvested. So permanently this will remain in your business, correct? And every time, every time, 
parallelly you will also be servicing the loan by way of paying an interest are you clear with this this is a very very important understanding of working capital so you cannot just directly jump into this and say okay current asset minus current liability that's all no you need to understand under each components of current assets how much is the amount that gets blocked we are not calculating the cost we are taking the annual cost on that we are saying in one cycle how much is the amount that gets blocked so we are trying to find out how much is the amount of working capital investment required to that extent i will have to finance it are you clear with this so this is the overall story about this working capital initial the first unit of working capital management so with this we have finished the first part which is the most important part which is introduction to working capital management so now let's go to the second unit which is treasury and cash management now let's get into the second unit of this particular chapter which is treasury and cash management now what does this area talk about this talks about how well you're going to manage your cash this exclusively talks about the cash component cash by cash i mean cash or bank clear Fine. So this cash and bank is one of the items in your current assets. So we are just going to see how this cash and bank should get managed. So basically they have given a lot of theoretical part in this. But of course we will be doing a comprehensive numerical problem in this particular area as well. So you should ensure that basically with respect to cash management. Remember that you should not have too much of cash balance. You should not also have too less of a cash balance. Why? Too much of idle cash is a waste, correct? Funds idly you are keeping it, which means what? It comes with a cost, it does not come free of cost, correct? So too much of idle funds increases your cost, whereas too less of funds is also bad. Why? It affects your liquidity. Whenever you have to make some payment, you need to make it. Else it affects your reputation, it affects your business. So you should have adequate and sufficient cash balances. Are you clear for this? So now how will I control this? How will I maintain a control over this? Generally, companies prepare something called as a forecast or a budget. So this is what we are going to see in the next illustration. So this illustration, I have actually taken this from ICAI study material only. So let's actually jump to ICA study material so, and uh, look, have a look at this particular problem. It's on page number 10.52. So in case you are from the new syllabus, don't worry, this exact sum is also there in the new syllabus study material for May 2024 and onwards. This sum is there, a very, very good problem. See, the thing is actually, the sum looks big. The question itself looks very big. See, it runs into two pages, just a question. Fine, but the solution is just one page. Now, many students, they don't have this energy to read this question. They feel it's very big. It's very difficult. No, big doesn't mean difficult. Now, for you to crack this sum, you don't even need to know anything related to financial management. You just need to have some common sense and logic. So I will just read out the question for you. And then, and then this question, I will tell you how to approach this in the exam. Mark this as important. This question can be tested. Prachi Limited is a manufacturing company producing and selling a wide range of cleaning products to wholesale customers. The company has three suppliers and two customers. So this company Prachi Limited, they have three suppliers, three creditors they need to pay and they have two debtors. They will receive money from two people, correct? Prachi Limited relies on its cleared funds forecast to manage its cash. For to manage this cash. What do you mean by cleared funds forecast? What do you mean by that? Now, let us say I am depositing a check in the bank. In my bank account, I am depositing a check today. Correct? Now, now for the check to be cleared and for my bank account to be credited with the money, let us say it takes two days. Correct? Now, now they are saying they will prepare this, all this cash budget and cash forecast only when the check gets cleared and when my bank account is reflecting the amount they will not they will not actually account for it or they will not prepare or they will not plan their budgets based on whenever they are receiving the check or whenever the transaction is happening they will they will actually consider this transaction has happened only when the bank accounts gets debited or credited or in other words only when the amount reflects in my bank account in my bank statement 
only then based on that only they prepare their cash budgets and all this is what they are saying that is the meaning of cleared funds forecast are you clear with this you are an accounting technician for the company and have been asked to prepare a cleared funds forecast for a period of for the period sa saturday that is 7th august to wednesday that is 11th august so 7 8 9 10 11 so what we need to do we need to prepare a cleared funds forecast that is that is the clear uh, cleared cash budget cleared cash and bank budget for each of the five days that they have asked us to do are you clear with this very simple no that is when will you account when will you actually consider things in your budget receipts minus payments that is going to be your excess or your deficit cash correct so when will you do this you will account for it in a particular day only when you actually only when your bank account is actually reflecting this particular transaction yes very simple now you are provided with the following information so basically what we need to do we need to prepare a cash budget for each of these five days but remember there is only one condition here what is it you should record this particular transaction only when your bank statement reflects it so now now basically just look at this so what they have prepared prepared they have prepared the cleared funds forecast for 7th 8th 9th 10th and 11th for each of these five days they have prepared a forecast look at this receipts they have minus payments they have and you will have what you will have the excess of cleared excess over uh, cleared excess receipts over payment that is a minus b you have this now now you need not know anything here why am i saying this in this particular question what we will do since the question is big as and when we read a particular line item we will go and fill up this particular column are you clear with this in exam you also follow this first you prepare this template and you just go on it's nothing but preparing a cash budget for each of the five days but the only condition is you can record the transaction only when it's reflects in your bank statement we will see what it is we will see what it is now first receipts from customers the company has how many customers we saw two customers correct right carefully listen we are preparing this budget for 7th 8th 9th 10th and 11th of august correct these are the five days so only the banking transaction that happens for each of these five days should be accounted by us clear so now now what happens here look now w limited is whom my customer prachi limited's customer the credit uh, period that i am giving for w limited is one calendar month correct and for x limited there is no credit period which means immediately they need to pay w limited generally makes the payment through a mode called bacs it is like NEFT, IMPS, like that BACS is one payment method. You need not know all this. They themselves have given. BACS stands for Bankers Automated Clearing Service. And it is instantaneous. Meaning what? The moment they make the payment, it will immediately come to my bank account. Are you clear? The moment my customer initiates the payment from his bank account, it will be credited instantly in my bank account. There's something, to, something similar to your GPAY or IMPS. Immediately, immediate transaction will happen. Now, what they have given the sales value made on 7th of august is given the sales value made on 7th of july is also given are you clear with this now now for w limited you tell me one month credit period we have or or in other words in other words during this period i am preparing budget only for 7th 8th 9th 10th 11th of august correct now during this period you tell me which is the amount that i will be receiving they have one month credit period so basically this 130000 of sales made one month before i will be receiving it on 7th of august correct or not how much is the amount i will be receiving this 130000 rupees today yes or no so basically what we can do we can immediately go to this statement and fill this up w limited on 7th august you receive how much 1 lakh 30 thousand rupees are you clear with this fill it up then and there fill it up then and there then now go up now x limited there is no such thing called as credit period which means immediate payment they need to pay now what happened what happened 7th of july sales they have given 7th of august sales they have given here 7th of july one month credit and all is not that this is not at all relevant why because it is outside my budget period now this sale of 180000 this is relevant now what they are doing 
So if I am making the sale on 7th August, on 7th August itself, X Limited is giving me the check. Are you clear with this? But wait, what happens here? X Limited's check will be paid into Prachi's Limited Bank account on the same day. I will deposit the check the same day, but it will clear on the third day following the payment. Now, what happens here? If, if on 7th August, if they deposit the check, leave 7th August, 8th, 9th, only on 10th, this 180,000 will reflect in my bank statement, correct? So now, now what I will do here, I will go here and I will put it as 7th, nothing will happen, 8th, 9th, nothing will happen. On 10th only, this amount of 180,000 gets cleared in my bank account. That's why we call it as cleared fund forecast. Are you clear with this? Which means, which means, which means for the period of these three days, for the period of these three days, 1.8 lakhs remains uncleared yes or no for the period of these three days yes i have received that is i would have accounted it in my cash book but but ideally i have not it this has not been reflected in my bank statement or for these three days 7th 8th and 9th this 1 lakh 80 thousand is an uncleared amount correct yes so they are parking it under uncleared funds they are saying for the first three days, this 180,000 remains to be uncleared. Are you clear with this? So in this question, they have also asked us to prepare this uncleared funds. So we are actually mentioning that uh, we are mentioning it properly here and there. So what we are doing for a period of the first three days, this 180,000 rupees remains to be uncleared. Are you clear with this? Yes. Next. The next. Next. What is the next transaction that they have mentioned? So this is about your receipts from customers. Next, payment to suppliers. We have three suppliers, right? These are payments. A limited, B limited, C limited. A limited, if I make the purchase today, I can pay him after one month. B limited, if I make the purchase today, I can pay him after three months. C limited, no credit, which means I need to pay immediately. Now, payment methods are not given. For A limited, standing order. B limited, uh, check. And C limited, check, right? Now, look at this, look at this. A limited, one month is the credit period, correct or not? Which means the purchases that I made one month back, I will be paying it today, correct? Now, in our, we are preparing budget for what period? 7th to 11th August, correct? So between 7th to 11th August, which payments will come? The purchase made on 7th of July, correct? Or in other words, this 55,000 rupees, yes or no? So this 55,000 rupees is actually the amount of payment that comes into one second. So look at this, look at this. This is one calendar month, right? This is one calendar month. So basically on 7th of August, on 7th of August, what will be the amount that they will be paying? So what happens? What is the relevant purchases that I will be making? So that is the one month before whatever was the purchase, 55,000 rupees that I need to pay. Correct or not? But wait, but wait, read this along. Prachi Limited has setting up, has set up a standing order. Standing order means what? They have given an instruction to the bank for 45,000 rupees a month to pay for supplies from A Limited. So Prachi Limited has told their bankers, they have told, look, Every month pay flat to 45,000 rupees on 7th of every month you should pay, correct? This payment will leave the Prachi's bank account on 7th of August. Every few months an adjustment should be made and this adjustment is not made during this period. So technically from a cash flow perspective during the time that I'm mentioning 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, during these five days, what is the amount of payment that goes from Prachi Limited to A Limited? It is not 55,000. It is 45,000 rupees only. Sir, how is it enough if I pay 45,000? The adjustment, the difference amount, they will pay it later. That adjustment does not happen during our budgeted period. Are you clear with this? So technically speaking, what happens here? Only 45,000 rupees moves out of my bank account, but it happens instantaneously. Are you clear with this? So this standing instruction, standing order of 45,000 rupees, it gets debited on what date? On 7th of August. So 7th of August, the amount that gets paid to A Limited is 45,000. So immediately go down and write down 45,000. Be very careful. It's not 55,000. 55,000 is actually the purchases made. Correct, one month. That's what we will think. But look at the wordings. They have given some standing order and all. So whatever is the amount that they have told the bankers to pay, that amount will only move out of their bank account. Are you cleared with this? Yes. Then. Then what happens? Then what happens? Now, now, 
now b limited check payment so now what have they said prachi limited will send out by post the checks to b and c limited on 7th august the amounts will leave its bank account on the second day following this day of posting now what they are saying now b limited gives us two months credit period so now what they are saying so the purchase that i have made two months before that will be paid today in 7th of august correct the purchases made on 7th of june will be paid today on 7th of august right then for c limited no credit period which means the the purchases made today on 7th of august that will only be paid today are you clear with this so now this 75000 and this 95000 the checks will be posted on 7th of august correct now what they are saying will it be immediately debited reduced from my bank account no they are saying it takes it will be it will be the amounts will leave their account on the second day following the day of posting so on 7th day post 8th 9th on 9th this two amounts 75000 to b limited 95000 to c limited these two amount will actually be will actually be what these two amounts will be debited only on 9th that is it will reduce from a bank balance only on 9th so i will issue the check on 7th but 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 this amount 75000 and 95000 respectively will be reduced from my bank only on 9th are you clear with this so what we will do so on 9th 75000 and 95000 is a payment that we are making but this was initiated on what on 7th so 75 plus 95 how much is this 190000 this 190000 sorry this is 170000 this 170000 remains to be an uncleared amount for the first two days on 7th as well as on 8th 170000 remains to be what uncleared it has not yet gone out of my bank account but i had posted it in my books of accounts as a payment are you clear with this this 300 we will come to it maybe some other payment is there that needs to be added are you clear with this so this 170 remains to be uncleared for the two days since the check got issued next next what is the next thing that they have mentioned wages and salary for the month of July, for the month of August, weekly wages 12,000, 13,000, monthly salaries 56 and 59. Read this immediately. The factory wages are paid in cash wages weekly. They will be paid one week's wages on 11th of August for the last two weeks done in the, for the last week's work done in July. So basically, this 12,000 rupees weekly wages will be paid on what? 11th of August. Are you clear with this? It will be paid in cash. So ob obviously the amount will be, will go out of their funds immediately. So 12,000 rupees, 12,000 rupees will reduce on 11th of August. So just go down and say 12,000 rupees will be reduced on 11th of August. It comes under payment. Are you clear with this? Then what about the next figure? What about the next one? The officers, the office workers are paid salaries on a monthly basis under BACS. BACS is what? That instant automatic uh, payment. Salaries for the month of July will be paid on 7th of August. So this 56,000 rupees will move out of my bank account on 7th of August. Correct? So now on 7th of August, on 7th of August, 56,000 rupees will move out of my account by way of what? By way of salaries. Are you clear with this? Yes. Then, then. The next one, other miscellaneous expenses. Every Saturday evening, the petty cashier withdraws 200 rupees from the company's bank account for petty cash. The money leaves Prachi's bank account right away, straight away. So basically, Saturday evening, when is the Saturday coming here? 7th. Every Saturday, this petty cashier, the petty cashier is withdrawing 200 rupees from the account. So immediately it gets reduced. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this? Yes, this 200 rupees gets reduced every, uh, every Saturday right fine that's a payment that goes out now the room cleaner is paid 30 rupees from the petty cash every monday morning very important now what is this now this petty cash 200 rupees is withdrawing and keeping with the cashier correct i have reduced this 200 from my funds now from this 200 that the cashier has within in his hands out of this he is paying 30 rupees 20 rupees whatever it is now, this will not impact my bank balance. Why? Already I have withdrawn 200 rupees. Out of that only I am spending something. So, obviously it will not impact my bank account now. When I withdraw 200 rupees, that will impact my bank account. 
from the amount withdrawn if i'm spending it how will it impact my bank account are you clear with this we are calculating the cleared funds forecast are you clear with this yes next stationery will be ordered by telephone on sunday 8th august to the value of 300 rupees this is paid for by the company using their debit card and such payments are generally seen to leave the company account the next working day so on 8th august I made a purchase of stationery to the extent of 300 but when will it impact my bank account 9 9th august only so what happens on 9th of august there is a payment of 300 but wait this payment was initiated on 8th so on 8th it remains to be what it remains to be uncleared payment that is why here the total uncleared payment is 170 plus 300 are you clear with this are you clear with this yes so this is the meaning of it this is the meaning of this next Five new softwares will be ordered over the internet on 10th of August at a total cost of 6,500. A check will be sent out on the same day. The amount will leave Prachi's bank account on the second day following the date of posting. So if I make the payment on 10th, that is if I issue a check on 10th, 11th, 12th, only on 12th, it will move out from my bank account. Now, you tell me, I am preparing this budget only up to 11th correct so basically it will not impact my budget for a period of 7th to 11th august are you clear with this so basically it will not impact my clear funds for up to 11th august correct because the amount gets reduced from my bank account only on the 12th yes but wait the 6500 rupees was a transaction initiated on 10th so for 10th and 11th this amount of 6500 rupees remains as an uncleared fund that got uncleared fund payment yes or no that is one uncleared payment so this 6500 rupees remains as an uncleared payment for the last two days that is 10th and 11th of august are you clear with this yes so this is what they have given and then the balance of prachi's bank account will be 2 lakh rupees on 7th of august opening balance is 2 lakh rupees this represents both the book balance and the cleared funds prepare a cleared funds forecast for a period of saturday 7th august to 11th august inclusive using the information provided show clearly the uncleared funds float each day so day wise we have seen how much amount has received how much amount has been paid so every day we are just calculating the difference between the two so 1 lakh 30 minus 1 lakh 1200 so excess amount how much day one that is on 7th of august i have how much excess 28800 the opening balance is already 2 lakhs this is given in the question so the cleared closing balance is 2 lakh 28800 yes or no now this closing balance will become the opening balance of the next day in the next day there is no receipts no payments no transactions so that will automatically become the closing balance fine this closing balance will become the opening balance for the next day yes in the next day what happened there was no receipts but there was only payment of 170300 so minus 170300 the closing balance will be 58500 this 58500 becomes the opening balance for the next day in the next day if you see there is only a receipt and no payment to the extent of 180 so 180 plus 58500 the closing balance for the next day is going to be 238500 this becomes the opening balance for the last day 11th august so now for the last day if you see no receipts but only payment so minus 12000 is the amount that has gone outside the bank account so my 238500 minus 12000 so the clear fund balance as on 11th august the last day is going to be 226500 are you clear with this and then the uncleared float also we are actually tracking here 180 minus 170 so on the first day you have 10,000 rupees of uncleared float, second day 9,700, the third day 1,80,000, on the fourth day minus 6,500, sixth day minus 6,500. What is the meaning of all this? To the extent of net amount of 10,000 rupees, net amount of 10,000 rupees, so I have, I am yet to receive, that is, that is, the transaction has been initiated, but my bank account is not yet created with respect to 10,000 rupees, it is uncleared fund, are you clear with this, uncleared fund, then on the second day, if you see, still I am yet to receive 9,700 rupees, it is a transaction that has been initiated, but it has yet to be reflecting in my bank account, then on the third day, if you see, 180,000 rupees, I am about to receive, but it is not yet reflecting in my bank Bank account on the fourth day if you see actually 6500 rupees of payment i should have made but it is actually it the payment was initiated but it is not reflected in my bank statement and on the fifth day also 
the same 6500 rupees of transaction which was initiated but still not reflecting in my books this is only being mentioned here so th this is actually these amounts are recorded in my books but they are not reflecting in my bank statement this is similar to the brs that we do so the clear funds plus the uncleared funds gives you the total book balance so 228800 is the actual balance that i have in my account plus 10000 rupees i know that i will be receiving it in the next one or two days that's because of my clearing difference and all so the total book balance is this cleared balance plus my uncleared the fund float it's going to be 238800 here it's going to be 338500 uh, sorry 238500 238500 look at this for the fourth and fifth day i have a cleared balance of 238500 but 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 i am i am about to pay 6500 i have initiated the transaction which is not at reflected in my books so the net balance is only 232000 and on the last day also the balance is 220000 are you clear with this so basically the sum is actually easy provided you know what you are doing and how you do it so there is actually a way in which you do the question so once you read this question what you can do is quickly give it a glance once and then prepare this template as and when you read a paragraph fully just go and do the posting so that by the time you finish reading the question itself you will be done with about 80 percentage of the problem and this entire sum will be over clear with this if at all this comes this income for a 10 mark question and and this is nothing but logic common sense just because the sum is big some students find it difficult so please don't uh, fall into the trap of feeling that the sum is difficult and all it's pretty much a straightforward question are you clear with this are you clear with this yes so with this we have finished the cash management of course in cash management it's more to do with how do you manage your cashes and how do you manage your cash and all that fine there are also different uh, a few uh, other problems but in this marathon i wanted to cover the important aspect that is covered in our uh, cash management so that is what we have seen now so now let's move to the next unit let's now move to the next unit so now let's move to the third unit in this particular chapter which is inventory management right so technically this uh, segment of uh, the chapter is actually covered in costing it's covered in your cost and management accounting there is a concept called as EOQ, economic order quantity, and there is a concept called as stock levels. Okay, so EOQ actually is nothing but how much quantity should I place an order for? So every time I place an order from the supplier, how many units I should place an order for? And the stock levels has something like minimum level, maximum level, reorder level. Reorder level means when I should place an order. EOQ stands for whenever I'm placing an order for how much quantity I should place an order. Now, why are all these things coming under working capital management? Because this squarely comes within the ambit of inventory management. Now, similar to any other component of working capital, inventory, we should maintain adequate inventory. We should not have too much of inventory. Why? If you have too much of inventory, you are actually blocking your funds on idle inventory. Inventory is a dead stock. Correct. If you have too much of non-moving stock, it means that you need to bring in more capital and every rupee that you bring into the business for your working capital, it has a cost associated with it. It should also not be too less. Why? If it is less, then you will run out of your orders. So whenever you're getting an order, since if you don't have the stock, then you will not be able to, you will not be able to, um, you know, you will not be able to produce the products because if your raw material, you don't have the stock, how can you start your production and honor your commitments? Are you clear with this? So basically, you should not have too much of stock. You should also not have too less of stock. There should be an optimum stock that you need to maintain. Are you clear with this? So that's why they've also given inventory management has been discussed in detail in chapter two. That is material cost chapter. Clear? So now we will just do one question in this particular area. Technically, it is covered in costing, nothing related to your financial management. It's covered in costing. But anyways, I will just do this sum just so that you can get a hang of it. Now, problem number three, Marvel Limited uses a large quantity of salt in its production process. Annual consumption is 60,000 tons over a 50 week working year. So every year they are consuming 60,000 tons of salt. It costs 100 rupees to initiate and process an order and the delivery follows two weeks later. So if I place an order today, after two weeks only the delivery will happen. Storage costs for the salt are estimated at 0.1 rupees per ton per annum. 
and so this is basically your carrying cost yes this is basically your cost of holding it holding cost or carrying cost right the current practice is to order twice a year when the stock falls to 10000 tons identify an appropriate ordering policy for marvel limited and contrast it with the cost of the current policy now there is a concept in material cost called as eoq economic order quantity right now in case in case you do not know this you can refer the costing marathon video that we have uploaded in that in part 1 itself i have uh, discussed in detail about this material cost concept you can just go and watch it it's available on youtube on our channel right so now in this eoq we would have learned what is what do you mean by eoq economic order quantity how many units should i place an order for so that my overall cost is kept minimum the logic for this formula and all is explained so the eoq is actually root of 2 into a into o divided by c where a stands for annual raw material consumption that is 60000 tons correct o stands for ordering cost per order that is rupees 100 and c stands for carrying cost per unit per annum which is rupees 0.10 so how many units should i place an order for root of 2 into a that is annual requirement 60000 into o 100 divided by 0.10 so if you calculate this you will get how much 10954 so it is the best the best uh, optimum quantity is actually 10954 so every time you place an order you should place an order for how many tons of raw material 10954 tons of raw material which means in a year how many number of times you will order overall i need 60000 tons every time i am placing an order i will place an order for 10.954 uh, 10954 tons which means in a year i will place an order for representatively 5.5 times so the number of orders that happens in a year is 5.5 times are you clear with this yes then 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 now what is your reorder level what is your reorder level so basically what do you mean by reorder level so reorder quantity that is eoq stands for how many kgs to order whereas reorder level means when to order correct so reorder level is nothing but reorder level is nothing but so what is your reorder level so reorder level is your lead time into consumption per day or per week of lead time correct is yes, all these things are covered in costing actually right so what is the lead time that it generally takes here what is the lead time that he generally takes he takes he takes if i place an order today it takes him 2 weeks to deliver the product yes or no so they have given it here so it takes 2 weeks to deliver the product yes so it takes 2 weeks to deliver the product and and what is the consumption per week so 60000 is the annual consumption and in a year there are 50 weeks so basically i should make sure that the moment my stock touches this level i should pick the phone and place an order for how many kgs for 10954 kgs or tons are you clear with this so what is the reorder level the reorder level is 2400 so what do you mean by 2400 the moment my stock balance is are reaching at 2400 i will pick the phone and i will place an order for 10954 tons are you clear with this and when we do this automatically your overall cost will be minimum this is what the concept of eoq says so the total cost at optimum policy optimum policy means what if your order quantity is at eoq that is 10954 so what is your total cost total cost is holding cost plus ordering cost so what is your holding cost so holding cost is nothing but average inventory average inventory into c that is carrying cost per unit per annum yes or no now average inventory what is the average inventory that you will keep what is the average inventory that you will keep average inventory now if you see here at every point of time c if you place an order you will get for 10954 units correct so by the time by the time it reaches by the time it reaches the the delivery by the time the supplier delivers your product to you 
again you will get this 10,954 units or in other words or in other words at one point of time in a period there will be 10,954 kgs in your tons sitting in your warehouse at some point there will be zero so the average inventory will be half of 10,954 yes or in other words half of order quantity half of EOQ is your average inventory so 1 by 2 into 10,954. This is going to be your average inventory into carrying cost per unit per annum. It is going to be how much into into 0.1. Are you clear with this? So this is going to be your overall holding cost or carrying cost. So 0 0.1 into 10,954 divided by 2. Why this divided by 2? This is nothing but average inventory into carrying cost per unit per annum. Then what is your ordering cost? Ordering cost per order into number of orders. So what is the number of orders annual requirement? That is, I need 60,000 tons every year. Every time I place an order, I place an order for 10,954 tons. So which means 60,000 divided by 10,954. I am placing 5.5 orders in a year. And every time I place an order, I incur a cost of 100 rupees. Yes or no? So basically the ordering cost will be 100 into 60,000 divided by 10,954. So basically, basically it is going to be 547.7 plus 547.74. So your overall, overall cost is going to be 1,095 if, if you are maintaining, if you are placing an order at your economic order quantity level. If you are following the economic order quantity, your overall cost will be 1095 are you clear with this now what they are given currently what the company is doing the company is only ordering twice a year and that too when the stock balance falls at 10,000 tons so which means twice a year which means every time they place an order in a year they place an order only two times so every time they place an order they place an order for how many tons 30,000 tons yes or no so in one order that is 30,000 tons and like that in a year they are ordering twice correct Yes. So now, if now are they following the EOQ? No. EOQ says every time you place an order, you should place an order only for 10,954 tons. Correct. Whereas, whereas they are placing an order for 30,000 tons. So obviously, since they are deviating from EOQ, they will be incurring more cost. This is what we saw in material cost chapter, right? That is exactly given. Nothing new that we are learning. Every single thing is the same. So now, what they have given here. So to compare the optimum policy with the current policy. The average level of stock under the current policy must be found. Why we should find, calculate the average stock under the current policy? Yes. Now, now, what is my what is my holding cost and what is my ordering cost? Holding cost is average inventory, average inventory into into carrying cost per unit per order. What is my ordering cost? Ordering cost is nothing but ordering costs is nothing but number of orders number of orders in a year multiplied by ordering cost per order yes or no now now holding cost is average inventory into the carrying cost per unit per annum what is the carrying cost per unit per annum the carrying cost per unit per annum is 0 0.1 now you tell me you tell me what is going to be my average inventory now they are saying what they are saying is look at this I will place an order every time my stock reaches 10,000 tons. Correct? Right? So I will place an order every time my stock reaches 10,000 tons. Yes or no? My stock reaches 10,000 tons. Now, it takes, it takes two weeks for the person to deliver it. Yes or no? So before the time, before the delivery happens, so I will pick the phone call and the moment my stock balance is 10,000, I will pick the phone call. By the time he delivers, my stock balance will be reducing by how much? So two weeks consumption every week, every in a year, I will consume 60,000. In a year, I will consume 60,000 tons, which means on an average, every week, I will consume how much? 60,000 divided by 50, right? Like the two weeks it takes. So 60,000 divided by 50 into two. So by the time the delivery happens, I would have already consumed how much? 2,400 tons. Yes or no? Yes or no? So technically at the time of delivery, my stock balance would have reduced to how much? 7,600. Yes. Now this guy is going to deliver 
how many kgs 30000 kgs we just found out they are going to place an order only for two uh, two times in a year so 30000 kgs so now the stock gets replenished by 30000 kgs so what is the maximum stock that you will be having 7600 is the minimum stock what is the maximum stock it's going to be 37600 yes because plus 30000 it's going to be 37600 so the average stock will be the maximum stock plus the minimum stock divided by 2 so your average stock is going to be how much <clears throat> your average stock that is a simple average way of computing or or you can also do it as minimum stock minimum stock plus 1 by 2 of order quantity i told you there are two formulas to cal calculate average stock in costing we have seen yes so what are the two formulas to calculate uh, um, average stock one is actually a simple average that is minimum plus maximum by 2 that is arithmetically correct but practically not correct whereas the other formula is very logical minimum minimum plus evoq by 2 that is that is the fl stock fluctuation will happen only above the minimum level so you take the average of my evoq so what is the evoq in this case order quantity what is the order quantity 30000 so 30000 divided by 2 plus the minimum stock of 7600 so the average stock gives you 22600 so 22600 into 0.1 this is going to be your overall carrying cost or holding cost then what is going to be your ordering cost it is going to be number of orders that is 2 into ordering cost plus per order so the overall cost if if i am placing an order twice in a year is going to be 2460 whereas if i follow evoq it is just going to be 1095 so how much extra cost i am incurring because i am deviating from evoq so the difference between that 2460 minus minus 1095 so that gives you how much 1365 rupees per year so every year i am incurring an extra cost of 1365 because i am deviating from my evoq so it is better Better to follow EOQ. Are you clear with this? Technically, this entire discussion is not even pertaining to financial management. It is exact copy paste of your. Uh, it is exact copy paste of your costing. In fact, in the new syllabus, what they have done is. So, in the old syllabus, at least they had mentioned all these things and they had given some illustration. In new syllabus, what they have done from May 2024 onwards, they have just mentioned in a single line. They have mentioned refer material cost chapter in your costing so this is nowhere uh, you know they have not mentioned separately things here they have just said refer that costing syllabus so they have just mentioned this as unit 3 management of inventory refer your costing syllabus your material cost chapter that's all they have done they have just mentioned this part alone are you clear with this in old syllabus at least they have just mentioned a few things and given a few illustrations that doesn't mean that these questions will not be tested so please have that in your mind this is equally applicable for new syllabus students as well clear so with this the small area inventory management is also so over now let's get started with the unit 4 in this working capital management chapter which is management of receivables so basically receivable stands for what your debtors predominantly it stands for your debtors of course bills receivable also right so the people who owe some money to the firm to the uh, particular company is called as what uh, they are called as uh, debtors or receivables now now, what is the point here? What is the point of discussion here? Now, there is some money that gets blocked in this debtors category. It is a part of current assets. I am making the sale today, right? But let us say I am getting the payment after two months. I am getting the payment after two months. So, for this two months, there is some amount that gets blocked by way of debtors, correct? So, now this needs to be taken care of by the company. Right. So what they can do is they can have a look at their credit terms. They can have a look at their credit terms and they can be more cautious about it. Now, what they can do is they can maybe give a credit term of three months or maybe they can give a credit term of two months or they can maybe give a credit term of one month as the case may be. So they can evaluate whichever option is the best for them. So what is there in evaluating this? If you give more credit term, what will happen the chances of your sales will be more more people will be willing to buy from you but but what is the problem if you give more credit term the chances of bad debts is also more why because now they are taking more time people are coming to you because you are giving more time these people can be intentional defaulters also the chances of bad debts is more that is number one and also more the credit period 
now more will be the amount funds blocked in it by way of working capital and hence the cost associated to working capital will also be more so basically if you if you increase your if you increase your credit term to your debtors the advantage is you can improve your sales but the disadvantage is the chances of bad debts will be more also also there will be a cost associated with the funds that get blocked more the credit period more the capital that gets blocked under working capital are you clear with this so what the company needs to do they need to do some cost benefit analysis for each of these things for each of the methods for each of these three proposals in our case the three proposals and they can find out whichever is that method that gives them the maximum net benefits they can go for that particular option are you clear with this so aspects of uh, management of data basically it's about the credit policy fine what what is the credit terms i should give them one month or two month or three month as the case may be credit analysis that is at the time when i am choosing my customer i should see whether this guy is going to repay me or not whether he is credit worthy or not the credit worthiness should also be seen this involves due diligence or reputation check of the customers with respect to that credit worthiness are you clear with this and then control of receivables you should have a dedicated team to follow up on the payments and all that and ensure that this guy makes the payment on time are you clear with this so following up with the data and all that now now in this context in this context there is a very very interesting area called as factoring there is an interesting area called as factoring sir what is this concept of factoring now now let us say let us say a company a limited there is a company a limited they have sold some goods on credit to a customer right the credit period is let us say 3 months let us say 3 months now a limited what they need to do they need to wait for 3 months at the end of 3 months this customer will pay to a limited and this transaction gets complete there is an other alternative what is the alternative this is similar to kind of similar to that bills discounting but here it is not a bills receivable it's a normal data Okay, it can also be a bills receivable. Now, what this A Limited will do? It made the sale today. Immediately today itself, it goes to a person called as a factor. What this guy will do is, he will say, "I am ready to buy your data," and he will pay A Limited an upfront amount. He will pay A Limited an upfront amount, but he will charge some commission. This is similar to the discount that banks will charge. Why is he charging a commission? Because because later on this factor he will go and collect the payment from the customer. So the customer will now not make the payment to A Limited. The customer will make the make will make the payment to factor. But after three months, but this factor pays A Limited today itself. So he is technically funding A Limited for the next three months. for which he charges something called as a commission and this concept is called as factoring now now every time when there is actually a debtor and when you have a possibility of factoring you should see whether this factoring is beneficial for you or not sir how does factoring benefit me sir always i should pay this guy a commission yes but what happens is you need not incur some administrative cost with respect to following up with the customer you need not have a separate team to actually go and follow up with the customer and all that all these things this factor will take care of are you clear with this in fact at times the factor will also take care of the risk of the bad debts suppose there is any bad debts this factor himself will bear it he will not pass it on to a limited for accordingly his commission will be more so if the factor is bearing the bad debts it's called as a non recourse factor so if the factor is not bearing the bad debts he says no no if there is a bad debt then i will catch a limited it's called as a recourse factor so non recourse factor will bear the bad debts obviously more the risk he will expect more commission and all that are you clear with this and this concept is very similar to the bills discounting instead of this factor in bills discounting we have the bank which discounts the bill upfront instead of paying 100 rupees they will pay 90 rupees to the uh, a limited and they will recover 100 rupees after 3 months something like that yes so this difference is the earnings for the factor but they are taking the risk of what they are taking the risk of 
uh, the bad debts in case they are a non-recourse factor. And one more thing is that they take care of all the administrative costs with respect to collecting the money from the debtor. Are you clear with this? In this context, we should see whether it is worthwhile going for the factor or not. So that is what we are going to discuss in this segment. A factoring firm, question number four, a factoring firm has credit sales of 360 lakhs, right? And its average collection period is 30 days. So what they are saying, this is actually not a factoring firm. It's a normal firm, okay? It's a normal company. They have credit sales of 360 lakhs in a year and its average collection period is how much? 30 days. So in a year, they have how much sales? 360. So what is one operating cycles? What is one operating cycles debtor's value into 30 divided by 360? So can we say that in one cycle, in one cycle, they have a debtor balance of 30 lakhs or in other words, in other words, the amount that gets blocked by way of debtors is going to be 30 lakhs for this company. The finance controller of the company estimates that the bad debt losses are approximately 2% of the credit sales credit sales. The firm currently spends 1,40,000 annually on the debtors administration like tele or telephone, the calls and uh, sending recovery agents and all that. This cost comprises of, look at this, telephonic bills, fax bills along with the salaries of staff members and these are avoidable costs. When can they be avoided? If you are appointing a factor. Now, a factoring firm has offered to buy the firm's receivable. Now, what this factoring firm says, look, 30 lakhs is your receivables, we will buy it from you. Meaning what? We will buy this, we will be the owners of this 30 lakhs, we will pay you some money today itself. At the end of the credit period, we will collect it. At the end of 30 days, we will collect it from the debtors. If there is any bad debts, we will bear it. Are you clear with this? How do we know they are bearing it? They are saying it's all avoidable cost. Clear? Factoring firm is offered to buy the firm's receivable. The factor will charge 1% commission and will pay an advance against the receivable on an interest of 15% per annum after withholding 10% as reserve. Analyze what the firm should do. Assume 360 days in a year. Now, what is this? Now, now very, very beautiful calculation. Time and again, students make a mistake here. Maybe if this can come, this can come for a five mark question. The other areas in receivable management are fairly simple and straightforward. This is the place where generally students find it difficult. And I think this is the only question uh, given in your illustration regarding your factoring. So please uh, pay attention to this. Now, what they are saying is, what they are saying is, first, what is my debtor's value? My debtor's value is 30 lakhs, correct? Now, now, this guy factor, he says, he says, I am going to charge you 1% of the debtor's value as commission. So what is his commission? His commission is going to be 30,000 rupees. Now he's also telling one more thing, right? So 30 lakhs is the value of debtors for which he is willing to purchase from you. Now he's saying, look, that entire 30 lakhs I will not pay you today. I will withhold 10% for what? It is going to be for my security purpose. I will withhold this. This 10% I am withholding is the cost. No, no, no. After this 30 days, I will pay it back to you the moment I collect it from your data. Clear? So the factoring firm says 10% alone I will withhold. So for safety purpose, at the end of 30 days, the balance 10%, I will release the payment. So initially, I will release only 90% of the payment. Are you clear with this? So basically, the factoring commission is how much? 1% reserve. How much amount is he withholding? 10% of 30 lakhs is going to be 3 lakh rupees. So now what this factor says is, so now today I am, I am purchasing the data. So what the how much? 30 lakhs from the company. Correct? Now from this 30 lakhs, I will withhold 3 lakh rupees, that is reserve, correct? So balance 27 lakhs, I will pay. No, he's saying, my commission, you need to pay me 30,000. That, that also I will deduct it upfront. So this 30,000, it needs to be paid by this company to the factor, correct? So now what the factor says is, I need to pay you 30 lakhs, minus 10 percentage, I'm putting it as my cushion, minus 30,000, minus 30,000, that also I will just reduce it and the remaining amount, and the remaining amount only, I am just going to remit it back to you. So basically, he says 3,30,000 rupees, he will withhold upfront. Are you clear with this? That is 30,000 rupees with respect to the factoring commission and 3 lakh rupees with respect to reserve. He says this 3,30,000 upfront, I will not give you. This I will keep it with myself because 30,000 is anyways the money that you need to pay to me. 3 lakhs is I am keeping it for security purpose. After 30 days, the moment I recover money from the customer, I will pay this back to you. Are you clear with this? Now, 
now not just that not just that he is saying one more thing now technically how much is the amount that he is going to release for funding 30 lakhs minus 3.3 lakhs correct so this is technically how much guys this is going to be 26 lakhs 70 thousand so he will release 26 lakhs 70 thousand to him today itself today you have made the sale today so you are going to a factor the factor says i will pay you 30 lakhs but wait i will withhold 3 lakh rupees pertaining to my reserve 30000 rupees pertaining to my commission so i am going to fund you today itself i will pay you 26 lakh 70000 correct but wait he says this 26 lakh 70000 i am funding to you today it is it is going to be against an interest of 15 percentage why so this guy is saying come on i am going to bear your risk correct i am going to bear your risk not just that for 30 days i am going to finance you if you are able to if you want to do it by yourself you need to incur some extra cost plus wait for 30 days Whereas if you're doing it through me, you just need to pay me a commission. And of course, for the 30 days, whatever I'm funding you, that portion, you need to pay me some interest. So now how much amount is this factor funding him? Today, sir, he's ready to pay 26 lakh 70 thousand. So what is the interest applicable on that? He's going to fund only for 30 days. Correct. So, so this is going to be, this is going to be 26 lakh 70 thousand into 15 percentage into 30 divided by 360. So how much is this going to be? So 26 lakh 70 thousand into into 0.15 into 30 upon 360 so this is going to be 3375 rupees this is payable as interest so he's saying from this amount that i'm going to disperse you the interest also i will deduct it upfront so the net amount that i will release today is going to be 26 lakhs 36625 are you clear with this calculation so basically we found the data's value this entire value will the factor give it today no for cushion purpose, for the safety purpose, he will withhold 10 percentage, that is 3 lakh. Then he is charging a commission, that also he will withhold at the time of payment itself. So 3 lakh 30 thousand. So the net amount he is ready to release or fund is 26.7 lakhs. On this 15 percentage per annum for 30 days, he will compute the interest. That also he is deducting upfront. So all his fees and all he is deducting upfront, it fees and interest and net amount only he will release it to the company are you clear with this so the company will get today net amount the company gets is 26 lakh 36 thousand 625 are you clear with this yes now 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 because the company goes to the factor what is the benefit benefit number one the company can save on what the cost of administration they had given all this facts and all this admin staff and all one lakh forty thousand i can save yes then then the company can also save what the cost of bad debts yes so two percentage on annual sales is generally my bad debts every time i make a sale i'm going to repeat this so once in every 30 days this again i'm going to make what this 30 lakhs rupees worth of sale correct or not so 30 lakhs again and again every 30 days i do so in a year i will actually factor the entire 360 lakhs worth of sale at a time i will factor only how much 30 lakhs but anyways it gets factored again and again in a year so obviously what happens here what happens here is so here the entire bad debts cost this can also be saved 2% on 360 lakh 7 lakh 20 thousand so how much amount you are able to benefit because you are going for the factor 8 lakh 60 thousand but wait is there a cost associated with it yes there is a cost associated with it so what is the cost there are only two costs what are the cost here factoring commission and interest charges remember that reserve amount is not a cost he will release it after 30 days so don't worry about it that is just he is he withholding it for security purpose now factoring commission how much is it how much is it commission is 30000 rupees correct 30000 rupees but remember this 30000 rupees is pertaining to one cycle of 30 days correct in a year they keep on doing it so basically 30000 rupees is for 30 days how much is it for 360 days because the moment 30 days gets over now, again this company will go to a factor the new data will come for them the next 30 days they will fund like this it keeps on moving so technically throughout the year they will be funded by this factor 30,000 upon 30 into 360 annually the factoring commission is how much 360,000 rupees correct similarly the interest charge is also 33,375 that is pertaining to one period that is pertaining to 30 days like that how many days are there in a year 360 days so 3 33,375 upon 30 into 360 uh, so that gives you how much 
4 lakh and 500. So what is your total cost that you incur, extra cost you incur because of factoring 7 lakh 60,500. What is the total benefit you get because of factoring 8 lakh 60,000. So the net benefits the firm is 99,500 or in other words, if you do this factoring, if you go for this factors method of funding, you will gain a net amount of 99,500. So is it worthwhile to go for factoring or not? Yes. Since the savings to the firm exceeds the cost of the firm on account of factoring, the proposal is acceptable. Are you clear with this? So basically this factoring is nothing but almost similar to the bill discounting concept, discounting of bills of exchange. But here it is done by a third party called as factor for which he charges a commission and also charges an interest and all these things he deducts upfront. Are you clear with this? But for that there is no uh, difficult area in this particular uh, concept of receivables management. So with this, with this, we have finished this part as well of receivables management. So now let's move to the next uh, unit of discussion. Now, this is unit 5, which is management of payables, that is creditor. Now, now, now you tell me, these guys, the creditors of a company, they technically fund you, they technically fund you, but not by giving you money, but they fund in kind, that is, they sell the products today and they are ready to accept the payment at a later date, correct? So indirectly, this is also a source of working capital finance only. Now, now with respect to management of payables, what is the issue here? What is the issue? What needs to be done here? So there are some costs for availing the trade credit. Now, if I go for a trade credit, that is, if I want to purchase on credit, if I want to make purchase credits, it is actually not free of cost. It comes with some cost. What is it? Number one, price. Now, if you see, if you pay it by cash today and purchase, or against that, if you if you actually purchase something on credit, there will definitely be a price difference. What is it? So basically, if you pay today, if you pay today and purchase it, this guy, the supplier will give you a discount. Why? Because you are making the payment today itself and you are carrying it. Yes, you are taking the goods, cash and carry model. Correct? Suppose you are saying I want three months credit and all. So this guy will not give you the discount. So technically, technically, you are losing out on the discount because you are going for a credit period. Are you clear with this? So because of going for credit, there are some prices like this one. The first one is a change in the price. Number two, suppose if you do not keep up with your commitment, you are saying that you will pay after 30 days, but you are not paying after 30 days. It amounts to loss of goodwill. So this is basically a qualitative factor. This does not, this cannot be quantified in monetary terms, but yes, this is, this will result in cost of goodwill loss of goodwill then then since you are having a lot of suppliers now you need to have a separate team and incur some administrative costs and of course there are some conditions that you need to abide by sometimes most of the uh, suppliers insist that for availing the credit facility the order should be of some minimum size or even on a regular basis just like that and all they will not give credit facility for every customer so the suppliers will say you need to purchase a minimum of so much or you should purchase every every month you need to purchase so all these kind of conditions they will do but but you know, there are some costs of not taking the credit. That is, these are some benefits of taking credit. What are the benefits of purchasing on credit? The first one is impact of inflation. Assume there is no concept of credit purchase. Now, what will happen? You can purchase only when you have the money, correct? Let us say in the month of Jan, you wanted to purchase something, but you didn't have the money. Now, you got the money somewhere in the month of Feb. But what happened between this Jan and Feb, there happened an inflation and because of this, the per unit price went up. Now you tell me, now you tell me, had you purchased the products on credit, you could have purchased it in the month of Jan itself at the price prevailing in the month of Jan. Correct. The payment could have been done on a later date. No problem. Whereas now, the, now that you are, you do not have this model of cash. Suppose if you do not have this model of credit, if you need to pay by cash, now you need to purchase it only in the month of Feb when the prices have gone up. Or in other words, when there is inflation, when there is an inflation, not taking a credit, 
will actually make you lose some money are you clear on other words when there is an inflation when prices are rising it is better to go for credit period that is it is better to purchase goods by using a credit period because because make some credit purchases because now you will purchase it at a time when the prices are relatively lower at the time of payment even when the uh, prices are higher you need to only pay that amount which was prevailing at the time of purchase correct or not this is what it is number two yes we know that the straight credit is typically an interest free loan this is what i said it is technically funded it is funded by way of non cash item that is it is not a monetary way of funding but through materials they are funding it so it comes free of interest that's what they are saying and number 3 inconvenience sometimes you might not be having cash whenever you want to purchase so now in that case all this taking up credit from the supplier will help you so this is also one more advantage of taking credit see how they have used this double negative cost of not taking credit which means benefit of taking credit are you clear with this that is what they have mentioned now in this in this segment generally generally the problem arises with respect to cash discount the problem arises with respect to cash discount this is one very good sum given in the institute study material that we are going to solve right now so please pay attention to this now many students do not understand this question itself so first let me read the question and explain you what is the decision that we need to take the dolls company purchases raw material on terms of 2 by 10 net 30 first week what do you mean by 2 by 10 net 30 now now generally the supplier is telling you so you are the customer there is another supplier from whom you are purchasing the goods he is telling you that the normal credit period is what you need to make the payment by 30 days correct but 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 if you make the payment before 10 days if you make the payment by 10 days i will give you a cash discount of 2% clear with this now you read this 2 by 10 net 30 means what 30 days is the general credit period you need to make the payment anyways by 30 days but but if you make the payment within 10 days you are eligible for a discount of 2% this is called as 2 by 10 net 30 it could be anything 1 by 20 net 40 also it can be are you clear with this but whenever they give this word understand the meaning of it it means this 30 stands for the general credit period maximum credit period but this 10 stands for the credit period before which if you pay you will get a discount of how much 2 percentage are you clear with this this is the meaning of this four words given here 2 by 10 net 30 clear with this guys now a review of the company's records by the owner mr gautam revealed that payments are usually made 15 days after the purchases are made so generally what this company is doing their past record shows that the company is making the payment after 15 days only which means are they enjoying this cash discount no they are not enjoying this cash discount right now look at this when asked why the firm did not take advantage of its discount the accountant mr rohit replied that it cost only 2% for these funds whereas a bank loan would cost 12% now what is the justification which mr rohit is saying sir now we are paying after 15 days correct suppose we need to pay it 5 days in advance that is if i want to avail the discount correct i need to make the payment by the 10th day correct or not so technically speaking technically speaking what i need to do is if i have to make the payment 5 days in advance now i either, i don't have the funds with me i need to borrow the money from the bank correct if i borrow the money from the bank it will cost me 12 percentage interest correct now why should i pay 12 percentage to get a discount of only 2 percentage this is the logic that mr rohit the accountant is saying are you clear currently the company is paying it within 15 days now the owner mr gautam is asking why you are not availing the cash discount by paying it within 10 days he is saying if you want me to make the payment before 5 days then i don't have the money i should borrow it from the bank bank interest will cost 12 percentage why should we borrow money by paying 12 percent interest to get a benefit of 2 percent discount it doesn't make sense this is the illogical um, this is the illogical explanation that mr rohit is giving clear with this yes analyze what mistake rohit is making number 2 if the firm could not borrow from the bank and was forced to resort to use the credit funds uh, of trade funds then what suggestion might be made to mohit that would uh, rohit that would reduce the annual interest cost identified now first of all you understand one thing 
this 12 percentage is per annum whereas this 2 percentage what this guy is saying is i will give you a discount of 2 percentage provided you make the payment 5 days earlier so technically this 2 percentage is pertaining to 5 days this 12 percentage is pertaining to 365 days these two are not comparable assets but this guy the accountant he has made a mistake in comparing these two assets are you clear with this so rohit's argument of comparing the 2 percentage discount with 12 percentage bank loan rate is not rational as 2 percentage discount can be earned by making the payment 5 days in advance whereas 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 so that is within 10 days rather than 15 days right whereas the bank loan of 12 percentage is a cost that is incurred for a one year clear so assume let us say the purchase value is 100 rupees guys this calculation is very important let us say the purchase value is 100 rupees now the discount that can be earned by making the payment within 10 days that is generally you pay it within 15 days now you pay it within 10 days that is by making five days in advance if you make the payment within 10 days how much discount you will get two percentage on 100 you will get two rupees discount correct so the net amount that you will be paying the net amount that you will be paying to your uh, creditor to your supplier will only be rupees 98 yes or no so you will be having two rupees extra with yourself yes guys clear or not now now you tell me now you tell me how much you have paid 98 rupees only is the cost for you now how much you have saved two rupees you have saved correct now this two rupees is the savings for five days so how much is the savings for 365 days so this two rupees upon 98 so this two rupees is the amount saved for every 98 rupees paid and this is happening for every five days so how much is your overall savings for one year so it is going to be 149 percentage if you annualize it technically speaking this discount can be two percentage on the order value but 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 what is happening here because i am making this in five days early this is actually the savings made the percentage two upon 98 if you tell see this it is going to be 2.04 percentage you technically save 2.04 percentage for five days so how much do you save for an entire year technically it's actually the annualized benefit of taking the discount is 149 percentage you should compare this 149 percentage with 12 percentage now you see which is better obviously if i take this uh, if i make use of this particular if i make use of this particular uh, trend uh, this uh, discount this uh, discount that they have mentioned that is 2 by 10 net 30 if i make the payment five days earlier that is before 10 days now i can i can save some discount and the annualized cost of discount is actually 149 percentage as against 12 percentage so it is better for me to borrow at 12 percentage annualized 12 percentage and pay this uh, creditor five days earlier and benefit by 149 percentage so obviously it is better to take the loan pay this creditor five days before itself that is within 10 days and avail the benefit of 149 percentage this two percentage is for five days two upon 98 why is it upon 98 because 98 is the amount that i'm now net of 98 is the amount that flows out of my that is the cash outflow that is happening if i actually go for this discount yes or no so basically two upon 98 you will get the actual savings the discount percentage that you earn that is for five days how much is it for 365 days are you clear with this this means the cost of not taking the discount is 149 percentage so what is suggestible you borrow at 12 percentage make the payment early and avail this benefit of 149 percentage per annum annualized if you annualize it it is 149 percentage but if you're talking about for the five days it is going to be two percent are you clear with this no now suppose the firm could not borrow from the bank and was forced to resort the use of the credit fund trade credit funds what suggestion might be made to rogue it that would reduce the annual interest stock no no if i am able to borrow the money i can make the payment quickly and i can make the payment within 10 days and i can get the discount benefit suppose suppose if i am not able to get the bank loan then what needs to be done then anyways you need to pay within 30 days no doubt about that so within 30 days you need to pay suppose you're not getting the loan if you're getting the loan paid within 10 days avail the discount benefit 
if you are not getting the loan definitely it needs to be within you it needs to be paid within 30 days there is no second thoughts about it that is what they have mentioned the bank loan facility if the bank loan facility could not be available then in this case the company should resort to utilize the maximum credit period as possible therefore the payment should be made in 30 days to reduce the interest cost are you clear with this this also they will borrow maybe if they are not able to immediately arrange the funds they will somehow arrange it after a period of 10 to 12 days yes maybe after some time whatever it is make sure that you are making the payment within 30 days because your overall interest cost will also be minimum of course the company's goodwill is also at stake are you clear with this so in this case you tell me is it better to go for the discount yes absolutely it is better to go for the discount because it gives you a benefit of 149 percentage annualized correct as compared to bank borrowing of only 12 percent so borrow at 12 percent make the payment early and get a benefit of 149 for 149 percentage in an annualized manner are you cleared with this and that is about this particular segment of credit arts management now the final part is actually financing of working capital this is basically a theoretical part so now in the first segment of the chapter we saw how do you calculate the amount of working capital they required correct working capital investment how do you calculate the amount yes we saw current assets minus current liabilities we saw all those calculations with the working capital cycle and all now this segment talks about how do you finance it how do you arrange for this finance correct after determining the amount of working capital required the next step to be taken by the finance manager is to arrange the funds as discussed earlier it is advisable that the finance manager bifurcates the working capital requirements between permanent and temporary so permanent working capital means what at any given point of time it should be there in the business temporary i told you it's only a seasonal requirement so this needs to be classified permanent working capital is always needed hence it should be financed through long-term sources such as debt and equity are you clear with this this is where i said your working capital finance is not a short-term finance it is a long-term source of finance that needs to be arranged so you can also arrange it through your debt and equity channel on the contrary temporary working capital may be arranged through some short-term uh, sources of finance so broadly speaking the working capital finance can be uh, classified into two categories spontaneous sources and negotiable sources spontaneous sources are the source of finance which naturally arise in the course of business operation that is nothing but your creditors correct trade credit credit from employees credit from suppliers of services that is outstanding wages for one month delay they will accept all these things these are spontaneous sources that is they are naturally bundled in the course of the business whereas negotiated sources is what you going to a bank and asking for some loan on the other hand the negotiated sources as the name implies are those which have to be specifically negotiated with the lenders say commercial banks financial institution general public etc and the finance manager has to be very careful while selecting a particular source or a combination thereof for financing of working capital are you clear with this this is basically a theoretical part and with this we have completed this particular chapter now now this is actually a very big chapter working capital is actually a very big chapter now we have spent approximately about two and a half hours in condensing the entire chapter on a bird's eye view right so this marathon will help you revise all these concepts covered in this particular chapter because this chapter working capital management this is actually a very big chapter it has six units inside it i told you it's actually a big chapter there is a lot of numerical problems that needs to be solved that i generally do it in my regular course but in a fast track course i wanted to touch upon the important aspects in every single uh, unit so that is why we have seen all the six units in that the important and the tricky areas we have explained it here but don't think that working capital is only this much there are some extra issues that needs to be discussed but that the, those issues i've just generally i cover it in my fast track but in this marathon whatever is important utmost important area i have picked it up and i have compiled it and i think we have done about five questions in this particular segment so that will do for this particular revision clear with this yes